committee will come to order. The committee will come to order, and without objection, the chair is authorized to declare a recess of the committee at any time. This hearing is entitled Combating the Economic Threat from China. Without objection, all members will have five legislative days within which to submit extraneous material to the chair for inclusion in the record. I want to thank our panel for being here. I now recognize myself for three minutes to give an opening statement. Um, the actions of the Chinese Communist Party last week serve as a clarifying moment. China is not an ally or a strategic partner. They are our competitor and pose a, a single, pose the single greatest threat to America's global standing. This committee is holding our first hearing of the Congress on combating the economic threat from China. This is a priority for the Congress and our committee's jurisdiction is central to this discussion. The economic strength and vibrancy produced by our system of free market capitalism directly fuels America's military strength and cultural power. Whether it's through sanctions, export financing, international financial institutions, or our capital markets, all of which fall under this committee's jurisdiction, this committee will lead this Congress's economic agenda in response to China. This agenda must maintain trust and confidence that our system will continue to grow capital resources, industrial capabilities, and new technologies. In other words, we must double down on our commitment to free people and free markets. The juxtaposition between the United States and China could not be more clear. They are centralized, we are decentralized. They are closed, we are open. They suppress free speech and human dignity. We embrace it. These are the American values that produce the economic strength that has led to the highest living standard and greatest military power in human history. Last Congress, committee Republicans laid out principles for how we should attack the economic parasite of China without sacrificing the host, which is our free market system. First, we must walk the walk. For the U.S. to compete with China, we cannot become more like the Chinese Communist Party. We need to carefully evaluate if a policy proposal could jeopardize America's ability to innovate, grow, and allocate capital, or if it would cause allies to question our commitment to free people and free markets. Second, the United States and its allies must prevent China from rewriting the international rules of the road. We should reject policies that allow China to ignore debt transparency and multilateral standards with impunity, or allow them to exert a malign influence in the international financial institutions. Finally, the United States must lead by example. Our national security requires the U.S. financial sector to remain open, vibrant, and resilient, even as we prevent Chinese companies from advancing Beijing's strategic ambitions. If we stick to these principles and reinforce American values rather than undermine them, we can outcompete China on the global stage. I yield back. The chair now recognizes the ranking member of the committee, the gentlewoman from California, Ms. Waters, for four minutes for the purposes of an opening statement. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. As we discuss how to bolster our economy and to counter threats from China, I'd like to start by saying that if House Republicans continue their brinkmanship over debt ceiling, it will result in even more severe interest rates, hikes, <clears throat> a plunging stock market, major job losses, and a recession of epic proportions. Such a global financial crisis would hand the Chinese Communist Party a massive win by boasting the Chinese government standing in the world. We've been down this road before, and there have been real harms to our economy. In the past, just by coming close to a default, this committee should be doing everything that it can to avoid the calamitous outcome. I believe this is what our committee should be focused on. And so I would like to submit for the record a letter that I've sent to you, Mr. Chair, requesting a hearing on the economic harm that will be caused by nearing or triggering a national debt default. Without objection. Thank you. I also want to point out the fact 
that anti-Asian American violence has skyrocketed in the wake of COVID-19 pandemic, fueled significantly by former President Donald Trump's dangerous and xenophobic language, which we must hold the Chinese government accountable for its harmful actions. We have a responsibility to avoid language that stokes hatred and fuels xenophobia and violence against the Asian American community. I'm proud that last Congress, House Democrats led the legislative effort to put an end to this violence by passing COVID-19 Hate Crimes Act. Right now, the authoritarian regime of the Chinese Communi Commun uh, Community uh, Party, Communist Party, is trying to reshape the international order to supplant U.S. leadership. We must confront this challenge by defending our values and securing our interests globally. And that's exactly what Democrats, particularly committee Democrats, have done. We've taken critical steps to protect our nation's security and ensure U.S. businesses and our economy can successfully compete with China by passing critical legislation. The American Competes Act, which had provisions to counter the Chinese Communist Party's growing economic influence, the longest reauthorization of the Export-Import Bank to preserve and create millions of jobs right here in America and to support American businesses as they compete with China. The Anti-Money Laundering Act of 2020, which included a government-wide strategy to combat illicit finance. The Corporate Transparency Act to prevent the use of shell companies to hide dirty money in the U.S. The Chips and Science Act of 2022 <laughs> to ensure we win the technology race for the 21st century. The Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act, which for the first time in decades poured significant funds into our aging infrastructure to not only support businesses here, but to attract investment from around the world, and the Inflation Reduction Act to finally reassert American leadership and displace China as the key supplier of critical equipment for the technologies that are needed to fight climate change. Still, there's more work to do, including making sure U.S. companies like hedge funds, private equity funds, and Wall Street are not investing in ways that hurt our economy or funding the adversarial actions of the Chinese government. I look forward to hearing from our witnesses all about what more this committee can do to support our economy. I thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I yield back. The gentlelady yields back. The chair now recognizes the chairman of the Subcommittee on National Security, Illicit Finance, and International Financial Institutions, the gentleman from Missouri, Mr. Lukemeyer, for two minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. For decades, China has employed a military civil fusion national strategy to develop the People's Liberation Army into a world-class military. This strategy involves commingling of private industry in China and the Chinese military industrial complex. Recognizing this threat in 2020, President Trump issued an executive order aiming at curbing U.S. investment in the, in the Chinese military industrial complex, stating, and I quote, the People's Republic of China, PRC, is increasingly exploiting the United States capital to resource and to enable the development and modernization of its military, intelligence, and other security apparatuses. In addition to funding its military, China continues to use their economy to oppress their own people. This oppression includes speech suppression of all citizens and the persecution of religious and ethnic minorities, including arbitrary imprisonment, forced labor, and genocide. In 2021, President Biden added to the Trump executive order, stating, and I quote, the use of Chinese surveillance technology to facilitate repression or serious human rights abuses constitute unusual and extraordinary threats to the national security, foreign policy, and the economy of the United States, end quote. <clears throat> The United States government seemingly acknowledges the national security and economic threat China poses, but we lack meaningful action, as we've just witnessed again this past weekend with the balloon, with the balloon fiasco. As of January 9, 2023, there were 252 Chinese companies listed on U.S. exchanges with a total market capitalization of over $1 trillion. 
In 2021, the U.S. trade deficit with China was $355 billion. While it's hard to put a dollar sign on China's theft of, international, of intellectual property, certain estimates put it as much as $600 billion a year. It is our committee's job to examine all the interconnections between the Chinese and U.S. economy, specifically connections supporting China's military and human rights abuses, and to pursue options to eliminate U.S. capital flowing into those areas. I look forward to today's hearings and the witnesses' uh, discussions. And with that, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Gentleman yields back. The chair recognizes the ranking member of the Subcommittee on National Security, Illicit Finance, and International Financial Institutions, the gentlewoman from Ohio, Ms. Ba Mrs. Beatty, for one minute. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I concur with Ranking Member Waters' points on the importance of avoiding debt default that would deliver a decisive victory to the People's Republic of China. As we see through the world, for example, in Africa and in the Caribbean, China is making deep inroads into our allies' economy and cultures, partly in an effort to pull our friends away from the United States. We must counter this with the tools at our disposal through our voices and our vote in the international financial institutions, as well as through other activities, such as improving access to the United States-led financial system. Thankfully, through the leadership of Chair Waters, Democrats have already made significant strides to protect our nation's security and competitiveness by passing landmark legislation. I'm looking forward to continuing this critical work as we look at the international issues and national security and financial institutions. And I yield back. General Lay yields back. Today we welcome the testimony of uh, Mr. Rich uh, Ashu. Uh, Mr. Ashu is a former Assistant Secretary of Commerce for Export Administration. Uh, he led our dual-use export control efforts and managed commerce's uh, national security, non-proliferation, foreign policy, and strategic industrial resources functions within the Bureau of Industry and Security. Uh, Mr. Tom Fetto. Mr. Fetto served as the first Assistant Secretary for Investment Security at the Department of Treasury, where he led the drafting of regulations implementing FIRMA. Uh, Mr. Fetto also served as Assistant Director for Enforcement of, at OFAC and was an uh, officer in the U.S. Navy's Nuclear Submarine Service. Uh, we thank you for your service. Uh, Mr. Eric Lorber. Mr. Lorber served as a senior advisor to the Undersecretary for Treasury's Terrorism and Financial Intelligence Division. Mr. Lorber also uh, has testified multiple times before both chambers of Congress, and we value his deep knowledge. Uh, Mr. Cleet Williams. Uh, Mr. Williams is a trade lawyer who understands the landscape of international economic policy and the available tools. He previously served, served as a Deputy National Security Advisor and Deputy National Economic Advisor in the previous administration and can provide unique insights into the challenge uh, posed by the CCP. Uh, and finally, Mr. Uh, Peter Harrell. Mr. Harrell was until recently the Senior Director for International Economic Policy with the Biden administration. And I'm sure he'll be able to provide insights into how the current administration views these matters. Uh, we thank you all uh, for taking time to be here. Each of you will be recognized for five minutes to give an oral presentation of your testimony. As you're all familiar, uh, red means stop. Uh, yellow means hurry up in general parlances. Uh, and green obviously means go. So with that, uh, now that we've discovered colors, that colors have action uh, uh, that we should take around them, Mr. Hsu will now recognize you for five minutes. Thank That's you for the ground rules, colors. Mr. Chairman, and, and thank you for the, also for the opportunity to be here. And, and uh, my appreciation to Ranking Member Waters and the, and the committee uh, for having this very important discussion. Uh, having served as the Assistant Secretary of Commerce for Export Administration at the Bureau of Industry and Security, I have both the honor and the challenge of weighing many of the same issues that we're, that we're confronting uh, today in this committee. And it's in that capacity that I'm testifying here. It should be stated at the outset that the concerns at the heart of this hearing are, are well-founded. While great strides have been made in addressing these concerns, national security and economic threats are never static and must be const constantly addressed. It's also important to stress early on that U.S. global technology leadership remains strong and that the American culture of innovation is the envy of the world. I stress this because it is essential for policymakers 
as you consider the challenge of promoting U.S. technology advancement while regulating it in the face of potential threats to cause no harm to the very thing you're trying to promote and protect. Much of what has been accomplished in recent years in this area has been the result of legislation. This committee had a key role in enacting the Export Control Reform Act and the Foreign Investment Risk Review Modernization Act, also known as ECRA and FIRMA. There are lessons from that debate which are still relevant as Congress considers new measures such as an outbound investment regime or dramatic changes to FIRMA or ECRA. While the issues associated with regulating financial behaviors or technology development are many, I'll confine my comments today to four recommendations that are drawn from the lessons in the effort to regulate in this area. First, clearly define the national security threat to be addressed. The temptation to address a broad panoply of legitimate concerns which do not necessarily rise to the level of national security threat is alluring. National security is currently understood in the United States is already very broad, taking into consideration factors such as infrastructure, supply chain, and data protection. The best tools are well-aimed and potentially harsh steps taken by policymakers should ensure that the target of such action is clearly defined. Second, regulate horizontally. What do I mean by that? National security threats are rarely stovepiped. S solutions to address them should not be either. National security threats are commonly carried out by individuals or groups funded by government with the help of or pursuit of technology. Therefore, multiple US agencies and departments must collaborate. One of the most critical updates to FIRMA and ECRA was to dovetail their definitions and authorities, establishing a unique definition, for instance, of critical technologies and grounding that definition in well-defined export control lists. This synchronization is a model for enhancing the power and effectiveness of US government policy implementation. Third, gaps do exist, leverage what works to address them. For all the enhancements in recent years to protect US technology, gaps do remain. For instance, it is currently possible that export controlled technology could be the beneficiary of US financing, intentionally or not. This disconnect is one which could be addressed through alterations to current authorities. A recent enhancement in the Export Administration regulations defines the term support by U.S. persons to include, among other things, financing. While further study must be conducted, this feature of the law creates a regulatory hook to limit financial activities already tied to restrictions based on export controls. And finally, just as synchronization among relevant agencies and authorities is critical, high priority must be given to alignment with partner nations. Many like-minded countries have emplaced national security reviews similar to those of the US, such as the foreign direct investment screening and export controls. It's clear from the behavior of our allies that the US has led in these areas, resulting in a more comprehensive and therefore effective approach, and the US should continue this leadership. Specifically, the U.S. along with key allies should consider a new method for multilateral controls in targeted technology areas that can work with, but is separate from, the existing multilateral regime construct that has served the U.S. and partner nations well in the past, but which is ill-suited for complex technology supply chains. The ad hoc approach currently utilized in the area of semiconductors, for example, should be replaced with an agreed upon system among a smaller group of stakeholder nations that can act in concert as the need arises with a full understanding of the nature of the technology involved. Without such alignment, unilateral policy will ultimately fail in combating both national security and economic threats from China. U.S. global technology leadership is indisputable, but it is perishable. Hearings like this are essential to maintaining it. I'm happy to take your questions. Chelman yields back. At this time, we'll now recognize Mr. Fetto for five minutes. Chairman McHenry, Ranking Member Waters, and distinguished members of the committee, I'm honored to appear today for your first full committee hearing of the 118th Congress. That this is your first hearing makes clear the priorities of the committee and the significance of the current geopolitical climate's impact on our economic security and by relation, our national security. As the chairman mentioned, I oversaw the Committee on Foreign Investment in the United States and led the successful implementation of FIRMA enacted in 2018. By virtue of that experience and roughly 27 years in government service, much of it in national security related roles, I hope to contribute 
to your consideration of how we can mitigate the risks to U.S. interests posed by the People's Republic of China while maintaining strong free market principles. I believe we're engaged in one of history's most consequential great power competitions and that technology plays a vital role in that contest. As the chairman also mentioned, I was on a Los Angeles class submarine, an engineering and technological marvel, a byproduct of our innovation ecosystem. That experience has made crystal clear the imperative for maintaining America's tech advantage and thus its lethality on the battlefield. The PRC poses grave threats to the United States, its allies, and the global world order, including its strategy to exploit technology, raw materials, market power, and energy resources to achieve its ends. Key supply chains, such as semiconductors and critical minerals, are vulnerable to these same goals. Enactment of FIRMA and the Export Control and ECRA five years ago was a response to the potential risks arising from foreign act actors' activities involving high-tech U.S. businesses. Now, both Congress and the Biden administration are considering a new agency with potentially sweeping powers to oversee American firms' allocation of resources and capital outside the United States. A version of this new interagency panel was considered while drafting the Chips and Science Act. This Committee on National Critical Capabilities would have had sweeping power. Key terms were broad and undefined, leaving substantial latitude to the executive branch. Later proposals were somewhat narrowed, but I believe more homework is necessary. Similarly, meter reports indicate the Biden administration intends to establish outbound screening through executive order this spring. I strongly believe that doing so would be a mistake. Rather, Congress is best suited to assess and respond to an issue of this complexity and potential scope and impact. There should be no dispute that to ensure America's future security, the PRC's theft and misappropriation of tech must be prevented. The question is whether a new and potentially far-reaching bureaucracy is the answer. The debate has taken on a presumption that outbound screening is necessary, but decision makers would benefit greatly by not rushing into a solution Additional hearings should be held to define objectives and determine costs and benefits. When a bipartisan Congress and the Trump administration collaborated to, collaborated to make the most extensive changes to CFIUS in its history, those efforts included roughly a half dozen hearings with foreign policy and national security experts, the intelligence community, the private sector, and former and current administration officials. Congress and the President were thus well informed regarding the gaps they intended to fill, the law's reach, and the attendant increases in capacity and cost. Afterwards, it took two intensive years within an existing CFIUS bureaucracy to effectively implement the law. Here, outbound screening would be created out of whole cloth. As with FIRMA, decision makers would be best served by building a comprehensive record exploring whether existing or other types of authorities could be less bureaucratic and costly and more impactful. Existing authorities may, in fact, offer a better cost-benefit solution. My written testimony includes a foundational uh, laundry list of issues for fulsome congressional examination of outbound screening. From my CFIUS experience, a new interagency committee would be extremely time and resource intensive and requires substantial effort to build a clear regulatory framework. It's in the best interests of national security, a strong open economy, and accountable government to get this right. This, the alternative could be an unrestrained bureaucracy, wasted time and resources, and an inadequate response to the PRC's ominous goals. Again, it's my privilege to appear before you today and contribute to your consideration of these consequential issues. I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Uh, thank you for your testimony. This time we'll recognize Mr. Lorber for five minutes. Chairman McHenry, Ranking Member Waters, and distinguished members of the committee, I am honored to appear before you today to discuss economic sanctions and the U.S.-China competition. I come before this committee as an expert on sanctions. I have served at the United States Department of the Treasury as a senior advisor to the Undersecretary for Terrorism and Financial Intelligence and in the private sector advising clients on sanctions compliance. These positions have afforded me perspective on how sanctions policy is made and implemented, as well as how companies around the world adjust their business models 
strategies, and compliance programs to ensure they are meeting their obligations under the law. The testimony I'm giving today is my personal testimony and not on behalf of any organization or client. Over the last two decades, sanctions have become a core tool of American foreign policy and national security. When properly calibrated and judiciously used, they can impact U.S. adversaries' behavior and reduce their ability to harm U.S. interests around the world. Nevertheless, they are not a silver bullet and have real limits. In recent years, policymakers in the United States have begun employing targeted sanctions against China as part of the broader U.S.-China competition. These sanctions have focused on control over Hong Kong, human rights in Xinjiang, and limiting certain Chinese military industrial complex companies from accessing U.S. capital, among other areas. While the United States' use of sanctions against China has so far been limited, policymakers have increasingly focused on them as a key foreign policy tool in this competition. As Congress and the administration think through the use of sanctions to achieve national security and foreign policy objectives in the competition, a number of key lessons gleaned from U.S. sanctions programs over the last few decades stand out. First, defining the objective of sanctions is an important first step in any campaign. Any use of sanctions should be preceded by an understanding of what sanctions are meant to achieve. Then policymakers can choose the appropriate types and scope of sanctions to achieve that objective. Second, targeted list-based sanctions can be impactful at disrupting particular threatening activity and making it harder, costlier, and riskier for our adversaries to access U.S. markets. While such targeted sanctions may not change an adversary's desire to threaten U.S. national security, they can impact the adversary's ability to do so. Third, impactful list-based sanctions require constant vigilance by regulators, law enforcement, the intelligence community, and the private sector to ensure that the targets are unable to evade them. While such efforts to disrupt evasion are not always successful, forcing sanctioned parties to engage in such surreptitious activity often imposes significant costs and increases the risks they face. Fourth, expansive programs can have substantial macroeconomic impact and make it harder for countries to engage in activity that threatens the U.S. and its allies and partners. For example, the recent sanctions on Russia have reportedly limited Russia's ability to continue to produce advanced military equipment in a way that has made it more difficult for Russia on the battlefield. Fifth, more expansive programs, including comprehensive programs, can fail to achieve lofty objectives in certain instances, such as the failure to convince North Korea to give up its nuclear weapons program. Sixth, Sanctions are more likely to be impactful when access to U.S. markets is more important than access to the sanctioned targets markets. For example, in the case of Iran, the incentive for potential partners to forsake connections with U.S. markets in favor of Iranian markets was very low. This dynamic may not hold in the context of China, however. China's economy is roughly comparable in size to the U.S. economy, and the United States has never waged an aggressive sanctions campaign against a country with such an economy. Seventh and finally, sanctions are likely to be more impactful when the target country's leadership cares more about the negative economic effects than their policy objectives. For example, the U.S. government's efforts to deter Russia from invading Ukraine with, in part, the threat of crippling sanctions did not change that Russian decision. That is likely because Russian leadership did not believe we would impose crippling sanctions, thought they could weather them, or willing to pay the cost of sanctions in order to achieve their objectives in Ukraine. These are important lessons, lessons excuse me, gleaned over the last 20 years of the aggressive use of sanctions against U.S. adversaries and relevant when considering the use of sanctions in any context, including for the purposes of our discussion today. I look forward to answering your questions, and thank you again for the opportunity to testify. Uh, thank you, Mr. Lorber. Uh, Mr. Willems, five minutes. Chairman McHenry, Ranking Member Waters, and members of the committee. Thank you for the opportunity to testify on the U.S.-China strategic competition. The China national security threat has been on full display in recent days with the PRC's brazen decision to fly a spy balloon over the United States. But the threat from China is not confined only to national security. China also seeks to challenge U.S. economic and geopolitical leadership and to remake the international order with priorities and values that differ significantly from our own. Accordingly, the outcome of this competition will affect the future of our country and the world we live in, and Congress is right to make it a top priority. In my testimony today, I hope to facilitate the committee's development of a strategic China agenda. 
To maximize our chances of success, we should clearly define our objectives, consider the broader economic consequences, and coordinate our action with allies. Our approach should also be comprehensive and not only defensive in nature. We should crack down on problematic capital and technology flows, but we should also prioritize competitive tax and regulatory policies and double down on our comparative advantages, which include a free market economy, democratic values, a deep network of partners and allies, and the most vibrant financial system in the world. To that end, my testimony will cover the defensive measures needed to protect US national security, the need for multilateral coordination to ensure these measures are effective and do not harm US economic competitiveness, the importance of pairing defensive action with offensive measures to maintain US economic strength, and the appropriate role of bilateral engagement. One key defensive tool Congress is considering is whether to restrict certain types of outbound investment. On this issue, we should assess whether there are gaps in existing tools like export controls. If we determine that technology is so sensitive that it cannot be exported to China, we should ensure US companies are not financing China's indigenous development of the exact same technology. But we should stay focused on national security and avoid a bureaucratic supply chain mechanism like the National Critical Capabilities Defense Act. We should also expand restrictions on investment in Chinese military industrial complex companies to block private as well as public investment that can contribute to China's military advancement and enact export control measures on advanced technology with military applications. These defensive measures are important, but we must realize that they impose a cost on the US economy by cutting off a critical market and are only effective if US allies take similar actions since they can provide much of the same capital and same technology that we can. Given the importance of multilateral coordination, we should seek all available avenues to achieve it. Unfortunately, the administration's track record has been mixed, especially with respect to recent export control actions on semiconductors. Congress should push the administration to rectify the situation as soon as possible. One key upcoming opportunity is Japan's G7 host year, which can be used to advance coordination on export controls, outbound investment, and a range of China-related policy. We should also work with allies at the World Bank and IMF to ensure that China is a responsible international stakeholder. Enacting defensive measures is a necessary part of a successful China strategy, but it is not sufficient. As we cut off capital and technology flows to China, we must also be creating new opportunities for US companies that are affected by these measures. One way to do this is to pursue market access trade agreements that cut down barriers to US exports in third country markets to help make up for the lost revenue. These agreements are also key for our supply chain objectives, including reducing our reliance on China for critical goods. In particular, if we want companies to move supply chains out of China, we need to provide them with meaningful incentives to do so. This is all the more pressing in light of China's aggressive pursuit of trade deals, including RCEP, which is now the largest trade agreement in the world. As a result of this deal, it is now easier for 14 other countries in the Indo-Pacific to link their supply chains with China and with each other than with the United States. This is unacceptable. If we are serious about competing with China on supply chain issues, we need a serious trade policy to match. Congress should pressure the administration to move forward with bilateral trade agreements with the United Kingdom, Kenya, Taiwan, as well as to renegotiate the CPTPP. Finally, any winning China strategy requires bilateral engagement. While we should crack down on national security sensitive trade, we must also realize that China's market provides a massive opportunity for our farmers, energy producers, and financial services firms, all of whom need to sell into China to be globally competitive. Therefore, we should engage with China through the phase one deal to ensure it is playing by the rules and not discriminating against US companies. Thank you, I look forward to your questions. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Harrell, you're now recognized for five minutes. Chairman McHenry, Ranking Member Waters, and members of the committee, it's an honor to be here alongside so many distinguished colleagues. Chairman McHenry and Ranking Member Waters, as you said in your opening remarks, America's diplomatic, economic, and military competition with the People's Republic of China represents an overarching challenge for this decade. The current government in Beijing is a competitor that seeks to undercut the political, economic, and security interests of the US and our partners. 
we have to outcompete China in the economic domain and maintain our technological edge. And yet, even as we compete with the PRC, we must also find ways to keep lines of communication open, cooperate on shared challenges like reducing greenhouse gas emissions, continue outreach to the Chinese people, and keep the door open to ties that benefit citizens in both countries. In my testimony, I recommend a three-pillar strategy to manage our economic competition. First, the US and our allies should continue to promote our technological leadership and economic strength. With the Chips and Science Act, the Inflation Reduction Act, and the Bipartisan Infrastructure Law, as well as other pieces of legislation, Congress has enacted policies to make transformational investments in U.S. technology, in the clean energy economy, and in renewing U.S. infrastructure that are critical to maintaining our leadership. We need to build on this foundation while encouraging our allies and partners to make parallel investments in their technology and industrial bases. We need to cooperate with our allies and partners on resilient supply chains as well. It's equally important that we avoid self-inflicted wounds. If the U.S. fails to raise the debt limit this spring and we default on our obligations, we risk harm to both our domestic economy and our global position. A default would undermine global confidence in the dollar and speed up the development of alternatives. It would undercut the confidence of our allies and partners. And it would give Beijing a priceless talking point about the irresponsibility of the United States. Congress must ensure that the U.S. does not default on our national debts. Second, we should protect our technological and economic advantages while limiting Beijing's ability to weaponize the leverage it has over the U.S. and our partners. We need to ensure that U.S. and allied companies and experts do not inadvertently provide Beijing an edge in key technologies, give the PRC access to our critical data, or create dependencies for essential goods and products that the Chinese Communist Party could weaponize to its advantage. Third, we should deepen our partnerships with existing allies while working to strengthen new ones. The U.S. should galvanize like-minded multilateral organizations like the G7 and work with distinct grouping of, groupings of countries to tackle specific risks like semiconductor uh, issues. We should pursue multilateral economic deals, including the Indo-Pacific Economic Framework, and we need to expand bilateral outreach to key emerging markets and swing countries such as India and Indonesia, to deepen ties as we face a period of long-term competition with Beijing. In my written statement, I've offered detailed policy recommendations across these three pillars. I'm going to highlight just two. First, we need a comprehensive approach to managing the data risks we face from Beijing. The simple reality is that the U.S. does not currently have an effective legal regime to address and mitigate the data security risks we see from the PRC. While we've taken steps to reduce specific risks, such as targeting the presence of Huawei and 5G telecoms networks, and as we see with the current debate over TikTok in the Scythius process, we need a strategy and new legislation to more effectively address data security risks across the board, as well as a new domestic data privacy law to reduce the volume of data collected in the first place. Second, I urge members of this committee to examine investment flows between the U.S. and China, an issue which my colleagues have also discussed. FIRMA, which Congress passed in 2018, established important updates to the CFIUS process, and the Chinese military company sanctions list provides a valuable tool to limit U.S. investments in the securities of specific Chinese companies. But it's time to look, and for this committee to look, at continuing weaknesses in the CFIUS regime such as limits on CFIUS's ability to review certain high-risk greenfield investments by Chinese companies here in the U.S. I also urge both Congress and the Biden administration to work together to establish a narrowly targeted mechanism to review a small number of U.S. investments in China that could facilitate Chinese technological capabilities and undermine U.S. national security. In closing, I want to say I'm optimistic about our future. The American people remain innovative and entrepreneurial, and with smart policies and hard work, we'll succeed in this era of geopolitical competition. Thank you, and I look forward to your questions. Well, I want to thank the panel for their testimony, and we'll now turn to member questions. The chair recognizes himself for five minutes for a question. Mr. Willems, um, the Chinese spy balloon that our Air Force shot down this past weekend is just the latest incident involving China. Um, and it demonstrates that um, 
the, the, they, the, there's a threat to the world uh, that China poses, uh, not just to the United States, but to our allies. And uh, to that end, um, committee Republicans have developed uh, principles on how we approach China, uh, given the fact that we have uh, a different world now than the Soviet communists. This is a different regime, different set of uh, challenges. Uh, but central to that premise is, um, is that to beat China, the U.S. Uh, should not become China. Um, so I just want to ask you a few questions along those lines. Um, would, what would you describe as the type of economic policies that could jeopardize our commitment to free markets and free people? Thank you. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, let me just say I completely agree with you. Uh, there's a reason that China is the one chasing to catch up to the United States. We are the envy of the world because of the policies we have historically held, which value a free market, which value democracy, and all those kinds of principles. Um, I have been concerned about some of the policies that have been uh, advocated for, and in particular, if you look at the National Critical Capable, Capabilities Defense Act, um, that is the kind of bureaucratic mechanism that we often see out of Beijing. And I think we need to be surgical and crack down on the kinds of uh, capital flows that could contribute to their military, but we shouldn't be telling every single private sector company what they can and cannot do, um, and, and we should not be um, overly broad in the way that we handle that issue. Are, are, yes, and so relatedly, um, second principle that we put forward is that China must abide by the international rules of the road. Can you speak to uh, an area where China's diverging from that path uh, of, of, of widely accepted uh, rules of the international economic engagement uh, that we've seen over the last 50, 60 years? There's almost too many to offer in the, in the two minutes and 45 seconds that I have left, but I mean, let me just highlight a couple uh, in the international institutions. I mean, first you look at the WTO, uh, where China's uh, command and control economy is totally inconsistent with those principles. I look at the, the World Bank, where China, who is the largest uh, bilateral lender in the world, is also receiving a significant amount of loans there. And I look at the IMF, where China has refused to restructure debt for developing countries. I mean, those are just three uh, examples in international institutions where China is an outlier. Uh, and so what are, what are the uh, uh, policies available to Congress to ensure that China does not continue to undermine international institutions? What can we do to counter that? Well, I think it's a, it's a combination of things, and, and in my testimony, I, I tried to make the point that you, you need to be comprehensive, and, and there are defensive measures you should use. Um, I think there are offensive measures where we need to be creating new markets, and then we need to really be working with our allies and partners uh, through the existing mechanisms, the G7, uh, and then at the IMF, WTO, and World Bank to try to pressure China to change its behavior. Thanks. Uh, pivoting to you, Mr. Fetto, uh, there, we just rewrote uh, the rules of uh, uh, foreign investment in the United States um, with FIRMA that was passed uh, just over four years ago. That was an update to the CFIUS process, but that is an inbound flow of capital into the United States, and we have a process for that. There's now a discussion about expanding that authority to an outbound regime of taking U.S. dollars and their investment decisions internationally. Um, what risks does an outbound regime pose uh, to protecting our national security? To, to our national security or, or more broadly? More broadly, but frankly, it's national security, but more broadly than that, our economic capacity. Mr. Chairman, I, I, you, the problem is, um, is ill-defined at the moment, so it's hard to really scope a solution that, that precisely tackles an undefined problem. This would be, as, as Mr. Willems suggested, it would be um, a major economic policy and foreign policy change to impose these types of capital controls and may uh, impact global capital flows in an unpredictable way, including the extent to which um, foreign investors want to invest in the United States and how that potentially subjects them to U.S. jurisdiction. The way this was first drafted was incredibly broad and its extraterritorial nature would um, w would have been unbounded almost. And in that respect, um, it, it, it could have really impacted uh, our relationship with our allies and partners. Certainly, as Mr. Ashew has mentioned, 
Um, doing these types of tools in a multilateral way is very important. There are only two countries in the world that I'm aware of that have outbound screening mechanisms, uh, Taiwan and South Korea. And as you're well aware, the size of, of the U.S. economy dwarfs those. And, and, um, and so we really have to think through imposing this type of or creating this type of mechanism, not to mention the bureaucracy that would come with it, which I have deep concerns about, um, how that would affect us um, uh, economically. <laughs> Well, my time's expired, but uh, we can further expand on this in written form. Now recognize the ranking member, uh, Ms. Waters, for five minutes. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I am focused on making sure uh, that our economy is strong and that we're all united in ways that would put us in a position to deal with China or anyone else who um, uh, interferes with our ability to carry out our democratic commission. Um, uh, methods and um, when Democrats last engaged in brinkmanship around whether or not to default, default on U.S. debts, interest rates on U.S. Treasury bonds skyrocketed. There was havoc in the stock markets and government, companies and consumers faced increased borrowing costs. The nation's long-term credit rating failed, resulting in an un Precedented restriction on the Federal Reserve's ability to use its monetary policy tools to define the U.S. dollar and stabilize the economy. And all of this happened when, um, even though an agreement was reached and we didn't default, Republicans are yet again actively working to risk unleashing the same devastation or worse as they did just over a decade ago. This time, some projections on what would happen if the U.S. defaulted on its debt indicate that the global economy itself could freeze if the United States Treasury market collapses. Can you explain how allowing the U.S. to default on its debt would benefit the Chinese government by causing irreversible damage to the U.S. dollar status as a global reserve currency. Also, please explain how a default would affect Americans' standard of living and our nation's economic standard and political influence across the globe. And I am directing uh, this question uh, to Mr. Lividus Harrow. Thank you very much, Congresswoman. Um, I think that a default on the national debt would be catastrophic for Americans and would be a gift for Beijing. Uh, you, Congresswoman, cited a number of the risks we run domestically with a major hit to our economy and to our financial markets, which would obviously undermine our economic position vis-a-vis -vis, uh, Beijing, as well as harming Americans uh, here at home. I think it would also undercut uh, our view uh, with our allies and partners who count on us for all kinds of things and would take the view if we can't even honor our debts, how can they count on us for their security and to uphold our, uh, uh, our alliances? And I think it would give Beijing a kind of priceless talking point about how irresponsible the United States is that it can't even uh, pay its basic uh, obligations. I guess the final point I'd make is I do think, and I know there's legislation uh, in front of this committee to deal with kind of the role of the dollar. I am a huge believer that it is important for the dollar to remain the world's reserve currency and the global kind of medium of finance. That whole agenda would be massively undermined as well if we defaulted on our debt. Thank you very much. Um, several years ago, I worked with my Republican colleagues to reform the Committee on Foreign Investment in the United States to strengthen our tools to prevent adversaries from purchasing key assets in the United States. Last November, this committee held a hearing that examined outbound capital flows or US dollars flowing to foreign adversaries, particularly China, and the impact of those investments on our national interest. Several of the witnesses argued for a federal panel to review and, if necessary, restrain certain types of outbound investments, like the controls we impose through CFIS. The witnesses testified, as have others, that while national security considerations should be paramount in such a review, should not be strictly limited to national security. Could you discuss the merits of creating an outbound, outbound investment review panel? What are some of the key elements of such a process? 
Thank you very much. Um, as several of my colleagues and I have testified, I do think it's important uh, that the U.S. have the authority to review a very narrowly targeted set of U.S. investments uh, in China. The reality is, for example, when we're investing in semiconductors here, and we are limiting uh, exports of semiconductor company to China, but U.S. companies can still invest in a Chinese semiconductor company to help that company develop its own technology, there's clearly a gap in the regime. And I think we need a narrowly targeted regime with the authority to close those kinds of gaps that we have in our uh, national security uh, apparatus currently. Thank you very much, I yield back. I now recognize for five minutes the chairman of the Science Committee, Mr. Lucas the dean of the committee. Absolutely, Mr. Chairman. And I want to thank our witnesses for offering their expertise, and a thank you to you for holding this important hearing. It has been nearly a year since the invasion of the Ukraine, and the ongoing war has brought the U.S. and our allies together in a series of unprecedented economic sanctions against Russia. This offers a glimpse at what the international response might be in case of Chinese aggression against Taiwan. Mr. Lorber, would you, could you describe the lessons the Chinese uh, have learned from the Russian invasion of Ukraine and how China is responding to protect itself from potential sanctions? Thank you, sir. I appreciate the question. Uh, I can't describe the specific Chinese response to what the Russia sanctions campaign looked like, but I can say that a few lessons that came out of the, the Russian invasion and, uh, and, and the associated U.S. response um, are, are particularly noteworthy. One um, is that, to the Biden administration's credit, they did put together a very expansive multilateral campaign that has, over time, uh, done significant damage, I think, to the Russian economy. Maybe not as much as folks wanted it to for a variety of reasons, but has done significant damage um, and degraded its military capability. At the same time, however, uh, I think it's fairly widely understood and, and fairly obvious that the threat of Russia sanctions in the lead up to the Russian invasion were insufficient to deter the Russian decision. Uh, and so I think that, at least in terms of when thinking about an aggressive, massive sanctions campaign in any scenario, uh, those two uh, principles need to be kept in mind. One, yes, they can be impactful in terms of hurting an adversary's economy, but two, they may not change that adversary's decision making. Fair point. Chinese state-owned banks are used to expand China's One Belt and One Road initiative and regularly saddle unsustainable debts on developing countries. For example, the Export-Import Bank of China and the Chinese Development Bank have lent billions of dollars to Sri Lanka, of which faces, of course, a debt crisis with no end in sight. African nations such as Ethiopia, Zambia, Kenya also face uncertainty with massive debts from China. Mr. Williams, could you speak to the global economic challenge that Chinese debts place on developing nations? Thank you uh, for the question, and, and, and I agree with, with your premise that this is a major concern and a major threat. And um, while I was in the National Security Council, we saw numerous instances where China would get a country knee-deep in debt, and then in exchange for that, in exchange for debt relief, would seize a strategic asset. And so that is a national security threat to the United States. One of the responses that we had in the Trump administration was the BUILD Act, which was intended to make the Development Finance Corporation much more robust in its ability to provide a meaningful alternative to China's investments. And um, you know, I think so far, uh, the track record on that agency in carrying out that strategic mission has been a little bit mixed. One of the things I talk about in my testimony is uh, improvements that we can make at the DFC ensuring that it has equity authority that can be used to make investments to countries instead of China, um, as well as looking at creating a program there similar to what we have at XM, which is the Transformational Exports Program, uh, which cuts through some red tape and makes it easier for us to be strategic. So I think we need to look at DFC, we need to look at XM, and use both of those tools to provide an alternative. And, and then in the meantime, I, I, I talk a little bit about at the IMF and other places where we need to pressure China to restructure those debts for developing nations. Continuing along on the discussion about the imperative of the U.S. being able to displace Chinese financing, 
Would you expand a little bit more on the importance of the U.S. having a dependable export-import bank as an alternative to Chinese? We've had major discussion in recent years in this body over that very topic. Absolutely. I think XM needs to play an increased role here. And if you look at the landscape internationally, and if you look at what China provides for its companies, and let's take telecom infrastructure as a good example. You know, if you look at Huawei and companies like that, uh, they are usually being sold at about a 30% discount to uh, Western competitors. And it's very difficult uh, for us, you know, for countries to basically say, you know, I'm gonna pay 30% more, even I hear you on the national security threat, but I'm still gonna, so we need to have an alternative to that. And XM's China's transformational CTEP, the China Transformational Export Program is a good step forward. And I think the committee was right on with creating that. And I think that we need to further bolster XM to be a, a effective tool in that regard. Thank you, Mr. Williams. You'll back, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you. Um, we'll now recognize the uh, ranking member of the Small Business Committee, Ms. Velasquez, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Harrell, building on what the ranking member Waters uh, was saying, Chinese government bonds are due, are ish, on issue $3.3 uh, trillion, less than half the value of U.S. Treasuries held by foreigners. But do you believe playing around with the debt ceiling as the Republicans are doing will cause foreign governments to move away from treasuries and possibly into China, uh, Chinese bonds? I do think that a, um, a, 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 thank you Congresswoman for the, the question. I do think that a debt default and, and even sort of serious brinksmanship does undermine um, confidence by uh, investors, whether sovereign investors or private investors in Europe uh, and elsewhere in uh, the U.S. Treasury market, and I do think we'll have long, uh, long-term adverse consequences uh, to our Treasury market. I'm not sure that um, investors would go into China as they exit um, U.S. bonds. China obviously has a bunch of capital controls, and there's sure reasons why uh, in the markets, they may not do that, but I do think it will undermine the kind of preeminence of the U.S. Uh, financial system uh, if we uh, have serious brinksmanship here. And Mr. Harrell, the Chinese economy faces several challenges that predate the pandemic, including significant levels of corporate debt, which reached $29 trillion in the first quarter of 2022, the highest in the world. There have also been concerns with the debt levels of its real estate sector, wealth management products, and local governments, as well as its off-balance lending activities, do you see China's high level of debt, particularly corporate debt, as a significant problem for the world's economy? What impact could China's debt levels have on American companies invested in China? Um, I think it's important that we all, as we think about China uh, policy, we all recognize that China, though a serious competitor uh, and by far our most significant economic competitor, is not 10 feet tall. You know, it's not some sort of mythical uh, beast that we cannot outcompete. And I think you've highlighted a couple of the reasons, Congresswoman, why that's the case. They do have high levels of debt. They also have serious long-term demographic uh, problems uh, coming to having a shrinking working age um, population. Um, I do think that it'll be interesting to see as China comes out of COVID uh, if they are uh, able, in fact, to hit the growth targets they are trying to hit this uh, year without further increasing uh, their debt problem. Um, and I think we should be um, keenly aware of the potential financial risks uh, that could come from a uh, unwinding of Chinese uh, debt. And Mr. Harrell, repeated lockdowns slash China's growth uh, rate to 3.0% in 2022, a pace below the global average for the first time in more than 40 years. While the IMF is predicting that China's economy will expand by 5.2% in 2023, it will slow again in 2024. Some have argued that China's uneven economic performance since the pandemic enhances our leverage over China, and now is an opportune moment to further address many of the trade imbalances and systemic issues 
American business uh, face in China. Can you explain whether this is a view you share? So I think the last couple of years have been a real wake-up call for businesses, uh, both in the U.S. and in Western allies that have been doing business in China. I think they have seen how the, um, China's mishandled response to COVID disrupted supply chains. I think they have seen a long-term trend of slowing growth uh, in China. I do think this year China is going to probably have a reasonably high rate of growth as it bounces back from COVID, but that's not going to, we're not going to see a return to many years of six, seven percent uh, growth in China. And I think that that is why you, and of course, I think people have seen the geopolitical uh, risks uh, that we see with China, and the recent balloon incident only highlights those. So I think you are beginning to see a very significant corporate rethinking of um, the role companies want to have uh, in China and the risks they face there. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, you Gentlewoman yields back. We'll now uh, recognize uh, Mr. Sessions for five minutes. Mr. Chairman, thank you very much. Mr. Chairman, your opening statement, I think, outlined very clearly not only the role of America, but how we see our uh, divisions with China. In my opinion, uh, I, and I would like to ask your opinion, I believe that evidence abounds that China has a plan that we saw, or at least I saw as early as 1996 with Johnny Chung, and that was to come and disrupt not only American commerce, but to influence policymakers, meaning the White House. I think that China's views abound and that we already see exactly that they not only have a plan, but they intend to counter and compromise the United States of America. My question, I will, I could check to Mr. Willems or Mr. Lorber. What about us looking at this on a comprehensive basis as opposed to seeing the 50 or 60 different points that China is countering, not just the United States, but freedom and capitalism? How do we go and develop this? Because we saw what President Trump did. He took on the Chinese. Successful or not, I think it highlighted we have a problem. Could either one of you begin that discussion about what kind of comprehensive viewpoint we really need to take? Because it's militarily, intelligence, economic, and their own plans. Uh, thank you, Congressman, and it's a great question. And I agree with you 100% uh, that China does pose an existential threat that requires our attention and that our response has to be comprehensive. And we have to look at all facets of what we are doing in the United States. And that does include some of the things that this committee is focused on in terms of cracking down on, on problematic capital and technology flows. but. It also requires us to be offensive. And when we close down markets for our companies, we need to open up other markets for them. And then we need to work with our allies and partners to make sure that they are taking similar action, that they view the threat in the same way, uh, so that, that stuff, the stuff that we do is actually effective and doesn't just hurt us without hurting China. Um, and so that is really important. And so I think this committee needs to look holistically at all the different things that we need to do um, both offensive, defensive, and internationally. Okay, well, let's suppose this committee does have a position at least in capitalism and the, the, the markets and the opportunity to view those. I think I'm talking about within Article Two, an administration that has intel, military, uh, certainly at Treasury, those economic viewpoints. Who, who, does this fit at the NSA? Does that exist today? Do we actually have a plan? So it is the role of the National Security Council to try to coordinate policy across the US government on behalf of the president and to make sure that it's effectively addressing these problems. Um, I think that we have tried very hard to come up with a strategic uh, plan here 
And I think that the Trump administration and then the Biden administration as well has been focused on China. I, I don't believe that the current administration's plan is comprehensive enough. And one of the areas where I do think that they're falling short is with respect to trade. And I, I talk in my testimony about China's uh, assertiveness going around the world, collecting trading partners to make it easier to link supply chains with China, and we don't have a response to that. And so I do think that the administration is trying, but I do think that they have fallen short in that respect. And if that we want to uh, reduce our supply chain resilience on China, if we want to provide a meaningful economic alternative to China, that requires trade agreements, and we haven't seen that. I, th I think what you said is very interesting. I watched over the last few years uh, Millennium Challenge Corporation as it placed uh, economic advantages to countries uh, that we wanted to help build their economy, the free market and, and the rule of law. And the Chinese simply glommed on about around them with their own plan. And so I, I hope that we push this committee appropriately to push the administration, to push this Congress to do exactly what we talked about a comprehensive plan. I want to thank each of you. Mr. Chairman, I yield back my time. Gentleman yields back. Mr. Sherman of California is recognized for five minutes. Thank you. I want to associate myself with the comments of the ranking member, both that we have to uh, watch for xenophobic uh, attacks on Asian Americans. Uh, this is, we're here to talk about the Chinese Communist Party. And uh, second, that the most important thing we can do is manage our own economy well, and that st starts by paying our debts our economy is already being hurt by this uh, talk of default and uh, not raising the debt limit. I want to thank uh, Mr. Uh, Harrell uh, uh, for pointing out how important it is that the U.S. dollar play this major reserve currency role and point out that all the proponents of cryptocurrency have announced that their purpose, if they achieve it, is to partially displace the U.S. dollar from that role. Uh, the Chinese Communist Party obviously believes they can invade America's airspace deliberately and notoriously without serious consequences. They believe the two parties will simply shout at each other, maybe shout a few things at Beijing, maybe even adopt some sort of pin, pinprick answer, and then go on. What uh, China cares about is Taiwan trade and tariffs, the three T's, and I think they are confident that we will do little or nothing uh, not only in response to the balloon, it's just a balloon, but the, the much bigger things. Even China's uh, defenders have got to admit that their obfuscation of the sources and initial uh, uh, effects of COVID have cost hundreds of thousands of lives around the world, and that their trade policies toward the United States have created a new term, or at least it was new a few decades ago, Rust Belt, to describe what they did to the industrial Midwest. The problem began in the year 2000 when the United States Congress granted most favored nation status to China and entry into the WTO. Before that, China was an annoyance. It was referred to as a slumbering giant. Now, of course, things are much different. So um, we've got to look at uh, Taiwan trade and tariffs. Um, we should, by Congress, Congress should act to allow Taiwan to buy uh, defense items that are still stalled in the administration. And we should provide that we immediately and without an executive waiver uh, deprive China of most favored nation status if it invades or blockades Taiwan. More to the uh, focus of this committee, we have got to require every uh, major corporation to set out as a risk factor what would happen to that company if there was a breakdown in the U.S.-China economic relationship. Uh, I'm not saying that'll happen, but it might. It's more likely than some of the other things that they talk about in the risk factors. By doing that, American companies will compete for capital by creating resiliency toward what uh, uh, China uh, might do. And in doing that, they become less desperate to tell us not to do anything to China. Um, and if we do anything serious at all, we need to apply, uh, have an automatic, say, 20% tariff on all Chinese goods if they retaliate against us for anything we're doing. Of course, that would be necessary only if we did anything significant. We probably won't. Um, one thing that concerns me is China's ability to control the behavior of American corporations by handing out access to their market the way I hand out dog treats to my pet. Uh, Morgan Stanley was told 
you better tell your investors to put 15% of their money in China or you won't be able to do business in China. More specifically, Hollywood, which I represent, is told you can get only 40 movies into China in any one year. Well, what does that mean? That means that if you make a movie about Tibet, it's not going to show in China. That means if you make a movie about Tibet, none of your movies are going to go to China. And the CEO's pension uh, bonus goes to zero if he doesn't lose his job or her job. So China controls what American corporations do. They also, therefore, control what their lobbyists do, so they have a control over what Congress does. Um, and uh, Mr. Harrell, um, one pr proposal, and this would be rather extreme, would be to say that we impose a tariff on Chinese goods, collect a fund, and award that fund to those companies that can show that they've been unfairly treated by China. So that if you can't get your movie into China because you made movies about Tibet, or you won't recommend to your investors this or that that China wants, instead of making profits in Beijing, you make your profits here in Washington by going to this board and getting an award. Um, comment. Thank you uh, very much, and I realize I have just a couple of uh, seconds. First, Congressman, I think you've started in exactly the right place, that we need to be putting pressure on companies to better understand their own China risks. Some are doing that, but not all of them, and more of them need to step up and do it. And then second, I do think we need, with our allies and partners, a um, solution to these growing instances of Chinese economic coercion we're seeing against American companies, Canadian companies, European companies, Asia, all over the world. I think that has to include a threat of retaliation on China if they keep doing that, as well as some ways to help um, impact, help impacted companies um, dodge or sort of compensate for what they're losing. Gentlemen's time has expired. We'll now go to Mr. Posey of Florida for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, for holding this hearing on the uh, economic challenge with China. I assume we all agree that uh, clearly through economic dominance, China hopes to achieve military superiority. Um, Mr. Ashu, how much of the U.S. debt is owned by China? I don't know the, the number uh, uh, recently. I, I do know it's a substantial amount, and it is one that uh, we should be taking steps to. Anybody on the panel know? Okay. Uh, so I assume we wouldn't know how much of China debt? We might hold either. Let's try land ownership. Does anyone know the amount of land ownership in the United States held by China or Chinese companies? Oh, shit. Um, so do, do we own any land or uh, control companies that we wholly own in China? OK. Uh, Mr. Williams, when, when running for uh, president, Mr. Biden uh, famously said, they're not bad folks. Guess what? They're not competition for us. Uh, what's the most important ways that China is in competition for us? Well, I think it's across the board. China wants to remake the international order to its advantage and to our detriment. And if you look at what they're doing from a national security standpoint, that's a threat. And if you look at what they're doing from an economic standpoint, that's a threat as well. And so, you know, I think they're all major threats to U.S. leadership and that we need to address them all comprehensively. Thank you. Um, Mr. Fetto, uh, your experience with CFIUS, uh, I had a crazy experience with them not too long ago when a uh, foreign country was contracting with a local port to arrange a long-term lease agreement. Uh, in this port, it's the second busiest cruise capital in the world. Uh, it's the site of a nuclear submarine base, and it's adjacent to Cape Kennedy Missile Range. Uh, there were some concerns by some citizens that the company who was pursuing the lease uh, was from a country not friendly to the United States, and some principals in the company had ties 
to individuals who were not looked upon favorably by the United States. So I told him not to worry. Uh, Cepheus would check him out and make sure everything was okay. I contacted Cepheus to make sure I wasn't telling a story. And Cepheus said, what are you talking about? You know, we don't, we don't check him out. And I noticed, you know, in your, in your written testimony, um, it's important for them to especially uh, check out companies near sensitive government facilities or ports. And so I asked him, he said, well, who checked them out? He said, well, I don't know. Why don't you go ask DOD or the Navy or the Coast Guard who has a base there? So we ran the traps, and, and we never could clearly ascertain that anyone did check them out. Uh, what would be your suggestion going forward uh, to appeal their decision not to look at that issue? Mr. Congressman, thank you for the question. Um, without, without thinking through the facts a little bit more, um, it's, hard, it's hard to say. I mean, a, a lease, the way FIRMA was, was drafted, uh, a lease or a concession or a land purchase near a military installation that's designated um, uh, expressly in a list published in the regulations is within the scope of, of CFIUS jurisdiction. And, and therefore, um, you know, the question might be, um, and, and specifically with respect to ports, so, so then there is a question of uh, who would, within the nine voting member agencies, would have the lead, the subject matter expertise to, to look at that more closely and consider. Okay. I've only got two seconds left, and I wanted to ask you, about the recent purchase of Chinese expired. land near military bases. Thank you. We can submit for the record. Uh, we now recognize uh, Mr. Uh, the gentleman from New York, the former chair and current ranking member of the Foreign Affairs Committee, Mr. Meeks. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Let me start with uh, Mr. Harrell. Um, you've commented on the ongoing debate here in Congress uh, in regards to our national debt limit. What I want to ask you is if Congress does not move to raise the debt limit, what impact would that have specifically on our global position relative to China? Thank you, Congressman. I think it would have at least three. First, it would clearly harm our own economic potential and weaken our economic growth this year in a year when China probably will have reasonably strong economic growth as China comes out of COVID. Second, it is going to undermine the confidence of our allies and partners. Our allies are going to say to us, how can we count on the United States to defend our security if you're Japan or South Korea, if you can't even pay your, uh, can't even guarantee you're going to pay uh, your bills? And then it is going to undermine our economy over the long term as international investors and others look at whether they really think they have the security here in the United States that they want as they make um, investments internationally. Thank you. Now, I, I, I absolutely recognize the threat that China poses to the United States from an economic and a national security lens. For us to combat these threats, I believe we need to focus on how we compete with China. Now, the United States has, and I believe in the United States, we are the greatest country this planet has ever seen and has the innovative capacity to challenge China across various sectors, from financial services and fintech to medical technologies but we will lose that advantage if we're not vigilant. For example, as we look at our technological and economic position, I'm particularly concerned with the speed in which China is developing its central bank digital currency and how that could impact the future of the US dollar and the security of our global financial system. So let me ask you again, Mr. Harrell, can you identify those sectors in which the United States does have the competitive advantage over China, and in what ways can we continue to strengthen that? So, Congressman, I agree with you 100 percent that the core foundation of our strategy to compete with China is to continue to promote our own leadership. That's why it's so important that Congress enacted things like the CHIPS Act in order to restore our leadership in uh, semiconductor um, manufacturing as well as, uh, as R&D. And I think that this Congress should look at continued investments 
in uh, critical technologies, whether it's semiconductors or quantum or the clean energy economy or biosciences. Uh, also looking at investments in maintaining our leadership in areas like financial services. I think it is important that the Treasury Department have an actual plan and agenda to defend the role of the dollar uh, in international finance and to defend uh, the role of uh, U.S. financial in in institutions and the kind of stable role they play in maintaining international finance at a time when China is aggressively trying to push out uh, the Chinese RMB uh, and the Chinese central bank digital currency uh, as mechanisms of payment and investment uh, internationally. So let me also then follow that up because, you know, in competition, I believe you have to have a level playing field. Uh, and, uh, and I think that a central part of our strategy with China should include the mechanisms to hold them accountable when they're not playing by the rules. Um, so what should the United States do along with our global partners? Uh, to make sure that China is playing by the same rules. You know, I often worry uh, sometimes we let China off the hook uh, by, you know, isolating ourselves because there's too many places where we're not present. China is present, we're not there. Uh, and thereby uh, we end up isolating ourselves. I know and we've got some controversial policies, you know, whether it's gone trade and other things here, so that if we're not there, China then goes and they work with other countries to get things done and they're trading and we're left by ourselves and we're isolating ourselves so they go to, so what, 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 what strategy do you think that we should utilize and if there's time, I'd also ask the same question to Mr. Williams. I think we need to be uh, out in front building alliances with our economic partners. I think there are a couple of things we should be pursuing starting with the Indo-Pacific Economic Partnership in uh, Asia and with the Americas Partnership for Economic Prosperity uh, here in the Americas. I also think we should be looking at a critical minerals agreement uh, to help ensure clean uh, minerals uh, supply chains. So maybe I'll leave it there and give Mr. Williams a couple of seconds. Uh, thank you, Congressman, and I, I agree with very much of what you said. We need to be in the game, uh, and uh, I know Mr. Harrell has endorsed the Indo-Pacific Economic Framework. I think we need to go further. I think we need to look at whether we can renegotiate the TPP, whether we can make it work for U.S. interests. I think we need to do a trade agreement with Taiwan uh, that will help Taiwan reduce its dependency on China. That's the way that we provide a meaningful alternative, and I hope we can work on those issues together. I thank the gentleman. Uh, we'll now go to the uh, chair of the National Security Subcommittee, the gentleman from Missouri, Mr. Lukemeyer, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, you know, the chairman started out the discussion today talking about the threat to our global standing, both militarily and economically, by China. And I thoroughly agree with that statement. Um, you know, and I think if we look at what we're doing, and I think this is what this committee hearing is about today, is how much funding we are doing to the Chinese government to be able to compete with us on those fronts, whether it's militarily, whether it's economically, whether it's with regards to oppressing their own people. Our argument here today is not with the Chinese people, it's with the Chinese Communist Party who is slash their government. And I think you can see we've got bipartisan support today for this kind of, this kind of argument about going after the Chinese government and trying to get a level playing field our manufacturers and protect us in the future. So uh, along that line, um, you know, we need to be able to, I think, cut off this financing. How do we do it? We, we're open to all your ideas. One of the things that we've done is in 2020, Congress passed the Holding Foreign Companies Accountable Act to require foreign companies that wish to be included on the U.S. stock exchange to open up their books and ensure that they're properly audited. And uh, basically what's happened is uh, from 2020, there were 1,000 Chinese companies on our stock exchange as of uh, this January the 9th, is down to 252. My question, though, is that they're required to have an audit every two years. Many of our, our United States companies have, have to be re uh, audited every year. Would you go along with uh, increasing that or, or I guess, yeah, increasing it to an annual audit by the, on the Chinese companies like you do ours, or is there a reason that we should keep it at two years? Who wants to take the question? Um, so let me first say thank you for Congress's leadership <clears throat> on the Holding Foreign Companies Accountable Act as well as the Accelerating Foreign Companies Accountable Act. There is no question that China would not have opened up its books and records had Congress not acted. And that was really important uh, to make sure that they're playing by the same rules and that we protect the sanctity of our markets. Now, I do think we need to be vigilant in making sure that we are reviewing them on an annual basis 
And my understanding is that that is how the law will be implemented. And it's really important to make sure that the access they provided uh, in December was not just a one-time act to prevent mass delistings, but that we hold them to account. Well, you know, over a two-year period, you could play a lot of games. And so I think it's important that we go to an annual uh, audit, and I appreciate your comments. You know, the Chinese government there has also gotten into the digital currency business. And I've got a bill that, that uh, to prevent money service businesses from conducting transactions in the digital uh, yuan. Um, I don't know if any of you have looked at the bill. Are you have any concerns at all about uh, American businesses, American individuals did, uh, investing in that or being able to do business in that? Do you have any, I, any, any comments on it? Nobody? Yes. Sure, I'm happy to take that. I think, I think the general concern um, with the digital yuan, digital renminbi in particular, is, is related to transparency and the question about what type of data or information the Chinese uh, could, could have access to given widespread implementation and usage of the digital renminbi. And so I think you know, legislation, and I, have, I apologize, I've not reviewed that legislation. Well, it would seem to me that, and I'm going to leave that to my good friend, Mr. Hill here, who's the chairman of that digital currency uh, uh, subcommittee, but it would seem to me that this, that the Chinese use it to be able to control and monitor their people. And so why would we want to allow our people to be in that same predicament? I, this, this is one of my concerns. Um, <clears throat> I know that a couple of my predecessors here on the, on the dais asked questions with regards to uh, how we should, uh, what we should do, what your actions be, how should we control China with regards to their invasion of Taiwan. And I think we need to be looking at this, I think, very quickly, very, very thoroughly, because just over the weekend, uh, I guess about a week ago now, the uh, leading general for the Air Force indicated that he thought that, uh, we'd be, that China was going to invade Taiwan by 2025. Well, if that's the case, how, do, how, how should we react? I know, uh, I think Mr. Willems, you made a comment a while ago with regards to that. My concern is that when we put sanctions on Russia, I asked the question whenever the Fed and Treasury were here, are you thinking now in terms of what's going to happen, how we should be sanctioning China when that happens, when they invade Taiwan? And it was like a deer in the headlight looks. They had no idea what the hell we're doing, which is really concerning, knowing that this is inevitable. Uh, so I think that, uh, you know, Mr. Willem, would you like to go back over that a little bit? Do we have, what would be some things that you think we should do? And I think we need to stress if these guys are going to invade Taiwan and we're going to play footsies with everybody because, well, we don't want to upset the apple cart with our allies, we don't want to hurt the Chinese government, the Chinese are going to take us over. They're weaponizing the economy against us today. At some point, we've got to cut bait and say, you know what, you're bad people. We've got to stop playing games with you. What would you say? So three suggestions on Taiwan. I mean, the first is, as you articulated, we need to be thinking now about what a sanctions package should, should look like. We need to be working with allies uh, to make sure that they'll have resolve as well. And I hope that that's already happening at the NSC. Uh, the second thing uh, is, as you mentioned, I do think we need to look at um, helping Taiwan militarily, making sure that they have those tools. And then third, I also think we need to be helping them economically. And one of the things that I would advocate for is a free trade agreement with Taiwan. Uh, right now, 50% of Taiwan's trade is with China. And that gives China a tool to coerce them economically by cutting that down and, and shifting that around. Uh, and we can't let them be vulnerable so time in that way. Expired. We'll now go to the former chair of the Ag Committee, the current ranking member of the Ag Committee, Mr. Scott, for five minutes. Thank you, uh, Chairman. Uh, Mr. Harrell, I am deeply concerned with the fast-growing possibility of a China-led world order that includes the Chinese military controlling the South Pacific trade routes because the South Pacific trade walk uh, is now the lifeline of the entire global economy. And that's why I was concerned, deeply concerned, about this balloon business and why the president allowed this balloon to go all over our country and not blow it down. Uh, so all I'm saying is that with this technology, with this military 
information, going deep into the abilities of our national defense system, our national security of the number one nation, economy, military in the world sends a powerful message, not only to our enemies, but to our partners in this nation. What gives with this? And also, under what circumstances do you see this Indo-Pacific nations accepting an economic and military order in which China sets trade and investment rules for that region, particularly if they are seen to be applying agenda-setting dominance over any new technology, the availability of new data and standards. This is why they sent that balloon to get an assessment of the technology, of the information, of the data. And this is why I want you to answer um, this question for me is uh, how do you see this? And, 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 and do, do you not see my point? I love the president. I support him. But this move, not to bowl down that balloon, sends a powerful message to both our enemies and our friends because it's all about data. It's all about intelligence. It's all about knowledge. And they got us on this one. What do you say about that? Thank you very much, Congressman, for the question. I should begin by saying I am not a military expert. I'm an economic expert, so I'm going to have to defer uh, to the Department of Defense for their decision to wait to shoot down um, the balloon and, and take at their word their reasons uh, for waiting. I agree with you very much, Congressman, that we need a very firm and very resolute response to what China did. And I think that we should view Secretary Blinken's decision to uh, postpone his trip to China and the decision to shoot down the balloon off the coast of South Carolina as the start of a response, not the end of a response. And I think we should be looking at other tools, whether it is sanctions on the Chinese companies involved in the balloon, whether it is looking at ways to increase our military and sort of surveillance presence in the Indo-Pacific to see future balloons coming in, and other tools, but recognize we need to continue to show a resolute response. On your question about countries in the Indo-Pacific and are they going to come into China's orbit, they will if we're not there. That's why I think it is so important that we be out in the Indo-Pacific economically, that we be out there diplomatically, that we be looking to build our technological ties with key countries in the region, and that we continue to shore up our defense relationships with key countries across the region. Because region. if we're not there, that's when they're going to be turning to China. And I agree with you 100 percent. Thank you. Gentlemen's time has expired. We'll now go to Mr. Heising of Michigan, the chair of the Oversight Subcommittee for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm, I'm actually jump off on that that point because I'm not sure I uh, agree that the strongest response that the U.S. could have had to uh, the balloon incident, let's call it that, uh, was to not go to Beijing. It might have been an even stronger response to get there and confront the Chinese on their own territory about what is uh, what has been happening here. And there's a lot of details that are emerging and, and coming out. Here's what I do know, and I, I hope everyone's hearing this on, on more or less a bipartisan uh, basis, but whether it's CFIUS, FIRMA, uh, the Export Control Relief Act, the uh, Holding Foreign Companies Accountable Act, there's been a fair amount of work that has been done. I've been very critical, frankly, of the PCAOB and its, um, its agreement with Beijing that allows U.S. investors 
to scrutinize really a small subset of uh, audit firms and even a smaller sampling of the transactions and audits. And um, what I'm concerned about is, you know, whether China can ever provide an actual safe, stable business climate for U.S. investors. And I am curious, real quickly, uh, if uh, you can comment, and I'll just we'll go right down the row, row here, and how can and should our regulators ensure uh, investors have some modicum of protection of what, uh, what they're investing in? Mr. Eshu? Yep. Uh, it starts with information. I think, you know, as a former regulator, uh, we, we, we so transparency. Very, yeah, tra transparency, but really I, I consider it direct communication. That okay. I think the government has a responsibility to share with affected industries uh, what it can about the particular environment, in this case China. Okay. Uh, and, and, and gathering that information in the first place is, is, is also quite critical. Needs right. Mr. Fetto? Uh, <clears throat> I completely agree with Mr. Ashu. The transparency is paramount. Mr. Lorber. Thank you, sir. Yeah, I can't speak to that specific issue, but transparency as a general matter, both for, for investor protection and for financial crimes compliance is incredibly important. Okay. Mr. Willems, do you have anything? It sounds good to me. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Rell, why not? Let's... I will join my colleagues on transparency. <laughs> All right. Well, so, I mean, here we have, uh, though, the PCAOB has been um, tasked with uh, with negotiating this out, I'm not sure that we've really seen it uh, be as tough as it is because it seems like it's being controlled more by Beijing. And look, we passed I and many others have been critical of, of Russian companies uh, who are listed on the U.S. exchanges as well. And um, uh, you know, how long are we going to let the PCAOB take this same posture with uh, with the Chinese government before we take? a more strong, robust uh, posture uh, with, uh, with China as we have tried to do with Russia and some others. Um, Mr. Willems, I'm going to kind of stick in with the IFIs, the international financial institutions. Um, IFI, or, I'm sorry, the IMF Reform Act uh, and Integrity Act, which I've introduced in the last two consecutive Congresses, would place greater restrictions on major shareholders of the fund, notably China and Russia. Specifically, the legislation would ensure that any quota increases by the IMF uh, would be done with consideration as to whether a country is following certain principles of the fund, most notably currency manipulation. Uh, the bill is complementary to my colleague Mr. Hill's Special Drawing Rights Oversight Act, which again draws attention to Russia's lack of adherence to international lending standards. Um, Mr. Williams, you noted in your testimony that the United, quote, the United States should seek to change the way China does business, close quote, and the need for it to be, quote, responsible international stakeholder, close quote. Can you help the committee understand how important it is for the IMF to hold China and other major shareholders responsible for their actions? So let me just say, I, I think your legislation makes a lot of sense, and in particular, this concept that we need to create standards within these institutions that hold China to account. I think it's difficult for us, whether it's the World Bank or the IMF, and to come in and simply say, we want China to do this or we want China to do that. Uh, that can make it, I think, sometimes difficult to gain broader support for it. But if we create a standard that we know China can't meet and use that as an objective standard, I think that can be more effective um, within those institutions. Okay. Well, U.S. companies often face considerable disadvantage uh, to their Chinese counterparts, which often receive large state subsidies and, and, and those kinds of things. And uh, so I'm curious, what is the most effective tool, in your opinion, that we in Congress can wield to level that playing field without harming or impacting open and fair domestic markets as well? So on the subsidies question, there's a couple things we can do, and I'm, I see I only have like three seconds, but quickly I would say defense and offense. On the defense side, where there are Chinese subsidies, we have trade tools to countervail that. On the offensive side, we need to provide alternatives. And uh, maybe it would be helpful, Mr. Chairman, if we could get a response. In Gentlemen's writing. time's expired. We can Thank you. I yield. a written response. Uh, we'll now recognize Mr. Lynch, the uh, Ranking Member of the Digital Asset Subcommittee for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I want to thank the Ranking Member as well, Mrs. Waters, for uh, her work on putting this committee together, uh, this uh, hearing together. Uh, members on both sides of the aisle uh, have been keenly interested in the development of a retail uh, central bank digital currency. And uh, China's domestic retail uh, central bank digital currency pilot known as the ECNY or the Digital Yuan has received a lot of focus from Congress recently as a challenge to the 
supremacy of the United States dollar and also as a full spectrum surveillance tool uh, for the Chinese government. However, usage of the digital yuan has so far remained very low as uh, consumers seem to be uh, sticking with uh, private payments ecosystems, including Alipay and WeChat Pay. Uh, there's been little focus, however, on Embridge, which is the uh, cross-border bank-to-bank wholesale CBDC pilot that's being conducted by four countries, including China, which is the lead. Uh, I think it's Hong Kong, Thailand, um, and uh, the um, one of the countries in the Middle East. I, I'm blanking on it right now. But uh, there are seven more countries uh, that have received offers to join. And, and Enbridge, as you know, operates outside of SWIFT and the existing uh, correspondent banking system and could be a tool for sanctions, evasion, and other financial crimes. Mr. Harrell, uh, how concerned should we be in Congress about China's central bank digital currency pilot project uh, and, and, and why? Thank you, Congressman, uh, for the question. Um, I, I agree with you. It's been interesting to see on the domestic uptake in China of the ECNY um, how little interest there is. Now, Chinese consumers, probably because they don't actually want the Chinese central bank seeing everything they buy, are trying to stay uh, outside uh, of the, the ECNY. We obviously have a limited ability to affect the domestic deployment of uh, a digital RMB in, uh, in China. I think you are right to focus on the cross-border payments. I don't think that China and RMB-denominated payment rails displacing the dollar is going to be a challenge of the next 6 to 12 months, but I do think it's a midterm challenge. We've seen Russia, with the MIR payment system, try to create rails outside of Russia as we've put sanctions on Russia, and you see China trying to do exactly the same thing with its cross-border payment uh, uh, strategy. I think it is essential that we, as the US government and this committee with jurisdiction on this issue, promote a strategy to maintain the preeminence of the US dollar as the primary currency for reserve purposes and for international payments. And I think that's going to require us to both be competitive on our end, what can we do to make the dollar attractive, and it's going to require us to throw some sand in the gears of efforts by the Chinese and other countries like Russia to try to build out these um, alternative payment rails. I'm thinking about, uh, and, and I appreciate your, your, your response, but uh, when we think of this uh, as, a, as a global problem, um, the idea that we could ally with other countries that are that have the integrity of the SWIFT system and operate within that system, how could we partner with them? Uh, what could we do here to, to strengthen the SWIFT system? If not, I don't know if we could get buy-in from many of our allies to increase the strength of the U.S. dollar, but I do think we could get buy-in to increase the integrity and the, uh, the affinity for operating within the SWIFT system, which would, which would put push back on this attempt by, by the Chinese to, and, and the Russians to adopt a different set of rails. What, what could we do to encourage or strengthen the SWIFT system? So I'd make two comments, one in the SWIFT system, one outside, or sort of parallel to the SWIFT system. First, the Federal Reserve has an active program underway to try to speed up US dollar payments that are currently going through the existing Federal Reserve uh, organized payment rails, and I think that's really important because payments internationally can be slow, and we need to make sure that they are working faster so that people want to continue to use the existing system. And so I think what the Fed is doing is important, and then also putting friendly pressure on SWIFT and on the banks and their correspondent sort of relationships to make sure payments are sped up there, too, is another important area of work. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Gentlemen's time has expired. We'll now recognize the uh, Vice Chair of the full committee, Mr. Hill of Arkansas, for five minutes. I thank you, Chair McHenry, and it is what a, what a pleasure it is to say those words, Chair McHenry. The members uh, have been a part of your leadership team for many years, and we're ready to work with the committee's agenda and deliver on our commitment to America. 
as we go into this today's hearing, we should all remember the basic things that we take for granted here. Uh, Chinese Communist Party maintains a surveillance state with the Great Firewall and no freedom of speech, no freely exchangeable currency, and no rule of law. But we can never compete with a free and open society that lies for, re allows for free enterprise and prosperity like in the United States, where we encourage innovation, entrepreneurship, small businesses, and a thriving marketplace of ideas. It's the same reason America was able to develop the internet as well as the deepest and most liquid capital markets in the world. China tries to replicate that it's tough, uh, but they're working to catch up. And it's through that lens that I hope we can work in a bipartisan way in this Congress to create a framework for digital assets that allows for innovation, provides for clarity, and protects investors in a way that they can understand. Mr. Chairman, uh, America cannot win this strategic competition with China by trying to be more like China and be focused on passing more industrial policy measures. We have to protect American workers and businesses by fighting for a level playing field while standing up for our values of freedom, free enterprise, both here and abroad. That includes doing the hard work of oversight on the multilateral organizations in our jurisdiction like the International Monetary Fund and the World Bank. I thank Chair McHenry for noticing several of my legislative initiatives that advance U.S. strategic interest at these international financial institutions, securing America's medical supply chain, deterring war in the Taiwan Strait, and protecting the dollar position as the global reserve currency. Mr. Williams, I was glad to uh, hear your testimony about uh, the multilateral coordination and how that's critical to ensure that U.S. measures on China are effective and that we should be active at the World Bank and the IMF to pressure China to act like the responsible international stakeholder that they claim uh, to be. I couldn't agree with you more, especially as China continues to refuse consistently to provide debt relief to developing countries. It is saddled with loans that they can't pay back. Beijing blatantly ignores international lending rules like the Paris Club, and yet, in my view, uh, the Biden Treasury has not been strong enough. Your, your written testimony mentions the G20 has been less effective and that we need to be realistic about how much we can achieve in that forum. In my view, using the G20 is a feeble place to try to achieve anything significant. Uh, and so let me ask you, uh, very few countries have taken the G20 up on this debt restructuring framework that uh, Treasury Secretary Yellen uh, pro-offered last year, and very few non-Paris Club creditors like China are remotely in compliance. What can we do in the international fora by the U.S. to pressure China to restructure their predatory loans and fully participate in the Paris Club? Thank you for a very good question. And let me just first say I agree with almost everything you said. You made a lot of great comments about how we shouldn't become China to beat China. We need to double down on our strengths. Now, with respect to the international institutions, uh, you, you hit the nail on the head. China made a commitment at the G20. It's not following through. And um, we have had challenges in enforcing that. Now, I think some of the legislation that, that you've discussed uh, here can help at the IMF. I think we need to look at a broader package of reforms that calls out specific behaviors. And, and, and you know, I'm not sure how you can put an enforcement mechanism into the IMF. That's the challenge. But I think you need to look at, it really has to be collective. collectively. We work with allies maybe through the G7 to coordinate approach we call them out, we embarrass them politically, internationally. Thank you. I, I agree with you, and I think you've hit the nail on the head. We need to be working where we have influence and shareholder votes at the board of the World Bank, on the IMF, and through the G7, and not off in the talk fest at the G20. Uh, let me turn to Mr. Lober, uh, Lorber. This Congress, I'll be serving on the Intelligence Committee. I look forward to working with my good friend from Connecticut, Jim Himes, also a member of this committee, to serve as the ranking member of Intel. You were at the Treasury. Can you help me understand where the gaps from your point of view are on economic intelligence and data gathering related to China and China's uh, economic uh, success, failure, transparency on the, on the data that we get about China? Thanks. It's, it's a great question. I realize I only have a few seconds uh, left. And you can answer. submit your answer in writing. Okay. Thank you. Let me do that. And, Mr. Chairman, before I yield back, let me ask unanimous consent to enter in a record and opinion piece I wrote in The Hill in 2019 called Build Back Nuclear. 
uh, without objection. And uh, thank you for uh, working with me on that nuclear bill. Continue to work with me on that nuclear bill. Uh, with that, we'll recognize the uh, oversight ranking member, a gentleman uh, from Texas, Mr. Green, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I thank the ranking member as well. And uh, I would like to pose a question related to a bill emanating from the Texas Senate SB 147. This bill has language in it that indicates the following may not purchase or otherwise acquire title to real property in this state. And it goes on to set out individuals who cannot purchase or acquire real property. A person who is a citizen of China is listed. Iran, North Korea, as well as Russia. This has caused a good deal of consternation among many of my constituents. Uh, I think that it's difficult for some people who are not of color or from a minority, occupy a minority status, to understand how legislation as well as language can impact what they perceive as their safety. People are leg legitimately concerned, in my opinion, about their safety because of this legislation, which singles out persons from China. By the way, the bill doesn't make an exception for a green card holder, although the um, person who has crafted this now says that, that such an exception will be available. The legislation doesn't make mention of sensitive sites or critical in infrastructure. It just says if you're a citizen of China, you can't buy property. Um, let me start with uh, Mr. Harrell. Uh, sir, um, do you understand how this can first impact people in the social setting? Uh, and then I'd like for your comments about the Pandora's box we may be opening if we allow every state to decide that it will make rules or promulgate laws that will impact the purchase of property based upon citizenship of persons. Thank you very much, uh, Congressman, for both those questions. I should begin by saying I think it is essential that as we compete with China and with the Chinese government, we as Americans never slide down the road of discriminating against people based on their race or their ethnic uh, or national uh, origin. I think we want to make clear that we continue to welcome talented Chinese engineers and talented Chinese people of all backgrounds to come to the U.S. to set up uh, businesses and take advantages of the opportunities here, and we should not be discriminating uh, on people against people based on their national origin. I think there are legitimate concerns around certain um, purchases of real estate by companies and certain individuals connected to China. That's why in 2018, the CFIUS Committee got jurisdiction to review purchases of land or leases of land near sensitive military sites. If there are ways in which that um, statute is inadequate if there are other kinds of sites or infrastructure uh, where we are concerned about and the defense and intelligence community are concerned about uh, espionage risks, this committee should look at CFIUS and see if CFIUS needs a little bit more jurisdiction over other kinds of real estate purchases. I don't think we want to see a patchwork of state laws um, prohibiting ownership of property uh, based on national origin. That's just not the right way to tackle this kind of a problem. This is a federal problem, and it also comes off as hostile to the many legitimate, sort of perfectly fair kinds of purchases that are out there. Thank you much. Let me quickly move on because I have 39 seconds left. If you believe that we must, absolutely must raise the debt ceiling, would you kindly extend a hand into the air? Only one person believes that we must raise the debt ceiling. Now three, 
Okay. If Are you, you asking the committee as well? No, uh, <laughs> I'm going to make an exception for the chairman. Thank you. Would you give me 10 seconds now? Uh, so uh, raise your hands again, please. I, I want to have this. I, I'm going to have a picture of this in my office. Uh, so everybody believes we should. Okay. We should raise it. We must. It's easy. Okay. Do you believe that we must cut the budget to raise it? Gentlemen's time's expired. Mr. Appreciate Chairman, can I get my 10 seconds that you borrowed from me for that answer, please? Just for Without that objection, I'd give the gentleman an additional seven seconds that I took from him. All right, thank you. Would you raise your hand if you think we must cut the budget to raise it? Three. Thank you. I'll make sure that we properly photograph you. Thank you. I yield back. Well, if we reset the, the time, I don't want to take anyone else's time. I thank the experts on China for your opinions about domestic American politics uh, and uh, for complying with the oddness of hand raising in a congressional format. From time to time, we all do it. It happens. With that, I'd like to you'll, um, recognize the chair of the Capital Markets Subcommittee, the gentlewoman from Missouri, Mrs. Wagner. I uh, thank Chairman McHenry for organizing this, I think, critical and very timely hearing, and I want to thank our experts uh, uh, for their, uh, our witnesses today, for their expertise, and we will have no raising of hands in my questioning. I spent the weekend tracking the progress of the Chinese spy balloon as it threw, flew unimpeded over U.S. skies, surveilling sensitive military sites, uh, my own Whiteman Air Force Base, civilian centers across the country, including all across the second congressional district of Missouri. My children and I, along with countless families uh, across St. Louis, watched in real time from our porches, our backyard, outside of our businesses, as a foreign aircraft equipped with spyware navigated over our neighborhoods, again, our infrastructure, our nuclear plants in Callaway, our military bases, and such. China's decision to send a spy balloon into U.S. airspace was a profound and deliberate provocation. It should have been met with strength from the get-go and shot down before it even entered our skies um, or U.S. airspace. President Biden's decision to let the CCP spy balloon transit the length and breadth of the United States of America was an unpardonable show of weakness on the world stage. As vice chair of the House Committee on Foreign Affairs, I am calling on the administration to restore America's ability to deter these reckless provocations. The stakes of strategic competition with China are exceedingly high. And if the CCP's influence continues to spread and grow unchallenged, American communities will pay the price. The world will be less open, less prosperous, less fair, and much more insecure. We cannot allow the U.S.-led world to remain vulnerable to the whims of communist dictators and the dictatorship in Beijing. That's why I have championed legislation to hold China accountable at all levels of engagement. My bill, the Compensation for Americans Act, would insulate America's vulnerable supply chains from over-reliance on China, allow U.S. companies that have been attacked by Chinese hackers to strike back, and prevent China from manipulating developing country designations to obtain preferential treatment in international organizations. And importantly, it would also tighten U.S. export controls to choke off the CCP's ability to disseminate propaganda and further develop its surveillance capabilities. I believe we have a duty to stand up to the nations that refuse to play by the rules. And when we demonstrate strength and resolve in the face of China's bullying and brinkmanship, we make the world a safer and more prosperous place. Mr. Ashu, the export control system is a powerful tool that restricts the resources available to our enemies. However, implementation is extremely challenging especially considering that China cannot be trusted to adhere to licensing agreements. What are the major gaps in the U.S. export control system, and how should the United States approach, uh, especially the dual-use exports? Uh, thank you, Congresswoman. I, I actually mentioned in my opening comments that we actually need a different approach when it comes to things like 
uh, complex supply chains because there are methods for multilateral control that exist right now. I don't believe they're adequate. I believe that for export controls to work, anything done unilaterally is out of the gate probably going to be limited in its effectiveness and you need to work with allied nations, especially those that have that have similar capabilities to deliver similar technology. I, I appreciate your, your perspective and I agree. The, the Bureau, Mr. Eshoo, um of Industry and Security, BIS, waited until after Russia attacked before applying strict export controls on its military and users. Yet the buildup of Russian forces on the Ukrainian border, which no doubt posed a significant threat to the U.S. interests, certainly met BIS's criteria for aggressive controls. Purely waiting until after the invasion to apply export controls neither prevented nor deterred Russian aggression from Ukraine. What were the failures of BIS strategy in the run-up to the invasion of Ukraine, and how should the U.S. incorporate lessons learned to deter aggression against, for example, Taiwan? So I, I might say BIS is responsible for the dual-use export controls, which by its nature contains a lot of commercial technology. I'm not exactly sure where BIS was failing in restricting dual-use controls in the lead-up. The military, there should have been zero to nothing in terms of military shipments. So I'd like to know more about the question you're asking, because that would be a very sobering. Uh, uh, it, it would be. I, time has expired. My time's expired, and I, I yield back, Mr. Chair. I thank uh, the gentlewoman. Mr. Cleaver is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I, I think this uh, hearing is quite appropriate. Uh, it, it's extremely, uh, I think, uh, important. Uh, I'm not going to talk about the balloon. Uh, in fact, I, I'm, I, I'm going to wait until, um, until our uh, intelligence uh, community um, provides us with some data. We don't even know what's, what's going on so far. Um, and, um, uh, but I am concerned about something. I, I was looking at what, we, what we're doing here. Uh, you know, the, the world's two biggest economies, uh, United States and China, uh, we are in a battle with uh, a nation that uses its nation, using, using the government of the nation uh, to propel its development uh, and around the world. Uh, and of course, we deal, deal with the private sector. Uh, the trade uh, relationship between the U.S. and China, uh, as my little granddaughter says, is, is ginormous. Um, and then we, we uh, import uh, more goods from China than we import from any other nation uh, on the globe. Uh, there are some benefits, and so we, we uh, lower prices uh, for consumers. Uh, and also some bohemoth uh, profits uh, for the corporate sector. Uh, and, and so, you know, my, my one, my, my issue is, you know, we have a schizophrenic relationship, don't we, with China? Any, any of you? Is, is schizophrenia a bad word on, on, in terms of describing the relationship? Yeah, um, I, I think we have, you know, we are obviously at a pivot point in our relationship to China, where there is a growing, I think, strong bipartisan consensus that we need a different uh, set of policies. Now, I think in certain ways, the trading relationship and some of the structures on the trading relationship is lagging behind the geopolitical realities we now face, and we could have a long discussion about how to better balance the trade and, and tariffs. Personally, I think what we need to move to at a conceptual level with China is a much more managed trading and investment relationship. They're heavily managed on their side of the economy. They have all kinds of distortive subsidies. They have all kinds of unfair IP theft and things like that. And we're just going to have to manage the trading relationship with them so that they don't undercut our economy and our prosperity with all the things they're doing uh, over there uh, in China. Mr. Yeah. Lober. Oh, yeah, Lober. and if I could just add to that, I mean, I, I don't know if I would use the word schizophrenic, but I do think we should have somewhat of a bifurcated approach, and that there are areas where clearly certain types of trade could pose a national security threat, and we need to crack down on those, or there are areas where China is clearly cheating 
uh, we need to deploy tools to counteract that. On the other hand, I think it's critical to realize that the Chinese market is really important for a lot of our companies. And if that we're gonna be globally competitive, we wanna be selling into China. And think about it this way. If we're selling a bunch of stuff to China, essentially Chinese consumers are subsidizing our continued innovation, and that's a good thing. So I think what we wanna do is try to be bifurcated, as I described it, crack down where it's unfair or where there's a national security concern, but op try to open up China where it can benefit the United States. Mm -hmm. Uh, yeah, I, I, wanted, I wanted to move to, to the uh, 1970 uh, uh, Bank S Secrecy Act, uh, uh, and then you just raised another issue I wanted to make me want to go, go into that a little bit more, because uh, we, we're, well, I won't, I, I, let me get to the Bank Secrecy Act. Uh, you know, uh, I, I think there are rules being, being for, uh, formulated now, but I, I'd like to, to, to find out from you, Mr. Lorber. Um, uh, you know the real estate industry, um, in my estimation, is is vulnerable to money laundering because they are uh, at the, at this moment they're not required uh, to comply with this rather old but but very important Bank Secrecy Act. Uh, and 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 I'm, do you agree that uh, that real estate transactions ought to also be reported, uh, just as banks are now required? Required to re report, uh, you know, suspicious. Oh my goodness! Thank you, Mr. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The gentleman's time has expired. Mr. Barr from Kentucky for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I thank uh, Chairman McHenry for putting together this outstanding panel. Thank our witnesses for addressing what I believe to be the most consequential uh, national security and economic security challenge of our of our generation. Uh, our strategic competition with the People's Republic of China and countering the threat from the CCP. Uh, I want to uh, uh, specifically um, compliment Mr. Fedo for his testimony that as we look at investment screening, outbound investment, and this important dimension of our economic competition with the PRC, that um, this is an issue that Congress needs to deal with, and that uh, creating an investment screening mechanism by executive order would be a major mistake. Now, I will compliment the Trump administration for the executive order that banned uh, uh, U.S. investment in certain Chinese military industrial companies, and I would also compliment the Biden administration for expanding on that executive order with its own to expand it to surveillance companies. But this is an issue that Congress needs to set the, the parameters for and direct the executive branch to implement. And I want uh, the witnesses to comment on my legislation that seeks to do that, H.R. 760, the Chinese Military and Surveillance Company Sanctions Act, which would expand on those executive orders um, uh, and extend uh, the, uh, uh, the full weight of Treasury sanctions against these uh, Chinese uh, military industrial complex uh, and surveillance companies while allowing U.S. investors to continue to invest in benign companies in emerging uh, growth markets. So Mr. Williams, let me start with you. Is this approach, my bill, is it, the, is it a good way, is it the best way to ensure that capital flows don't fund the Chinese military industrial complex? And when you answer that question, I want you to address the two gaps that you talked about in your prepared testimony. Does my bill get at those two gaps, uh, specifically the private equity and venture capital piece, uh, and also uh, international, the multilateral impact, the in other international non-U.S. investors? So thank you, Congressman, and I think you're absolutely right that we need to have a, a statutory basis for these actions and that uh, Congress should work on that in a very studied and thorough way. I also agree with you that we want to expand on the existing restrictions, and what I describe in my testimony, and, and I, I believe your bill addresses it, but we can work on the, the technical aspects of it, um, is number one, the current executive order only applies to investment in public securities. That should also be expanded to private investment. Uh, and secondly, um, the bill or the current EO only applies to a limited subset of sectors within China. There may be national security threats in other sectors, and we need to be able to look at those as well. So I look forward to working with you on your legislation. Yeah, I want to move. I want to expand it also to technology-related companies, dual-use technology, AI, other things that implicate national security. Um, and I agree, the the executive orders don't address that. My bill, though, uh, Mr. Williams, it would address, with using OFAC sanctions, it would address that private equity venture capital piece, right? 
That's my understanding. And then, Mr. Fetto, um, to your, uh, to your uh, point about uh, the Casey Cornyn approach and the Committee on National Critical Capabilities, similar to reverse CFIUS, I appreciated your uh, point that um, creating a bureaucracy that ensnares a lot of benign outbound investment is maybe not the targeted approach we need. Can you expand uh, on that testimony? And, and why would the OFAC approach, a simple, clear message signal to the private sector, green light, red light, be better than a bureaucratic uh, uh, approach such as this Committee on National Critical Capabilities? In the first instance, it would be far more nimble um, and with a committee, you have inefficiencies. The committee, I'll just say, one of the, the deficiencies I, I see with a, a committee set up um, is you can't unring the bell. Once you do this, for example, and I, I'm a big fan of CFIUS, and I think it's a, a great tool and appropriately used and focused on national security, but it's been around for 50 years, okay? And so if we create a new bureaucracy to screen outbound, there's, it, it's, it's gonna be here. And so I do agree that the, the, the OFAC approach seems to me to be a, a, an approach that hasn't been adequately explored. And Thank you. In a, in a prohibition context, uh, making these like SDNs, it prohibits all dealing. So private mm -hmm. equity and venture capital would be in Thank the Thank you. Mix. And Mr. Williams, in my remaining time, I appreciate your focus on pairing defensive actions with offensive actions to maintain U.S. economic strength. In response to Mr. Harrell's testimony about the debt limit, can you speak to the overspending in Washington and how that compromises the dominance of the dollar and how we need to pair avoiding default with reform? The gentleman's time has expired. I look forward to it in my written testimony. Thank you. Yield back. Thank you for responding in writing. Uh, we now turn to Mr. Foster for five minutes. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you to our witnesses. I'd like to say that I'm speaking as a, a manufacturer, someone who started a company that's provided over a 1,000 jobs and kept those manufacturing jobs in the Midwest. And for decades, we have competed against cloned Chinese products, and we've become increasingly dependent on, on Chinese components of our supply chain. And that's the commercial reality. I'd also like to echo uh, Mr. Eshoo's comments that we should be thinking in terms of reducing, if not the defensive perimeter, but at least the stronghold from the G20 to G the G7. The free democracies of the world are the group of countries through which we should have free, absolutely free markets, as, as free as our politics allow. And then the G20 will be more contested area. But we have to, we have to make common cause with the G7. And I'd also like to say it's not just the G7. When you say G7, please include Korea. Korea's economy is larger than Russia, all right? It is the Koreans, not the Taiwanese, that lead the world in leading edge semiconductor production. Samsung, not TSMC, is in production at the three nanometer design node. So I'd also, what I'd like to focus my questions on are really one of demographic trends. I'm sure many of you, not all of you, may remember the essay, The, the Japan That Can Say No. Uh, and this was, uh, in, and I guess the subtitle was Why Japan Will Be First Among Equals. It was published in 1989 and got a lot of attention. It made the point that Japan had taken over semiconductor supply chain. They had taken over, they led the, the world in semiconductors. Japan was on the same sort of exponential economic growth curve that China has been on for the last decade or, or more. And there was a lot of hand-wringing over Japanese threats of intellectual property. Um, and so what happened? Well, first off, Japan, like China, just suffered a massive real estate bust that limited their ability to continue to invest in leading edge technologies. And as a result, they lost the lead in semiconductors. Uh, they also faced an aging society, uh, which is uh, really, you know, demographics is destiny. And we have to understand that. Um, and they also lost the wage competition. Japan lost the wage competition with other uh, low-cost providers, exactly what China is going through now and will be going through for the next decade. And we have to make, we have to have that clearly in mind. I'm most worried that China is going to misbehave because it will have the behavior of a pressed rat rather than the behavior of a, um, of a conquering hero. They are in deep trouble because of the collapse of their real estate bubble, which, is, which dwarfs the, the Japanese real estate collapse. Their um, regional governments are basically insolvent because the gravy train from developers 
um, you know, paying, it, it's a long story, but it's, it, they're in, the regional governments are basically bankrupt and the, un, and the central government's unwilling to, to bail them out. Um, and and the, the demographic projections are really daunting. You know, they, the, the estimates are that sometime between 2060 and the, and the end of the century, 2060 and the end of the century, China's population will be half of what it is today. There is never going to be this giant $1.4 billion prosperous middle class in China. Their educational levels do not support it. Um, their forays into chip production have collapsed in a blaze of corruption, all right? And they, they're just a complete failure. Um, and, and the companies see this too, that there isn't going to be this massive middle class market in China. And they've they started to pull out. You know, the Korean companies pulled out, tried pulling out starting several years ago and are finding what other companies find that it's pretty much impossible to get your money back out of China. That you know, what they can, when they built a you know, shipyard or a port um, and they want to get their money back out from that investment, uh, pretty much they have to just turn over the keys and walk away. And so this is, and that's not a unique experience. And so that the, the attractiveness of China as a place for foreign investment is going way down as companies around the world understand this. So I was just wondering if any of you have comments on, on the demographics of China and, and how that should affect our thinking. Um, we'll just start from the left. Mr. Asher, you wanna give it a shot? It, there's, it's indisputable that that is a meaningful trend. Uh, I, it's outside my area of expertise, but what I am, uh, I'd like to commend you for is the fact that so much of what we do with respect to adversary countries is in the near term. We need to be paying, paying attention to long-term threats and their, their implications as well. Yeah. So I, I commend okay. you Okay, other comments on that? Sure, I'll go ahead and comment, and I, I think your comments are right on. Uh, I do believe China is an existential threat to our leadership, but I don't think China is 10 foot tall. I think it's about 6'5", six, 6'6". And you know, we need to keep that perspective as we're addressing it. And in many ways, Xi Jinping is the country's worst enemy because his policies are inferior to ours. Gentlemen's time has expired. Yield back. It's now time for the distinguished chairman of the Small Business Committee and a longtime member of this committee, Mr. Williams, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you for the committee to be here, for the witnesses to be here today. We need to be very clear, China is a hostile nation looking up uh, to upend the United States standing in the world. And as we saw with the spy balloon this weekend that they brazenly flew over our airspace last week to sending fentanyl across our porous southern border, China is attempting to weaken our country in any way possible. An important piece of this equation that we must uh, take a serious look at is foreign purchases of farmland that is threatening our country's national scrutiny. And in my home state of Texas, uh, uh, foreign entities control more than 4.7 million acres of land. We talked about that earlier. And I'm also, a, a, I'm also a rancher. So should any hostile nation like China want to cause permanent harm to our food security and domestic supply chains is a real problem, and this is uh, how they, they would do it. So, uh, Mr. Fedo, a question. Can you expand upon the threat that foreign agriculture purchases put in our country's national security, and do you think Treasury is currently equipped to tackle this, uh, this threat? Sir, thank you for the question. I, I do think they're equipped. I, I know there have been a number of occasions where the Congress has considered adding the Secretary of Agriculture to the voting members of the committee. The way the committee has been uh, constructed by Congress, Treasury has the ability to bring in any department at, it, at any time to participate in the analysis of, of an issue like food security, agricultural infrastructure security, and so I do think they're equipped uh, to, to do so. As to um, as to the bigger issue, I think my understanding is the GAO currently is um, conducting a survey and a study of the extent to which foreign investors acquire agricultural land in the United States. And I would encourage the Congress to, to um, hold its fire, so to speak, until it, it sees the results of that. My understanding is at this moment, Chinese ownership of agricultural land in the United States is somewhere around 340,000 acres, and that's compared to uh, almost 900 million acres of, of farmland. So I just would suggest that before we move forward with a response from a national security perspective, that we make sure that we're not taking a baseball bat to something that needs, needs a, 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 a more precise um, scalpel to, to tackle. All right, thank you. The only thing they may understand is the baseball bat, though. 
the end of the day. But our southern border has been an absolute disaster over the last two years. Like I say, I live in Texas, and there are 2.7 million people that legally crossed the border in fiscal year 2022, 98 of whom were on the terrorist list. We've all seen these numbers, and the massive influx of people straining border towns is not the only problem. Drug smuggling has been on the rise. There's been 356 million lethal doses of fentanyl confiscated in Texas alone. So this is Doug, uh, uh, this drug has been destroying communities across the country and claimed the lives of 100,000 Americans last year, future generations we're seeing dying down there. So we must get serious about stopping the border crisis. This administration is not. So we can slow the spread of this deadly drug flooding in our streets. So Mr. Lorber, can you discuss China's role in the fentanyl crisis and what sanctions could be effective in your mind in mitigating this problem? Yeah, it's a, it's a great question and obviously a very, a very terrible problem. Um, to date, uh, Treasury has taken uh, a number of actions against Chinese entities involved in illicit uh, fentanyl production and trade coming over the border in particular. So in, I think it was December of, of 21, uh, the, the Biden administration put out an executive order focused on, on uh, to a certain you know, range of topics, but focused uh, specifically on, on Chinese entities involved in that activity and likewise, uh, I think just about a week ago, maybe a little bit more, there were a number of Chinese uh, individuals and entities that were designated um, from a sanctions perspective um, uh, for that activity. With that being said, I think there's a lot more that needs to be done, and it should be a major focus of both law enforcement and intelligence, as well as Treasury Department. All right. The last question. Over the last few years, the United States has faced significant supply chain disruptions. I'm in the car business, so I can tell you all about the supply chain. This exposed uh, uh, our re reliance on China for trade and manufacturing. The United States need to diversify. I think all of us understand our domestic manufacturing base, and so we're able to insulate ourselves from this global supply chain instability. It's critical as we come out of this pandemic era that we focus on creating more domestic supply chains to prevent this from happening. So real quick, uh, Mr. Willems, how can we increase our supply chain resilience, and what can we do to incentivize companies to move it out of China? So two quick ideas. I mean, first, in terms of trying to get them to move to the United States, we need competitive tax and regulatory policies. Second, in terms of diversification, I would look at a friend-shoring strategy, and I would look at trade agreements as a positive incentive for companies to move out of China. The gentleman's time is You back. Thank the gentleman from Texas, our distinguished ranking member of the National Security Committee, Ms. Beatty of Ohio, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, this question is for Mr. Harrell. I have a few questions I'll try to get through. Um, in 2019, led by this committee, Congress passed the longest-term reauthorization of the United States Export-Import Bank. And now we have a, a new chair that has been very clear uh, that she wants to advance competitiveness. She also wants to take a look at targeting and expanding and diversifying. And we've heard from our financial services a planning a meeting that we're going to look at um, diversity and, and inclusion. So I just wanted to enter that part in the record in my opening. But the question uh, to you is, uh, when we look at that reauthorization bill, uh, which included the China Transformation Export Program, are there any ideas or things that you have that you'd want to share that XM uh, use this authority and other trade authorities to improve Americans' competitiveness, especially in regard to what we're hearing about with China. What can we do through that authorization or through export-import uh, to help us? Any ideas? Uh, thank you very much uh, for the question. I think both the uh, XM Bank and also the Development Finance Corporation are a very important set of tools in our toolkit to compete with uh, China. And I think the 2019 authorization you spoke about and the uh, ability to create the transformational export program is a key piece of making XM uh, competitive. I know that over the last uh, year or so that Chair Lewis has been in uh, at XM, she has been working diligently um, to implement the transformational export uh, program. I think it is important, you know, reality is if we're gonna provide financing, um, you know, for a US telecom maker to compete with a Chinese telecom maker and, you know, Argentina or somewhere like that, there has to be the kind of flexibility that is allowed under, um, under the 2019 uh, authorization 
to recognize how the U.S. companies can actually put that deal together. So I think it is less, and I think it is now there, I think that what we need is less additional changes to the statute of XM. I think you did that in 2019. And more just some time for Rita Joe and all the great staff at XM to go out and source the deals, because that takes time. So I think that work is happening. It just takes some, some time to go find the deals. Uh, thank you for that. And let me also say to enter into the record that Rita Joe Lewis has also created a, a new office uh, to have a global, a bigger global footprint with the Office of Global Finance and Development. So I think she's done an amazing job in a, a short period. Mr. Harold, let me continue. China has been taking advantage of America's lack of investments or presence everywhere from the Caribbean to Latin America to Africa to the Asian Pacific region. Short of significant dollar increases in grants to these partner neighbors, and especially if my colleagues on the other side keep their promises to decrease the budget despite the many national security challenges, what can America do to offer alternatives to Chinese investments in trade to otherwise compete with China in this global uh, South and everywhere? I think we have to get, um, in a world where we're not gonna be, where we may not be spending more federal dollars going forward, uh, to build those relationships. We're going to have to be more creative uh, in building private sector ties, uh, potentially poten uh, around supply chain resilience and potentially around technology. I look at the announcement uh, two weeks ago now between the US and India, where you saw it was a government announcement, but what you're essentially seeing is a partnership between companies to work on AI, to work on space, to work on those kind of things. I think that's an interesting model. I think you could say the same, take a similar approach in Central America or in the Caribbean where we could pull together manufacturers, for example, that are looking to diversify away from China, maybe currently making things in China, and encourage them to relocate into the Caribbean or into Latin America. So we're just gonna have to leverage the private sector better uh, for Thank those you. kinds of things. And, and let me in in my last uh, few seconds. Would you agree that it would be a good idea for us to promote uh, American entrepreneurship. And the reason I say that with chips, we're saying that we need to have more small businesses, more entrepreneurs when we look at our national security. And my time is up and I yield back. Thank the gentlewoman from Ohio. You can answer that question in writing. And now we turn to the gentleman from Georgia for five minutes, Mr. Loudermilk. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate everyone being here. It's interesting that uh, the Bank Security Act was brought up earlier, which um, I don't necessarily disagree with the sentiment. I just don't know that the Bank Security Act is the place to, to report real estate purchases. However, um, I believe the Bank Security Act needs to be revised because we're dealing with reporting thresholds that were developed in the 1970s at $10,000 to where it should be around sixty-five dollars to $70,000 today. One of the reasons that um, I think it's important for us to update those is because at these low thresholds, the government is forcing financial institutions to report significant information to the government, of which the government is holding information about individual citizens and businesses that they're not utilizing. When I was in the intelligence arena in the Air Force, um, we had one principle, which was if you don't need something, don't keep it, because you don't have to protect what you don't have. I know that the United States is a huge target for cyber crimes and, and uh, for data breaches, and even U.S. law enforcement agencies have repeatedly called China the most significant state actor threat to our country in cyberspace, which we know the government would be a target. Now, I bring up the Bank Security Act because while we're trying to reform that so the government isn't keeping a lot of PII on citizens that could be... Uh, uh, breached to a foreign actor, U.S. regulators are implementing a, cons a consolidated audit trail, which would also capture a lot of information uh, and does capture information about investors. And so, um, Mr. Lorber, um, some of the information that, and, and we've worked to kind of minimize some of the information that is collected by the consolidated audit trail, uh, but under the current iteration, 
uh, the consolidated audit trail, the customer accounts and, and uh, information systems would include names, addresses, and date of birth for most U.S. investors. What risk would this information pose to U.S. investors if a foreign adversary, specifically the Chinese, were to gain that information? Thank you, Congressman. It's a good question. I'm not specifically familiar with the consolidated information audit trail uh, that you're mentioning. However, I will say that any situation in which there is consolidated personal information about individuals, uh, there is a risk that if that information is secured or captured or breached, that it could be you know, used to, to develop information that could be you know, used to compromise those persons or otherwise uh, exploit information about them. Yeah. Uh, Mr. Willem, do you have any thoughts on on uh, the consolidated audit trail or the information if it was divulged to China that could be used against U.S. citizens or our, our economic stability? I think you're right to ask questions about it, but it's not my specific area of expertise. Okay. Well, um, let, me, let me move on uh, for another area of this. And there, as, as I said, there's been some progress of limiting the types of PIA and the consolidated audit trail. Um, for anybody, uh, what type of retention policy do you believe would be appropriate to prevent any information, whether it's from consolidated audit trail, uh, tax re return information, what type of um, data retention policy do you believe would be appropriate to prevent information from falling into uh, China or any foreign adversary? Anybody? I think this illustrates that we've got some areas that we're still not really thinking about because a lot of times we're focused on China as China versus the United States government, when in reality is China versus the individual citizen of the United States as well. And so I think this is something that we need to invest time and effort looking into as far as protecting uh, data and information. Uh, from cyber actors, and part of that, and, and, and I'll conclude with this, that I've said all along, the government is our biggest security risk because it is mandating massive amounts of data to be collected from financial institutions, from individuals that is not used by the government. I mean, when you look at the currency transaction reports, over 90% of them are never looked at. I would imagine this a, a near same statistic on uh, 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 the other reports that have to come in, suspicious activity reports. If we're not using the data, why are we collecting it? Why are we keeping it? Why are we mandating uh, other institutions to provide it? With that, uh, Mr. Chair, I yield back. Thank the gentleman. Now Mr. Vargas from California for five minutes. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I'd like to thank Chairman McHenry and Ranking Members Waters for convening this hearing on such a pertinent topic. It is very, very important. Uh, Mr. Williams, did I hear you correctly, or hear about you correctly, that you were on the NSC for the previous uh, administration? That's correct. All right. Uh, during the time of the Trump administration, did we have any Chinese incursions of these, these spy balloons? Like Mr. Harrell, I was part of the econ office, not the uh defense or national security part of the, the uh, NSC. So do you know or do you not know then? I, I'm not aware. It's not my expertise to speak. Right. Not your expertise. It's not my expertise either, but I've heard ones flying around, right? Obviously, and we shot it down. So during the time that you were there, were you told that there was a Chinese spy balloon flying all around the United States? That's not the kind of thing I would have been briefed on. Okay. So you didn't hear about that? It's not the kind of thing I would have been briefed on. Okay. The reason I ask is it seems that there were a number of Chinese spy balloons that were flying around, and nobody shot them down. In fact, it seems like they didn't even know about them, sadly. Talking about strength, they didn't even know they were there. Now, this president gets criticized because he shot it down. The other president didn't even see the damn things. But anyway, I think it's a little bit like the hypocrisy of this debt limit when President Trump raised it three times, added $7 trillion to the deficit, and I didn't hear a peep out of my colleagues on the other side other than, raise it more, raise it more. And all of a sudden, now there are fiscal hawks 
You know, we've got to do something about that damn deficit. Yeah, after you guys raised it so much by giving all that money to the wealthy guys, great. But anyway, we're here about this CCP. I do want to ask this. I, I, and I want to thank the comment that was made by some of my colleagues on the other side, and that was that uh, we're really here to talk about the Chinese Communist Party, not the Chinese people, and make that distinction. You know, the, the Chinese people are good people, like good people everywhere. And we do have a problem in this country with Asian hate. And we don't want to flame that. But at the same time, we do want to go after our adversaries, our competitors, and that's the Chinese Communist Party. So I think it's very appropriate that we look at how we can fight back. And I was also very pleased to hear from some of my colleagues that they believe in the preeminence of the U.S. dollar and, the reserve, and that we are, the dollar is the world's reserve currency. I think that's very, very important. I hope we keep to that. But I would say this. We have done a lot. The administration has done a lot to combat what the Chinese have been doing, the Chinese Communist Party. When China deployed it belt, its Belt and Road Initiative to increase its economic coercion across the globe, the Biden administration launched Partnerships for Global Infrastructure Investment with our G7 partners. When China threatened trading norms and international agreements in the Indo-Pacific, the Biden administration launched the Indo-Pacific Economic Framework, or IPEF, with 13 partner countries that together with the U.S. represent over 40% of global GDP. When the CCP decided to detain and oppress the Uyghurs, we passed the Uyghur Forced Labor Prevention Act to ensure that our companies do not source products using forced labor in their production. When the CCP attempted to become the new manufacturing capital of critical computing components, we worked together on a bipartisan basis to pass the Chips and Science Act. When we needed to modernize our domestic infrastructure to ensure our companies can compete globally, we passed the Bipartisan Infrastructure and Jobs Act. So yes, the CCP is a great threat. But when we work together across the aisle, especially, and put people over politics, we can mount a focused response to increase our economic competitiveness, competitiveness and produce good, clean jobs right here at home and protect our national security. And that's why I always find it interesting when we have some of my colleagues complaining about the Chinese, and I ask them, where's your suit made? And they say, I don't know, why don't you take a look? And you find out that it's made in China. I said, where's your tie made? Made in China. Where are your shoes made? They look them up because they don't know it's made in China. So if we really do believe that we're competing, we should start buying American and some of our allies instead of just buying the cheapest thing that you can find out that it looks good. With that, I yield back my time. Gentleman yields back. Gentleman from West Virginia, Mr. Mooney, is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I, and I do appreciate the comments from my colleague from California, distinguished between the people and the government. That's true of a lot of despotic governments around the world, Iran and other places. My mother fled communist Cuba, where that country still oppresses the people every day. I also agree with his comments about buying American. Uh, when I go shopping with my three children for Christmas, that drives them crazy because I won't buy anything made in China. And they have a hard time finding stuff, presents for my wife and stuff that's not made in China. But it is true that we need to uh, be uh, more patriotic when it comes to that in this country. Um, the Chinese government is moving rapidly toward implementing its digital currency, the digital yuan controlled by its central bank. Uh, Mr. Lorber, China is an authoritarian state and violator of human rights. Can you walk us through how the Chinese Communist Party can use its digital yuan to further crack down on dissent and the freedoms of its people? Thank you, uh, Congressman. I appreciate the question. Uh, so I think the, the concern that's been, been identified here is essentially that by using the digital renminbi domestically, China would be able to secure more information about the transactional history, the transactional preferences, and other personal information about individuals and entities who are using uh, that um, who are using the digital renminbi. So essentially, it would give them additional visibility into what's happening within the country. Thank you. I mean, it makes sense. The Chinese government spies on everybody, and its own people are not free of that. Many advocates of this central bank digital currency here claim that the, it's known as CBDC, claim that the U.S. not moving forward with a CBDC risks losing the U.S. dollar status as a reserve currency. So, Mr. Lorber, if the U.S. does not move forward with this central bank digital currency and instead allows private sector digital currencies to thrive, does that actually risk the U.S. dollar's reserve currency status? 
So I can't speak to the sort of broader macroeconomic questions about the adoption of a, of a federal CBDC. What I will say, and going back to an earlier conversation we had on this, is that I don't necessarily think that the rise of the Chinese digital renminbi for cross-border payments poses a major national security challenge to the dollar in the short term. I think it's something which is very worry, I'm sorry, very warranted to look at in the medium term, but at least in terms of the next, yeah, I think Mr. Harrell used the, the time frame of 12 months, I would say for the next few years, it's not something which would displace the dollar or create a risk of the displacement of the dollar. Okay, thank you for that answer. Look, we all know that uh, President Richard Nixon finally took us off the gold standard and when he was president, and now the U.S. dollar is uh, simply the full faith and credit of the United States of America. It's not tied to anything. I have a bill to go back to the gold standard. I've invited my colleagues on the other side of the aisle, if they're really serious about the dollar, uh, to tie it back to the gold standard, make it a superior product that way. But they won't do it. They won't do it. They refuse because they want to play all the games they want to play with the, with the Fed. And so you have the rise of digital currency, not, also not tied to anything specific, not much different than the U.S. dollar. So let's go back to the gold standard if we're serious about this. Um, I appreciate we're having this important hearing. There's no doubt that China is, a, is our top competitor and ad, adversary. The Chinese Communist Party, their government, uh, likes to cheat and oppress their own people. We have a lot of work to do to hold China accountable. And just because China's doing something doesn't mean the U.S. has to follow. The Chinese is a communist government. We're a free market economy here. We don't have to follow them. In fact, we should be very skeptical of following them. Uh, the United States has the best free market system in the world, and that's precisely why we do not uh, run our country the way China does and why we're the greatest superpower the world has ever seen. So let's not make a mistake here. Uh, but with that, Mr. Uh, Chairman, I'll yield back the balance of my time. Gentleman yields back, and now we turn to Mr. Kasten for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, uh, Patricia, all our witnesses. Um, hey, I want to start by answering the question that Mr. Posey asked, because I think it's worth having this on the record. He asked how much debt is held by uh, the Chinese U.S. debt. The answer is just over a trillion dollars. Interestingly enough, that's actually down from the peak in 2011. It was 1.3 trillion, is now down to one. And that is in spite of total foreign holdings of U.S. Treasuries being up about 80% during that period. And, and I mention that because, yes, we should be very concerned about our competitors, but numbers matter, right? And so, Mr. Harrell, I'd, I'd love to get some sense because that broader narrative, not, if you go beyond just debt and look at total foreign investments in U.S. securities, China is declining and declining in terms of its importance in the U.S. economy. They were, in 2010, held 1.6 trillion total U.S. securities were about 15 percent of foreign investments in U.S. securities. They're now down to less than 6 percent of the total holdings in U.S. securities. And so my question, Mr. Harrell, from a, as far as how, and sort of following on Mr. Foster's question, should we see China as a, as a country that is pivoting away from investments in the U.S. to invest in other places, or should we see them as a country that is, is having a harder time attracting investment revenue more broadly? And I, I don't have the data on national trends, but I'm wondering if you've got a sense of that. You know, thank you for coming back um, to this topic. It, it is interesting, um, you know, in addition to seeing this decline in kind of Chinese sovereign holdings of U.S., um, uh, U.S. debt, we have over the last couple of years generally seen uh, a decline in Chinese private investment in the U.S., driven in part by the 2018 firma law toughening up standards for Chinese investment uh, in the U.S. I think we're seeing a couple of things from a Chinese macroeconomic perspective. First, we've seen China's overall um, balance of payment surplus come down a bit over the last couple of years. Obviously, 2020 in particular, uh, and the last couple of years where they had a bunch of lockdowns and it threw off their trade flows, that has brought their uh, balance of payment surplus down. So I think they are looking, they have less money to park abroad than they used to. Uh, I think they have been trying to park more of it um, outside the U.S. for two reasons. First, they do see it, as we see with BRI and things like that, as a way of trying to build their own friendships and alliances away from the U.S. with developing countries. So I think they are looking to put it elsewhere. And then I think they do look at the risk of confrontation with the U.S. and wonder if they are overexposed from their perspective uh, to U.S. securities. You know, we saw Russia essentially exit uh, the U.S. dollar as a reserve currency back in 2018. Uh, essentially got out of uh, out of it. China can't for various reasons, and I don't think wants to take that extreme a step, but I do think they are looking 
uh, from their kind of sovereign holdings to diversify their holdings and not be, from their perspective, overexposed. Yeah, I've got to the two US. more two more questions. And I apologize if I cut you off on this on the first one because I want to be quick. But we've seen China invest in things like buildings that don't get occupied, Evergrande that they have to bail out, and there's political reasons to invest in that. But obviously, long term is not healthy in terms of their domestic investments. Have you, have you seen any good analysis of what kind of return China earns on their domestic investments? So, sort of how competitive are the how to what degree are they investing in growth versus staving off short-term political problems? Look, I, I think it's really um, important that we not over, as I think uh, Mr. William Willem said a couple of minutes ago, it's important we not overestimate the strength of China. It is a fierce competitor. It is not, I think, as you said, 10 feet tall. And I think we have to be clear-eyed about their own domestic weaknesses and the fact they don't have an indefinitely bright future. In, in fact, they got a bunch of bleak things uh, in their, um, in their uh, economic future. For the last couple of years, they've been propping up their economy domestically by subsidizing a real estate boom, by subsidizing manufacturing. At some point, that gets harder and harder for them to do. And I think that's why you're seeing this long-term uh, downward trend in growth. Now, this year, it probably will come up. They're coming out of COVID. There'll be a rebound. But they're not getting back to the 7 8% growth rates that they had for many years so, in the past. So we're, we're tight on time, so I may just have to just end with a statement here. But the, the one exception to all that is that Chinese investments in U.S. equities have gone up, even as their investments in debt have gone down. And that is a broad sectoral trend um, from foreign investments in the U.S. In, in 2010, Total foreign investments in U.S. equities uh, was, uh, let's see what I got here, um, $2.8 trillion. That was 26% of total investments in U.S. debt, in U.S. equities, securities, I'm sorry. In 2021, more than half of foreign investments in the United States were in equities. And, and I mention that because if, if your goal as a member of Congress was to transfer wealth from U.S. taxpayers to foreigners, Ten years ago, the way to do that was to raise interest rates. Gentleman's time has expired. Today, the way to do that is to cut corporate tax rates. Yield back. Gentleman's time has expired, and now we recognize the distinguished chairman of the Housing and Insurance Subcommittee, Mr. Davidson, for five minutes. Uh, I thank you. Thank you our, our, to our witnesses. I appreciate this hearing and uh, the importance of it. I mean, China is a is a, an important strategic rival. Uh, frankly, I would like to keep them uh, economic rivals and. Uh, as a former military guy, I didn't think we would ever visit to China in friendly terms and conditions, and I hope that we can keep it uh, friendly competition. Uh, we're concerned about recent events and kind of what is that signal for the relationship. Uh, but as we look at how has China risen, I mean, part of it was under Deng Xiaoping, China broke from what had failed. Uh, you know, cultural revolution, Mao's various forms of uh, Marxist ideology uh, that produced a communist state that was not working. And under Deng Xiaoping, he kind of said, well, we'll have communism with Chinese principles, uh, which is really state-controlled capitalism. Uh, and, and on balance, it's worked pretty well for the Chinese people. But part of that's come at the expense of the American people. You know, I'm happy for the average Chinese person uh, and we certainly understand why they want a better future for themselves and for their kids. Uh, but we should want the same for our families. And in recent history, we've seen uh, this recent generation say that they're not confident that their kids are going to have a better future than they are. That's the first time in American history that's been true. And why is that? Part of it is policy decisions that have overwhelmingly benefited the Chinese Communist Party and uh, the influence of China. So as we talk about uh, the role of financial services in that, in 2019, China was designated as a currency manipulator. So, uh, you know, would one of you care to highlight briefly for the, you know, people watching at home, uh, the dozens or so, uh, you know, how does China control their exchange rate with the United States? Mr. Lorber? Uh, I'm, I'm not a, a, a macroeconomist, so I can't really speak to that in, a, in an effective way. I apologize. That's okay. Well, it trades in, a, in about a 2% band. The U.S. dollar is one of the currencies that are in there, and it's a peg. So they set it at an artificial rate. So when they decide that they're not getting enough uh, 
you know, exports out of China into America, or uh, in particular, they'll change the peg to the U.S. dollar. So that makes everything cheaper. So in 2019, when they did that, they moved it by about 16.8%. And for that, the Secretary of the Treasury rightly designated them a currency manipulator. Uh, that is able to overcome, uh, you know, all sorts of things. Tariffs at the time, fine, we'll just manipulate our currency and make everything different. Um, the other thing that I'm interested in talking about in this space is, is, is kind of the link to the Belt and Road. Of course, it creates big trade consequences, and that creates consequences on the flow of cash, the balance of payments. Uh, but when you look at the role of the International Monetary Fund in, uh, in liquidity globally, uh, special drawing rights are one of those things. It's not really money, uh, but it represents a, a, an asset. And the mix was recently changed. It went from about 10% RMB to um, almost 13% RMB. And so the bill that I've got, uh, HR 510, the Chinese Currency Accountability Act, uh, requires the Secretary of Treasury to oppose an increase in the weight of China's RMB in the basket of currencies um, that make up the IMS special drawing rights unless China meets uh, certain international standards. And we know China doesn't meet them. They promised to be part of the WT World Trade Organization, that they would be a market economy. They said that as part of being a market economy, they wouldn't do things like manipulate their currency. So, uh, you know, Mr. Wellams, uh, could you please talk about those dynamics, particularly with the relation to the IMF? Sure. Uh, let me first say, I think you've put your finger on a, on a really important issue. And from a broad standpoint, we want to promote the supremacy of the U.S. dollar, uh, and we should be concerned about China trying to put forward the RMB uh, as an alternative to that, including in the IMF. And so I, I would want to work with you on, on, on the specifics of the bill. I think the concept is correct, and we should do what we can to prevent them from increasing uh, the role of the RMB. One of the problems with the IMF that we often run into is our ability to unilaterally achieve things as opposed to having to work and develop broader coalitions. So I would want to think about whether the criteria are the right criteria to build that coalition of allies to get the job done. Thank you, and my time's expired, I yield. Gentleman's time's expired. We'll now recognize the gentleman from New Jersey, Mr. Gottheimer, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and congratulations again on your new role. Uh, the Chinese Communist Party, or CCP, embodies one of the most significant international threats the United States has faced in recent decades. Among other strategies, the authoritarian CCP hopes to dominate the global economy, as you know, through thefts of intellectual property, investments in foreign economies through their Belt and Roads Initiative, and through the promotion of alternative financial networks that undermine the U.S. dollar's role in the global economy. As a Congress, we wrote strong bipartisan legislation to take on China, and I'm confident that we can do it again here in the 118th Congress. Mr. Harrell and Mr. Lorber, I guess I'll start with Mr. Harrell. The Bipartisan Infrastructure Bill and the Chips and Science Act directly support our strategic competition with China by investing in our supply chains, our workforce, and emerging technologies. In your opinion, what should a CHIPS 2.0 bill look like? What are the best next steps for us to be working on now? Mr. Harrell? Um, so thank you very much, and um, I 100% agree with you that the um, bills that Congress passed over the last several, of year, uh, several years to foster investments in chips, in scientific innovation, uh, in clean energy technology and in infrastructure generally, absolutely essential uh, to our um, uh, to our success. I would um, break future investments into two pieces. One is a technology piece, and one is a supply chain resilience piece. On the technology piece, and I think there really is a lot that is going on there, not just with chips, but with the and science part of that bill and the NSF. Uh, sort of reform agenda uh, there. I think there's a lot going on there, but I do think we need to be focused at a research perspective in um, quantum and in biotechnology. These, I think, are foundational that we need to do. On the supply chain resilience piece, we've done a lot on chips. Uh, we've actually been doing a fair amount on critical minerals. It's gonna take years for that to bear fruit, um, but there is a lot going on critical minerals, and we're doing a lot on clean technology. I think pharmaceuticals, uh, and pharmaceutical ingredients, not necessarily high-end things. We have supply chain vulnerabilities there. I also think there are a set of supply chain vulnerabilities that we don't know we have, 
And I think that the um, administration should undertake a kind of comprehensive review of what we're importing and supply chain vulnerabilities to get ahead of the things we don't know that we don't know. Very helpful, I appreciate that. I mean, the CCP has made it clear that it will leverage technology to breach U.S. institutions and steal our intellectual property, collect data on our citizens, and access the systems that control our critical infrastructure. I worked at a large technology company before I was in Congress. It was no secret that China was stealing our work all the time. I guess, Mr. Lorber, if I can ask you, if this is appropriate, what can we do to better protect our intellectual property from cybercrime and the course of tactics the CCP is using to steal from companies operating in China? Thanks. It, it's a great question. If the objective is, I think, rightly to protect uh, U.S. data, uh, there are multiple steps you can take, both uh, to, to borrow one of uh, Mr. Williams' ideas sort of on the offensive and the defensive side. Certainly on the offensive side, uh, I do think that if that's your goal, you know, targeted economic sanctions to focus on specific entities that have, you know, been uh, identified as stealing U.S. Uh, intellectual property makes sense, and to date, I think there's authority that was recently passed on the books to be able to do that, though I don't know if there's actually any designations that have taken place. Uh, and then on the defensive side, um, certainly, you know, the hardening of, of U.S. governmental systems, but also, you know, proper incentive structure to make sure that, that U.S. private sector is also, you know, properly incentivized to harden their systems as well. I think that's right, and I, I appreciate that. It's shifting just a little bit. Um, uh, the subject that I'm very concerned about, of course, during the pandemic, we had a lot of fake N95 masks with fake FDA approval labels. We all read about adulterated diabetes treatments and the seizures of fentanyl-laced pills that have been traced back to China. And I'm concerned we're not doing enough to crack down and sustain efforts from foreign actors to flood our markets with counterfeit and adulterated medical products. Mr. Harrell, if I can ask you, do you think it makes sense to increase collaboration between the Office of Foreign Assets Control and the FDA to crack down and place sanctions on foreign producers of counterfeit and adulterated medical products? I think there are a number of tools we can use to go after um, uh, to go after counterfeit uh, product imports. I think that where there is a, sort of a nexus to organized crime, there are existing sanctions authorities that can be used to target uh, sort of organized criminal counterfeiting, and I think we should be looking to do that. I also think, obviously, there are things we can do with CBP and with other tools that we have to crack down on um, uh, on on imports of counterfeits. May I make one point on the data uh, issue? Please. There are many things we need to do to protect our um, our data uh, security. One of them has to be a comprehensive national data privacy law, because if all the data is getting collected and aggregated, the Chinese are going to get at it. They got lots of ways to get at it. So we got to actually start with a data security law. Thank you. I yield back. Thank you. Um, we're glad you're before the committee that actually does have a data security law for financial firms, which we intend to update. Thank you. Uh, hopefully we can have you back for that, too. Uh, with that, uh, the gentleman from Tennessee is recognized for five minutes, Mr. Rose. Thank you, Chairman McHenry and Ranking Member Waters for holding this hearing, and I thank you to our witnesses uh, for taking time to be here with us today. I want to dive right in. About 1.7 trillion in securities of China-based issuers are listed on exchanges in the United States. Mr. Willems, um, as China continues to bolster its efforts to compete with the U.S. for capital, do you think U.S. investors have adequate information to understand their exposure to Chinese capital markets and the risks associated with them? So let me first say that I don't think inherently we don't want any Chinese companies listed on U.S. exchanges. As long as they play by the rules, um, it's good for us because it bolsters the uh, importance of our markets. That said, I don't think uh, U.S. citizens generally understand uh, what they're getting into with some of those investments, and more transparency could be helpful. So some, some managers offer single country funds that only invest in Chinese-related issuers. Among the risk listed in these funds, or these types of funds, are more frequent trading suspensions and government intervention, currency exchange rate fluctuations or blockages, price volatility, and cons uh, considerable degrees of social, legal, regulatory, political, and economic uncertainty. Mr. Williams, are you concerned about the risks associated with offering an investment product with that much exposure to China? So I, I do think that having disclosure about that is important so investors can make the decision. So, and I want to open this up to the rest of the panel. Would it make sense to require all funds, including broader international and regional funds, to disclose and aggregate their exposure to Chinese-related risks and investments? Anybody that wants to speak up? Start with you, Mr. Willems, since I've already. 
I, I mean, I think in concept having transparency is important. In terms of the specifics of what you're proposing, I think we'd I want to think about that. Anyone else care to remark? Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll echo Mr. Williams' comment. I, I do think transparency is very important, but I think there's obviously a balance between wanting to provide for that transparency and not creating a regime where there's overly onerous uh, disclosure requirements as well. So, so and, and I think about my own uh, posture as an investor, but, I, but so I'll ask a question this way to kind of press this further. Do current disclosure regimes adequately alert U.S. retail investors and retirees to their Chinese exposure? Yes or no? We'll start over here. Yes, no. I think based on the response you're getting, it's a question that needs to be, needs to be addressed. It's certainly a... I, as an investor, I, I think the answer is no. I, I mean, I've, I have been pressing, pressing my own uh, investment advisor about that. And, and so then what can or should be done to improve the level of visibility that individual investors, U.S. investors, have to the exposure that they have to China that they may or may not be aware of? Anyone have any, any thoughts? I, you know, I, I think I've already offered the, the idea of greater transparency. How you do that is important, and I think that is a subject that we should you know, delve into um, further. All right, thank you. Well, I think it is insightful. I want to shift gears in the remaining minute and a half here. Mr. Fetto, if a foreign investor takes control of a U.S. business in the agricultural sector, does CFIUS have the authority to review uh, that deal? It certainly does. And if a foreign investor were to take a non-controlling stake in an agricultural business, but gain influence over critical technologies or critical infrastructure as specified in rulemaking, would CFIUS have the authority to review that deal? I imagine so, I th based on what you've described, yes. And so when CFIUS reviews agricultural-related transactions, does CFIUS involve the U.S. Department of Agriculture in those reviews? Yes, sir, it does. I mentioned earlier that, that they have the latitude under the law to bring in other cabinet member officials in their departments to provide the subject matter expertise to tackle the, the, uh, the national security analysis. And they do that frequently with HHS and NASA and, and the Agricultural Department. And do you think that CFIUS has adequate motivation to uh, aggressively review those kinds of transactions? Uh, they absolutely do, and uh, you know, that's part of the role of uh, congressional oversight to make sure that they're, they're adequately focused on those issues. I would caution, I, I'm not entirely sold on the idea of making the Agriculture uh, Department a permanent voting member of the committee. All right. Thank you. I appreciate your uh, questions. I yield back. The chair now recognizes the gentlelady, Ms. Garcia, for five minutes for questions. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you to all the witnesses today. And I, too, want to associate my remarks of the ranking member and add my additional remarks as follows. I am concerned by the rhetoric that I'm hearing today. While I take the economic threat that China may pose very, very seriously, I worry that the Republican majority is not committed to taking some essential steps to combat this issue. The Republicans are set on decreasing the federal budget, but it appears to me that significant investments might be necessary, particularly in the global south, to ensure that China's presence does not grow stronger. I would like to begin by focusing on China's strong financial presence in Latin America. As a representative from Texas, this issue is too close to home, literally. China has a large financial presence in Venezuela, Ecuador, Brazil, and many other Latin American nations. And I worry about the impact it has on U.S. influence and trade relations, particularly as it impacts, impacts us in, in the Texas region. Mr. Harold, can you please speak about China's presence in Latin America, and can you explain what the United States can do to offer alternative to Chinese investments in particular in the region? 
We've definitely seen an increase in um, China's uh, economic presence in Latin America over the last decade. Sort of recent events disclose uh, perhaps also an increase in surveillance presence and other kinds of uh, presence down there um, as well. Um, part of the reason for that increased presence is, is frankly sort of uh, basic economics. China's buying a lot of commodities. Latin America exports a lot of commodities. You're going to see the trade uh, the trade ties uh, increase there. There is also obviously a strategic overlay that China is taking to this, where they are deliberately investing in Latin America as a region that is near to the U.S., but frankly a swing region where our diplomatic relationships have not always been the warmest and our economic ties have not always been the strongest. So you see them doing that with Ecuador, you see that doing them uh, doing it with uh, Venezuela uh, and places mm -hmm. like that. I think what we need to do to respond is to A, um, relentlessly highlight the downsides and costs of this kind of low quality, high debt, high default kind of Chinese investment we're seeing down there, and then B, be forward in the region ourselves. We have to get DFC down there. We have to get XM down there. We have to make the America's Partnership for Economic Prosperity a real thing. Uh, we have to get USAID uh, active down there. So it is both highlighting the costs and the challenges of what China is doing down there, while also offering concrete and tangible alternatives uh, ourselves. Right, because we're seeing that they're, they're lending, they're investing, they're building, they're developing. I mean, they're doing, in my view, a lot of things that we as a good neighbor in the Western Hemisphere should be doing with the Americas. And we have failed to do not only, frankly, for a very really long time. Uh, and, it, and it worries me uh, that, that China will get a better strategic you know, position uh, to not only threaten, threaten us economically, but strategically in terms of our, of our security. Uh, so what, what else can we do to make sure uh, that the United States maintains good relations with the Americas. So, so I, I laid out a couple um, a couple of ideas. I also think um, having you know, frankly, having uh, continued strong cultural exchange programs often get overlooked in these discussions. But you know, as a former diplomat at the State Department, who then spent a number of years at the White House, the number of times we were able to build a relationship with whether it was a European official or an Argentinian official or an Indonesian official, because that person had come here for school, because that person had family here, it is, those are sort of the soft power kind of things that can really pay off over time in terms of deepening relationships. Right, because otherwise then China just continues to use these countries for their own political purposes, but also to build in, in what I consider the anti-USA sentiment. Uh, and it doesn't help, again, to listen to some of the rhetoric of beating up on everything south of the border. Uh, rather than criticizing, we should be helping and being true partners and, and true neighbors. So thank you for that. I yield back. Thank you very much. The chair now recognizes the gentleman, Mr. Norman, for five minutes for questions. I want to thank each of you for taking your time to come today and testify. Each of you have a critical role in, I guess, highlighting the problems we've got with China. And uh, Ms. Fedor, you, you made the analogy about the 355,000 acres as it relates to the total U.S. The problem that I see is it's not the volume, it's where they're buying it. South Carolina, uh, we've, got, we've got Duke Energy, we've got Shaw Air Force Base, they are buying property in downtown areas strategically in relationship to where our, um, where our headquarters are. So that's the problem we've got with them. Now, I think it was interesting, my other colleagues were asking you, <laughs> Mr. Williams, about the, the balloon. Um, first of all, they, they went immediately to, to President Trump with balloons flying. Well, uh, the, the only way this administration knew the balloon was flying was when a citizen took a picture and, and either he was sleeping or whoever didn't notify him, if they were allowed to go in this country eight days before they shot him down, which is a tragedy for this country. It's a security risk for this country. And not to just mention what they're doing in plants. In my state, they're going in plants and 
they're buying, they're going through third parties on buying the property, but they're going in, uh, sending Americans in to buy patents on different military, um, uh, military um, things that others don't make and stealing the patents. So they're a huge threat. So thank you all for what you're doing. Uh, and to highlight this, this isn't political. This is un-American, particularly with what this administration is, is letting happen. Now, as it relates, and this goes back to what Mr. Rose was saying, you know, <clears throat> the PCAOB, you know, has been tasked with scrutinizing the, the China, the U.S. Ch companies traded in U.S. exchange, the Chinese companies, and um, you know, and after three years, if they if they fail to provide the audits, then um, they're taken off the exchange. Now, do you believe the the PCAOB has successfully implementing this and are putting the safeguards in place so that the, those uh, individuals that are putting their trust in companies that they know little about, uh, is this getting the job done or is this something else we need to be doing to, to put some teeth into this? Because this is, uh, this is again, like the Security breach is a tragedy, and I'll let anybody answer that wants to. I can start and, and just say I think at this point we should take the PCAOB's word for it that they um, were able to access Chinese papers, Chinese audit papers in December. And my understanding on that was that the checks that they did were random, the Chinese didn't know in advance, and that they were given access. Now I think you're right to wonder, was this a one-time thing where China wanted to avoid mass delistings or is this actually China finally saying we're going to open up and be in, uh, play by the rules that everyone else has to follow? And so I think Congress's role is to conduct rigorous oversight over this, make sure that the PCAOB is continuing to check and that China, China is continuing to provide access. Anybody else want to comment on that? Um, what about the Foreign Investment Risk Review Modernization Act, which um, has expanded to the Committee on the Foreign Ex uh, Investment of the United States. Um, are they taking, are they using their tools at their disposal to put teeth in their, what they can do at the proper time? Sir, um, I'm probably the right person to answer that, but, yes, sir. but what, uh, can you clarify the question? The role of the Foreign Investment Risk uh, Firma, are they doing everything they can, they've been tasked with, in your opinion, in your expertise, uh, to monitor real estate transactions and... and, and I, I believe so. I don't have any visibility internally. I, I implemented the law and we were, we were very diligent about how we scoped real estate jurisdiction per the direction of the statute, per firma. And um, re remember that the jurisdiction that the committee was given with respect to real estate was, was a voluntary disclosure. So right. there's not a required filing the committee still has the power to bring something in if it, if it needs to or it's alerted to a national security risk that warrants, warrants review. Frequently, a purchase uh, relates to a U.S. business and it falls into another part of jurisdiction. So uh, real estate may not always be leveraged, but it may not need to. Thank you so much. The chair now recognizes the gentleman from North Carolina, Mr. Nichols, for five minutes for questions. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, thank you to our witnesses for being here with us today. This is certainly going to be a memorable uh, committee hearing for me, not necessarily because of the subject, as much as it's my first committee hearing as a member of Congress, and you'll be the first witnesses that, that I get to question. So thank you again for being here today. Um, Mr. Harrell, you said in your testimony that to address the economic risks uh, we face from China, we must expand our cooperation with friends. Mr. Williams, you said in your testimony that to reduce supply chain reliance on China, we should implement proactive trade policies with third countries. I agree with both of you. The U.S. should establish and reinforce meaningful trade relationships with other partners in the Indo-Pacific region. The U.S. should also form and strengthen partnerships in law enforcement and regulatory spaces on issues central to this committee, like counter-trafficking, countering trafficking, improving transparency, and securing markets. So Mr. Harrell, Mr. Williams, uh, how can the U.S. leverage the tools that are at our disposal, like the World Bank, IMF, Export-Import Bank, to help America's friends better compete against China and their CCP-backed economy? 
So we're happy to start. And I think this is actually a really good um, segue from the questions Ms. Garcia was asking, which was about uh, Latin America. And, and I thought Mr. Harrell answered very well, but one area I would have elaborated further on that you've touched on is, is trade agreements. And if we want to build those relationships, if we want to build those partnerships, we need to have trade agreements. And the reason that's important for supply chains is China's going around the world. They're cutting trade agreements where they're cutting tariffs with other countries. That makes it easier for them to facilitate trade between them. We aren't doing the same thing, and so we are at a cost disadvantage when, we are, when companies are making decisions about supply chains. And that's why we need market access trade agreements. Now, building on that, the other tools uh, that Mr. Harrell touched on that I would elaborate on again are the Development Finance Corporation. <clears throat> and one of the things I recommend is employing a program at DFC similar to CTEP, the China Transformational Export Program at XM, which will allow DFC to cut through red tape, be more strategic in working with our partners and allies. On XM, uh, one thing that we haven't gotten to, into yet, but I think is worth considering, is do we want XM to be able to take more risk in certain circumstances? XM has something called the default cap, which is about 2% is the maximum amount of defaults that they're allowed to have, or they totally lose their authority to make investments. And I think we need to look at that and say, look, if we're gonna provide an alternative to China, we need to take a little more risk. And it may be a controversial policy, but I think it's worth looking at if we're serious about providing a real alternative. I think um, another area that we could look at is better integrating our uh, development uh, tools with our trade tools, right? Because if you are a company that is, say, looking to get out of China to do light manufacturing and you're looking at Latin America, what do you need, you know, to put a, fa uh, a sort of a facility down the Caribbean or in uh, somewhere in, in, in Central America or in Mexico? You need, um, you know, local skilled labor, right? You need a bunch of things on the ground. You need transport and physical infrastructure for the goods you're manufacturing, and then you need access to the United States so you can actually sell it here in your market. And I think we don't currently do a good job of kind of integrating those three tools, and I think we could do a better job of saying if we want to see supply chain friend shoring, how are we going to use our foreign assistance, our development finance, these other kind of tools to create the enabling environment for that to happen as we pursue these kind of more trade initiatives, uh, whether it's APAP or IPAP or other, other things like that. Th thank you very much, and I, I yield back. Thank you very much. The chair now recognizes himself for five minutes. Mr. Willems, today we've had a lot of conversation focused on China about their malicious actions. We've heard references to invasions of our airspace most recently. We've seen them engage in unfair trade practices. You were just engaged in a conversation there with Mr. Nickel, I think appropriately so, about how we go on offense. I think we've seen a real shift in administrations, from a shift in administration around the Trump administration with engagement in countries looking for areas where the U.S. can export, in particular, I'm thinking from Wisconsin's perspective, agricultural goods. Think about opportunities we may have in countries like Kenya, countries like the United Kingdom, maybe the country of Laos, et cetera. Can you tell me where we could go on offense? It's a fantastic question. And uh, you mentioned two already. So the Trump administration had started FTA negotiations with both the UK and Kenya, which have been discontinued by this administration. And I think it's in Congress's interest to push them uh, to get back in the game with those two countries. The other two places I would look uh, are Taiwan, where there is significant interest in linking our high-tech supply chains with Taiwan and creating more market access for farmers, including those from Wisconsin, which I know we both hold near and dear to our heart. Uh, and then I'd look at the, uh, I'd look at the TPP. And uh, you know, I was part of an administration that pulled out of the TPP, but that was, I think, a reflection of the fact that there were problems with the agreement, but the answer is not to stay out of it. The answer is to renegotiate it. And I would look at this question, can we do to TPP what we did to NAFTA? Can we take an agreement that wasn't working for us, renegotiate it, make it work for the United States? And I'll remind everyone here, I'm sure there's a lot of members here who voted for USMCA. That got the strongest bipartisan support of any trade agreement in years. And I think we can do the same thing uh, with the TPP. And I think that'll benefit Wisconsin farmers. Thank you very much. And thank you for your comments. Let me shift gears to another area that I have significant concern on. This is our multi multilateral uh, development banks like the World Bank still providing billions of dollars in new loans to China. And at the same time, China is providing extensive funding 
to developing countries around the world through its Belts and Road Initiative. Question to you, should China continue to receive funds from these development banks, and how should we approach this strategically? So the answer is no, um, and, and I will agree with you. It's absurd, right? China is the world's largest bilateral lender, yet at the same time, they are one of the top five recipients of World Bank loans. That is an inconsistency that should not be allowed to stand. Now, the challenge we have, the World Bank and the IMF and all these institutions, is we're just one member. We have a lot of votes, but we don't have all the votes. We can't wave a magic wand. So I really think what you want to do is think about how to put together a comprehensive reform package uh, with other allies that can change that behavior while also you know, thinking about other things that will um, get other countries to come on board. If this just becomes US versus China, I think that that's difficult, but if we can paint China as an international outlier and build a broader coalition, I think we have a chance for success. I, I think that's right. I think it's working with our allies to actually counter the actions that China's engaged in, and in particular as it relates to unfair trade practices, but we also see it through their loan programs, such as the, the Rosenbelts Initiative, which is a real risk to many developing countries around the world. I want to go back to what Mr. Barr was speaking with you about earlier, in particular CMIC uh, companies and the firms associated with China's military. I think we can all agree that Americans should not be financing these businesses, uh, which have a clear role in China's human rights abuses. Can you give a little more explanation as to how we close these gaps? Sure. So right now there have been two executive orders that were issued, one by the Trump administration and then a subsequent one by the Biden administration. And what they do is they say that the US government should identify companies that are affiliated with China's military and then put prohibitions on investment. The problem with them and the gaps that are there is that those prohibitions only apply to publicly traded securities. It does not apply to venture capital, private equity, debt, other kinds of financing. And so I think Congress can step in, fill that gap. The other gap is that it, is, um, it only names two sectors within China. It's the technology surveillance sector and the defense material sector. And I think that there are probably other Chinese companies that pose a national security threat outside of those sectors that we need to look at. So that's the second gap I would look at filling. Thank you very much. I think we covered a lot here today. I think we looked at the opportunity to go on offense, which I think is absolutely essential. I think we need to return to the previous administration's policies on that rather than some of the policies we're seeing coming out of this administration. I think it's important we look at development banks like the World Bank, and in particular that we are not finding the United States of America in a position supporting the military of China. I yield back. The chair now recognizes, I pa I'll pause. Ms. Garcia is recognized. Yes, Mr. Chairman, I wanted to ask for unanimous consent to enter a document for the record, China's engagement in Latin America views from the region um, of, from the United States Institute of Peace. So ordered. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The chair now recognizes the gentlewoman from Michigan, Ms. Tlaib, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'd like to focus on the ways that foreign agalarks agilar um, invest can invest in US-based assets to hide or launder illicit funds. And, you know, I know the vast majority, and I've, you know, of, I think, you know, majority of foreign nationals investing in the US are legitimate. And there's no national concern whatsoever in that regard. But however, we know that there's been an incredibly, I think, easy way to establish anonymous trusts, uh, shell companies in the United States, which has made it easier for sanctioned citizens, and we saw it recently actually, um, and entities to hide their assets in the United States. I know both the administration, the current one and the previous one, has supported, um, and I'm sure you're familiar with the Corporate Transparency Act of 2020, which is intended to prevent that kind of abuse of you know, these shell companies uh, like the one used to hide ownership and control of US-based real estate purchases, uh, that are sanctioned by, you know, folks that are sanctioned Iranian, Iranian, uh, Chinese uh, nationals, Russian nationals, uh, um, a number of folks, again, they're sanctioned. So it's something for the whole witness panel here. I mean, how important is it for the U.S. and allied nations to adopt transparency measures like beneficial ownership registries to prevent bad actors from abusing our open financial systems? because it is really about those resources and the money, as you all know. Um, so I can start with whoever would like to begin. I think, Eric, you had your... Yeah, 
I, I'm up. happy to take this one. I appreciate yeah. the question. Um, the, the short answer is uh, it's incredibly important. I mean, you've seen even recently in publicly announced actions um, instances where sanctioned Russian oligarchs, for example, were able to park billions of dollars in trusts that were registered uh, in Delaware for a period of, uh, I think, five or six years. So the Corporate Transparency Act and the related legislation, I think, you know, uh, were great work done by, by this Congress are important steps. Um, you know, Eric, for my residents, explain like why, because this is, you know, this is the danger that I think is not understanding. It's like, oh yeah, they're just moving money for benefit of their own, but it's actually a huge concern because this is how they can fund. Sure, yeah, exactly. Yeah. So for example, um, pre-Corporate Transparency Act, um, an individual could go to a state, um, form a corporation, and then not be required to submit the natural persons who are the owners or the controllers of that corporation. So in theory, a Russian oligarch could go to a US mm -hmm. state, form a corporation in somebody else's name, there would be no verification component, and they could subsequently funnel money through that shell company into US assets, and it may be very, very difficult to detect. That was the issue that the Corporate Transparency Act at a high level was trying to solve. It's being implemented as we speak, so Treasury is rolling out a series of rules to implement it, but that's the sort of core challenge. Yeah. Anybody else? Mr. Hare? I uh, agree very much with Eric that the Corporate Transparency Act was a huge first step. Uh, obviously something like that, and Treasury Department is in the process of getting IT and rolling out rules to uncover the beneficial owners of millions of companies. That's a big mm -hmm. endeavor, and they need to make sure they have the resources uh, to do it. I do think if Congress um, wants to continue looking at this issue, and I would encourage Congress to do so, uh, looking at um, uh, greater transparency around some of the enablers of corporate mm -hmm. um, uh, corporate secrecy, you know, and the lawyers and the accountants, I think I that's another good area that. to push I, on. I, and then I the other thing I would agree say- because there are firms that are actually helping them do it, correct? Yes. yes. Yeah. The other thing I would say is I think we have to get much more serious about transparency in some of the small tax havens. You know, a few years ago when this Congress was worried about um, the fact that overseas banks were helping wealthy Americans hide their taxes, mm -hmm. there was a very meaningful effort to force banks in Switzerland and the Caymans and places like that to provide tax reporting information to the U.S., there's not really a parallel requirement or serious effort to get you know, places like the BVI and the Caymans to clean up their corporate ownership structures. And I think it's time to look at what could be done there. No, well, thank you. And I just would, you know, for many of my colleagues here, you've, some of, especially my Democratic colleagues have known that I've spoken about um, recently, um, you know, just the impact of seeing somebody like Vincent Chen in our community in Detroit beaten to death after anti-Asian hate uh, um, rhetoric was increasing during that time, and we're seeing that again. So I just hope this committee, we can do this important work um, without fueling that rhetoric, um, being very, I think, thoughtful, uh, so that we can do meaningful work, again, without jeopardizing the, our, our Asian neighbors across the country. Uh, but with that, I yield. Thank you very much. The votes have been called on the House floor. Uh, the chair anticipates recognizing one more member before we stand in recess until the following uh, votes. Uh, the chair now recognizes uh, the gentleman from South Carolina, Mr. Timmons, for five minutes for questions. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. You know, this hearing has been long overdue. I think we can all agree that China is a problem and that we need to figure out uh, a solution utilizing all of our allies um, this is not something that we can take on on our own. But I will say that I've been pleased with a lot of the bipartisan agreement on a number of things today. Um, one of them is that defaulting on our federal debt is bad. And I think we all agree that we're not going to default. The question is, what steps do we take to regain some fiscal solvency? Uh, as the speaker says, if your kid runs up the credit card, you do pay it off, but you don't let him do it again. Um, we have spent $7 trillion with the excuse of COVID, and that has increased um, our debt. But not only has it increased our debt, it has driven inflation, which is going to have long-term damage uh, to our debt as well. So we have to take steps uh, to address that and to regain our fiscal solvency. It is a national security issue. It is perhaps the most preeminent national security issue. So I am hopeful that we uh, addressed our debt ceiling responsibly, reasonably, and sensibly, and I'm confident that we're gonna find our path forward. So again, 
there's some bipartisan agreement. We're not going to default. Um, another thing that I was actually surprised uh, with some bipartisan agreement was that uh, the Biden administration handled the balloon poorly. Um, I think the entire world was shocked as we have talked about a balloon for the last four days. And the disagreement um, has been largely partisan, but one of my colleagues across the aisle said, uh, that's why I was concerned, deeply concerned by this balloon business and why the president allowed this balloon to go all over our country and not shoot it down. Uh, he did caveat it. I love the president, I support him, but this move not to blow down the balloon sends a powerful message to both enemies and friends because it's all about data, intelligence, and, uh, and China got us on this one. So uh, we agree, China got us on this one. And the question is, what are we going to do to get China to reform their behavior and compete in the global economy and be good actors in the global economy? That's the question. And um, I'm gonna go to an issue that I think is a good case study on how to do that, and that's with 5G. Um, just a few years ago, uh, Huawei, using the Belt and Road Initiative, was giving away next generation uh, wireless uh, infrastructure. They were going to our allies all over the world. And um, the FBI said, well, hold on now. That's not a good idea. And we didn't really want to explain why, but ultimately we did. And all of our allies now have either banned Huawei, stopped purchasing from Huawei, or uh, required 5G to be secure. Um, we have utilized uh, the IMF and the World Bank um, through a bill that I sponsored two years ago that was put in NDA to make it um, not possible for anyone to use the World Bank and IMF if they're using, uh, and it doesn't even address China. It just says if you are investing in unsecure 5G, you're not eligible for uh, IMF or World Bank. So I think that's a great example of a way that we can use our allies abroad to facilitate uh, behavior change from China. Um, Huawei has since taken steps to show that they are secure. They have not done a very good job. People do not believe them yet, but they're trying. They're trying to change their behavior. And I guess, uh, Mr. Williams, I'd just like to say, is, is that the type of situation where we can reform China's behavior? Because again, China, I do, not, I do not want them to be our enemy. I want them to be an equitable partner in the global economy and they have to play by the rules. So is this a good example of how we can accomplish that? I think it's a good example to talk about the importance of a comprehensive approach. Because if you think about the way that we handled Huawei, it was the legislation that you talked about, but we also had export controls, we had investment restrictions, and then now through the XM Bank, we are trying to provide 5G alternatives. And I think that shows what you need to do to successfully deal with China threats. You need to crack down, but then you also need to get on the offense and provide another alternative. And that's an approach I think we should apply to other areas as well. Absolutely, thank you. I, I just, I'm very concerned about our uh, government's inability to adapt to the challenges that we're facing. And uh, China has the ability to do whatever they want, whenever they want, and that is an advantage. But um, the control they have over their people is a disadvantage, uh, freedom and uh, the American uh, dream is what makes this country so great, and um, I just hope that we can tackle this in a bipartisan manner going forward. And with that, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, as noted previously, uh, votes have been called, two votes in total. Uh, members are encouraged to return expeditiously following the second vote. Uh, until then, this committee stands in recess. I thank the panel for uh, sticking with us. Um, I'll now recognize the gentleman from New York, Mr. Torres, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I never thought this moment would come. So. Uh, according to an opinion piece by Rushir Sharma in the Financial Times, if the United States economy were to grow at an average of 1.5% annually and China's economy at an average of 2.5% annually, China would not overtake the United States until 2060. But even the assumption of a 2.5% growth rate seems increasingly questionable. As you know, China is confronting a perfect storm, a debt crisis, a demographic crisis, and a declining productivity crisis. And so I have a historical question for each of the panelists. Has there ever been a country in history that has grown at 2.5% annually in the face of productivity decline, population decline, and a prohibitive debt burden? And I'll start with Mr. Asu, and we'll go down the row. Yeah. Uh, Easy question. I'm not aware of one. OK. Nor am I, sir. Not to my knowledge. 
Seems unlikely. Not aware. So America's greatest enemy is not the CCP. America's greatest enemy is itself. It's the dysfunction of our politics. You know, there may be severe structural limits on China's ability to grow the Chinese economy, but there are no limits to America's ability to sabotage the American economy. Who needs the CCP when you have the self-sabotage of debt limit brinksmanship here in Washington, D.C.? The full faith and credit of the United States and the status of the dollar as the world's reserve currency form the foundation for American leadership in the world, the very American leadership that the Chinese Communist Party is intent on overturning. And so I have a simple yes or no question. If the federal government were to breach the debt limit beyond the X date, would damaging the full faith and credit of the United States undermine the competitive position of the United States relative to the CCP? And we'll start with Mr. Ashu. Yes. Yes. I think that's likely. Agree. Yes. As you know, more than six years ago, we saw Russia weaponized social media platforms like Facebook and Twitter to interfere with the 2016 election and otherwise conduct influence operations against the United States. The CCP has infinitely more influence over TikTok than Russia ever did over Facebook and Instagram. TikTok is or could easily metastasize into a Trojan horse for a CCP influence operation against the United States. Uh, a question to each of you, do you think TikTok should be banned from the United States? I really can't answer it. We did look at this when I was in government, uh, and there's clearly issues there, but the what to do about it. An outright ban may not be the answer, but clearly- Are you aware that the parent company of TikTok has a CCP committee? Most Chinese companies have some sort of Chinese government influence. And is that cause for alarm? Of course it is, absolutely. Right. I, and I, and let, as let you know- clear. Well, I, I yeah. can't give you an, a yes, no, because I yeah. want the solution to fit the problem, and I don't have enough information. Well, let me phrase the question differently. Um, you know, TikTok is not only a social media platform, it has become a leading news source for the next generation of Americans, our most impressionable minds. Is it in the strategic interest of the United States to have the CCP shape the information environment of the United States? So, again, sir, this is an important issue. We did look at it when I was in government. Finding the right answer in a way that didn't run afoul of concerns such as First Amendment and other things that came up. Uh, it does, just because it didn't work the first time doesn't mean we don't need an answer here. We do. I just don't know what it is, and I'm out of government, so I, unfortunately Mr. not. Mr. Federal, well, should we ban TikTok? So, so I and I have nothing against dancing, for the record. So, so I, I worry about the idea of banning, um, because it can become a slippery slope. Also, banning, attempting to ban TikTok failed during the Trump administration with his, um, the president's executive order in August of 2020. I think you're right. The concerns about, about its parent company, uh, the Commerce Department at the time had supporting information uh, related to its attempt to, to um, enforce the ban, that there were 130 CCP um, um, committee members within uh, within the parent company uh, that had been- What was the number? 130. 130 CCP that, members in the parent um, company. And, and, and uh, you know, National Security Advisor O'Brien, the President Trump's National Security Advisor has called it uh, the biggest, uh, uh, the worst own goal uh, in national security and a scandal. I think time is, I just want to quickly get yes or no answers. Mr. Lorber, Mr. Willems, Mr. Harrell. I don't think it lends itself to just a simple yes or no. Okay. There are all sorts of factors. I think we should put in place a broader infrastructure to examine all Chinese apps operating in the United States and make sure that we're protecting against national security threats because I don't think it's just TikTok. Fair enough. Yeah, I agree with uh, Clayton. Great. Thank you. My time has expired. We'll now recognize Mr. Muser, Pennsylvania, for five minutes. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Certainly thank all of our witnesses uh, for all of your time here today. So China is um, characterized in many different ways, as a competitor, a rival, authoritarian, an adversary, and I guess we'll see over the years what it will be characterized by us moving forward. But right now, the CCP, among many things, is accused of, and there is much evidence to support, the regular theft of intellectual property. So recently, FBI director uh, stated 
um, that the uh, Chinese government poses the biggest long-term threat to our economy and national security uh, of the U.S., of course. He described a lawless, stop-at-nothing China government agenda to steal IP. So, Mr. Xu, um, in your judgment, is the Biden administration, are we uh, treating this as seriously as we should be? The issue of IP theft? Yeah. I believe so. I believe it's got, it, it certainly had attention in the prior administration. I haven't seen that wane. The, the challenge is it is a very hard problem to solve because the institutions to deal with it are in the law enforcement realm. And once that IP has been, been purloined, it, it's not like you can just disgorge it. Uh, so it's a very challenging yeah. problem. I was in business for a long time mm -hmm. on an international basis, and I, I, I can appreciate that. But is it something that we understand, our State Department or, or, or others, are regularly commenting on and, and uh, pushing back on and trying to investigate, to your knowledge? I can't speak specifically to a particular yeah. agency. I just, I, I certainly know it was a priority when, okay. when I was regulating. All right, uh, Mr. Mr. Fetto, um, is the Biden administration's assault on our domestic energy industry, the excessive spending that took place over the last several years, which is the primary cause of inflation, higher interest rates, uh, loss of much wealth in the, in the capital markets, uh, along with the uh, raising of uh, b business taxes, which, which has been done, and a lot of talk of raising taxes further, higher uh, in, the, uh, in the near term on, U on U.S. companies. Does this improve our position vis-a-vis -vis China? Um, and does it improve the economic competitiveness of the United States, in your view? I, I don't think it does. Um, I'm <clears throat> probably not the best to, to answer the, 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 with more precision. Uh, if I can just interject on your, your question to Mr. Ashew, I, I do think the FBI, Director Ray, is constantly talking about intellectual property theft and um, uh, the FBI, is, he has said, is opening up an investigation related to espionage and IP theft every 12 hours, and there are over 2,000 investigations. Yeah. So I do think the Justice Department is very <clears throat> focused on that yeah. issue. Uh, Mr. Lauber, do you think the idea of raising our corporate income tax from 21%, which it was lowered to, as we know, which has made us competitive sort of in the middle of the pack of industrialized nations, do you think the idea of raising that will help or hurt our economy vis-a-vis -vis, uh, China's uh, output? I mean, I can't speak specifically to, you know, the raising of the corporate, uh, you know, minimum tax, but I will say that anything that we do that hurts the competitiveness of U.S. companies would, you know, hurt the U.S. national yeah. security vis-a-vis. -vis hurt U.S. made in the U.S. makes it more difficult. Uh, Mr. Williams, your thought on that? Yeah, we should not raise the corporate uh, tax. Right. So um, something else I want to bring up. I have a bill, H.R. 839, uh, known as the China Exchange Rate Transparency Act. Um, and what this bill does is it requires the Treasury to instruct the U.S. Executive Director at the IMF to use the voice and vote of the United States to advocate for increased transparency from the PRC's exchange rate practices, compliance by the PRC in line with what other members of IMF uh, are beholden to, and publication of significant divergences, and stronger consideration by the IMF management um, uh, of the... Uh, and members of the PRC's lack of transparency when evaluating quota and voting shares at the IMF. Would you uh, just comment if you think such a, such a bill makes sense? So I think that this is the right approach. This is an issue the committee should be focused on. I think one thing the committee should explore in greater depth is enforcement mechanisms around these IMF proposals. What are the sources of leverage we can use to actually effectuate these policy changes? And I do think it's helpful to instruct the U.S. representative at the IMF to take these positions, but how are we actually going to get results? So I think I'd like to start with your bill, and then let's build off of it and sure. figure out how to make it actually happen. Great. Anybody else? We only have eight seconds. Get a comment on that? Good. All right. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Thank you. The gentleman's time has expired. The gentlelady from Colorado, Ms. Pedersen, is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you all for being with us today. I know it's, it's been a long one, so thanks for sticking it out. Uh, I know that we're focused on the economic threats of China and uh, something that isn't necessarily part of this, but I think that I want to talk about some economic tools you might recommend on how to address 
the threat that we face from China with the illicit drug market and the increase in fentanyl coming into our uh, into our country. And this hit Colorado hard. Um, this is happening globally. And so while I know that you are not all here today as expert in the illicit movement of drugs and drug proceeds, I just want to know if you have recommendations for economic tools, carrots and sticks that Congress might be able to employ to actually change behavior here. This is something that has killed more uh, people in the United States than all of the world wars combined, the opioid epidemic. It's the third wave, and fentanyl has completely taken over the drug supply chain, and it is incredibly dangerous. So would love to hear your thoughts. Sure, I'm happy to take a first, uh, a first cut at the response. So as I mentioned earlier, we have seen the Treasury Department um, target a number of Chinese individuals and entities for their role in uh, illicit fentanyl production and smuggling. One other um, approach that I have seen as a complement to sanctions authorities uh, that's worked, I think, fairly well over the last few years um, has been guidance and advisories that have been promulgated either by the Financial Crimes Enforcement Network or uh, OFAC or other entities in the U.S. government that highlight what the typologies of illicit funds movements associated with a particular threatening activity could be, in this case, fentanyl trafficking. Something along those lines, if you wanted to think about how you could expand the toolkit beyond simply sanctions and law enforcement as of right now, might be something to consider. I appreciate that. Thank you so much. I yield back my time. The gentlewoman yields back. The gentleman from Wisconsin, Mr. Fitzgerald, is recognized for five minutes. Uh, Mr. Willems, one of our major priorities as a committee is to prevent malign influence by China that would distort our markets. Uh, last Congress, I was fortunate enough to author a bill, uh, Foreign Merger Subsidy Disclosure Act, and uh, it was signed into law by the president. Um, it, it put emphasis, I think, on just disclosure, sunshine, that type of thing. The, the FTC and the Department of Justice, the Antitrust Division, are now required to monitor and take foreign government subsidies into account in the pre-merger notification process. Um, another area where China is attempting to infiltrate our exchange trade funds traded here in the United States as well. Uh, many of these investment vehicles contain Chinese companies involved with China's military as well that uh, has been disclosed. I think there was even some discussion about it today. So, for example, CSSC Holdings Limited, China's largest builder of military ships, is listed in several major investments uh, in, uh, indice indices, including MSCI, MSCI uh, Emerging, F FTSC as well. So there's a number of different corporations that are uh, complicated acronyms uh, as part of this discussion. Uh, the indices contain trillions of dollars of assets under global management. And current law that prohibits US investors from buying or selling securities for companies deemed to support China's military. However, parent companies or subsidiaries of listed companies can still be found in these indices. Uh, why is it that the parent and subsidiaries of listed companies can circumvent this ban? We still don't have a full answer on. Um, one of the other principles I hope we keep in mind is that as we look at ways to counter China is to in ensure that these policies do not wink at the dominance of the US dollar here and abroad. Uh, we've seen how many of these uh, just adversaries like China, Iran, and Russia have made efforts to reduce their reliance on the dollar. But even some of our allies have sought to work around our sanctions. We're well aware of it. And uh, you know, I think it goes beyond bad actors at this point. Um, and they're trying to establish alternatives to our SWIFT system. Uh, so my question to you would be, it, it, are there things we should be doing in addition to what we tackled in the last Congress that could probably tighten this and and make it more presentable to not just congressional committees, but also to DOD and anybody else involved in the defense industry. So first, let me let me say congratulations on your bill. I yeah, think it was a you. good piece of legislation and glad that it was signed into law. Uh, second, let me comment 
um, on the military company restrictions, which you which you referred to. I, I, I think that um, Congressman Barr has legislation that's looking to make this statutory and then tighten some of the gaps. And I think that as we're doing it, considering what you raised is also a worthwhile uh, endeavor for this committee to explore. Now, I think that there, there may be some complexities we need to think about when you're talking about entire index funds, but the point is, if we make a determination that a company is linked to the Chinese military, we shouldn't have U.S. In investors in that company. And so we need to figure out how we are closing all applicable gaps, and I think exploring what you raised is, is a worthwhile endeavor. On the SWIFT question, that's less my area of expertise, um, but happy to try to get back to you on that, or maybe one of my colleagues also has something to say. And I was looking at Eric. I'm happy, thanks. Great. I'm happy to touch on the SWIFT question. Yeah, Mr. Lorber, yeah, do you have a comment on that? Yeah, is it a second, sorry? On the SWIFT part of it? Yeah, yeah, definitely. So um, I do think that to a certain extent, um, as we talked about previously, there, there are workarounds that are under development or have been developed by our adversaries. Um, China, we talked about with the you know, potential CBDC, as well as Russia and the mere payment system. On the SWIFT side, I actually think that the threat of a sort of a European defection from the US-led financial rail system uh, may not be um, as, uh, as immediate as, as some were worried about even a few years ago. So remember that the Europeans set up INSTEX uh, uh, following the US uh, uh, withdrawal from the JCPOA as a way to facilitate trade with Iran that was outside the US sanctions jurisdiction. I think there was one uh, transaction that ended up going through INSTEX. Very, very few did. And so I think to a certain extent there was a lot of talk about it at the time, but in actuality uh, it didn't come to fruition. And I certainly haven't heard of anything along those lines uh, since the Russian invasion of Ukraine last week. The gentleman's time has expired. The uh, chair now recognizes the gentlewoman from Massachusetts, Ms. Presley, for five minutes. Uh, thank you. Uh, first, I just want to take a moment to uh, condemn the anti Asian rhetoric by many of our colleagues in Congress across the aisle, uh, which has emboldened anti-Asian hate, uh, not only uh, in the Massachusetts 7th, which I represent, leaving many of my constituents uh, in fear with their safety threatened, um, but really um, threatened our democracy, I think, writ large. And I want to just take a moment to forcefully disassociate myself from remarks made by my colleagues that peddle in xenophobia and fuel violence against the Asian community. I do think we can certainly be critical of the Chinese government and their economic policies without being hateful, uh, racist, or xenophobic in our language. Uh, so Mr. Morell, you are the former senior director for international economics and competitiveness with experience on the National Security Council and the National Economic Council. Uh, do you agree that it is possible to talk about China's policies without being racist or xenophobic? I think it is very important that we be thoughtful in how we talk about and how we discuss the challenge we face from China. It's been heartening here today with this uh, committee to hear several members of the committee um, note that when we talk about our competition with China and the threat from China, we are talking about the Chinese Communist Party and the Chinese government, and we are not talking about the hundreds of millions of ordinary Chinese who we have a lot of common with uh, at, a, at a personal level. I do think it is important that we continue to be, to, 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 to be careful about how we talk about this in a politically charged atmosphere to make sure that we continue, we are clear that we're talking about government policies in China, the acts of the state, and that we are not inadvertently kind of sliding into um, uh, statements against the Chinese people. Thank you. Uh, I hope that my colleagues uh, hear you loud and clear and can learn from that. I also hope they learn to discuss global competitiveness without warmongering. Uh, it is no surprise that proponents of the military industrial complex have already seized on recent events to call for even more defense spending. War should not be the centerpiece of U.S. foreign policy. In today's hearing, let me say that war will not solve our global economic challenges. Rather, the United States can demonstrate global leadership by building partnerships grounded in just economic policies that center human rights, invest in workers, and form lasting relationships. That's how we achieve our goals on the global stage and distinguish our approach from Chinese policies. 
I'm particularly interested in the U.S. economic approach to the African continent. Africa is a rapidly evolving continent. In 2019, seven of the 10 fastest growing economies in the world were in African countries, and the continent's population is expected to double to 2.5 billion people by 2050. Mr. Terrell, can you describe some of the key lessons we should learn from Chinese policies and economic investments in African countries? I think it is incredibly important that we, as the United States, uh, up our game with respect to engagement in Africa. I think there have been um, a couple of very positive steps over the last couple of months. I think President Biden's uh, African Leaders Summit provides a useful foundation to renew uh, diplomacy and economic engagement across the continent. And I think trips like Secretary Yellen and Secretary Blinken's recent trips uh, to the continent help build on that foundation to deepen ties. I do think that we are potentially, uh, for the Biden administration, is potentially further along in its thinking with IPEF and with APEP, initiatives for the Indo-Pacific and for uh, the Americas Partnership, than it has been on some of the specific uh, economic uh, deliverables and initiatives for the African continent. But I am also confident that that is coming, coming out of the African Leaders Summit. We're going to see more robust engagement. I do think we're well positioned for renewed engagement in Africa because the shine has really come off of the kind of Chinese debt diplomacy of the last decade in China. We are seeing countries in Africa and elsewhere, but particularly in Africa, see some of the downsides of letting Chinese companies come in with low standards for mining, for manufacturing, for the environment, for labor, and for human rights. And so you are beginning to see African governments put a pause on Chinese I'm, I'm projects. I'm almost at time. Thank you so much. I, I do strongly believe the U.S. has an opportunity to be a fair economic partner with African nations and to foster a global economy that truly works for all. Thank you. The gentlelady's time has expired. The gentleman from New York, Mr. Garbarino, is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you all for uh, being here all day today. I appreciate it. Um, Mr. Willems, I have a question for you. Uh, the Asian Development Bank uh, is probably the most important development institution in the Asia-Pacific Asia region, addressing regional development problems using financing in the form of grants, loans, and advisory services. Uh, however, beginning in 2014 with uh, the New Development Bank and in 2016 with the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank, China has created its own rival uh, uh, banks while still itself getting loans uh, from the Asian Development Bank. I believe uh, China received the second, amount, second most amount, uh, accounting for 14% of the bank's outstanding loans. There have been discussions with the Asian Development Bank about possibly stopping uh, loans to China because even though China likes to say it's a developing country, you know, it's, we don't think it is anymore. Do you think, they, but they haven't made a final decision, do you think uh, China should uh, still receive or should stop receiving loans from the Asian Development Bank? And what advantages does China get by continuing to receive these loans? Uh, so thank you for the question, and I agree. I think China should not receive loans from either the World Bank or the Asian Development Bank. And um, I, I don't have it in front of me, but if you look at the World Bank's um, you know, articles of agreement, it talks about you know, the countries that should receive loans are those that you know, don't have the liquidity themselves. So what you have here is China actually getting the loans instead of those who actually need it. And so I think in both of those institutions, uh, we need to try to work with allies to create a situation where China is no longer getting loans. Because if they can do Belt and Road, they can do the AAIB. They clearly don't need the ADB or the World Bank. Exactly. And I, and, and I love you. You're saying that they're taking 14 percent of the pot of money here that could be going to other people. And you just mentioned uh, Belt and Road. Uh, and I guess oh, that's been around for, what, uh, two decades or so. Um, and it's, I think the estimates, estimates last peg China's lending to the development world at, at, world at a trillion dollars. I think it was the last estimates uh, in the last couple of years, which would make them bigger than the World Bank uh, and IMF. So, and these loans, though, that they're giving out to these developing countries are usually shorter term, higher interest rates. And we're seeing now uh, Pakistan said it wants to renegotiate Belt and Road Initiative payments, accusing Chinese companies of inflating the cost of construction by $3 billion. Uh, Beijing, uh, flood, uh, or, uh, 
Laos or Sri Lanka, and I, I think some other African nations have asked to restructure and delay repayments or forgive billions of dollars because of the high interest rates and everybody coming out of the pandemic. Because of what these loans that China has done through Belt and Road Initiative and, and now these developing countries are, 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 are look like they're being harmed even worse than, they, than we thought they were gonna be. What roles should we and other inter international uh, financial institutions have in addressing the needs of these development countries uh, that, that receive funds from the Belt and Road Initiative uh, and, and now are in need of debt relief? Yeah, so, so two comments on this. Uh, the first is, you know, the, the, the hypocrisy from China is thick. Right? China goes around and says it's the defender of the multilateral system and it's a responsible international stakeholder, yet it's the outlier in refusing to restructure these debts. And so I do think we need to work with allies to pressure China to change its position. The second point I would make is we need to help prevent these countries from getting in that position in the first place. And one of the, the issues that I think we need to focus even more on is our development tools, the DFC and others, and figuring out how to provide a robust alternative to China so that these countries aren't taking Belt and Road money to begin with. Okay, but we have to make sure, I mean, we've got to make sure that uh, taxpayers aren't bail, that aren't bailing, uh, bailing out these, these bad loans, you know, because... Agree. Okay, I just want to make sure that, so uh, how though, what, what type of pressure, because I don't know if, if IMF or World Bank coming in and, and, and renegotiating these loans is, is going to work, but so what kind of pressure should we can we put on Beijing to, to make them do it? So I think what, one of the things we want to do is work with G7 partners. And you know, the United States alone doesn't have the voting shares in either of these institutions to be able to leverage change itself. It needs partners. And so we need to get those partners who have enough voting shares to actually um, make a difference. We need all of them to band together on the same, uh, get on the same page and pressure China. And that's the best way to do it, in my opinion. I appreciate those answers, and I'm out of time, so I yield back. Thank you very much. The gentleman yields back. The gentleman from Nevada, Mr. Horsford, is recognized for five minutes. Thank you. I want to thank the chairman and the ranking member for holding this necessary hearing today, and I want to thank our expert witnesses for appearing before the committee. I'm glad that you're here to elaborate on the various ways that the Chinese Communist Party is challenging the United States' interest on a global scale whether it be through unfair trade practices and ignoring of international sanctions, undermining of the SWIFT banking system, expansion of influence through the Belt and Road Initiative, or simply military aggression. We are seeing a multifaceted campaign from Beijing to catapult China to the forefront of global markets and the world stage. We have a responsibility to our children and to the next generation to own the 21st century as the United States. No longer do we have the luxury of waiting for tomorrow as we are locked in a competition for America's global standing today. So the work that we do here and have done over the last two years will be key to positioning our country for the economic fight to come. I'm proud to say that House Democrats have delivered and laid the groundwork for American success through strategic investment in our people, our production, and our infrastructure. The Chips and Science Act ensures that the technology of the future will be made right here in America by union members with good quality jobs. And as the high-tech manufacturing sector evolves, our production capabilities will grow right along with it. However, other investments were necessary to rebuild our crumbling roads and bridges through the bipartisan infrastructure law which will allow American businesses to bring their goods to the market faster and at a lower rate. Meanwhile, the Inflation Reduction Act delivered support to the nearly 60,000 manufacturing employees back in my home state of Nevada, while ensuring that the United States will lead the way forward on clean energy. Now, these are just some of the examples, and I know my colleagues on the other side will propose additional ones, and I hope to work with many of you on those efforts. But I believe that we should be focused on also supporting and investing in American companies and the American workforce. For decades, investments, manufacturing, and our supply chains had to be offshore to China by no multinational corpora corporations that saw opportunities for ever greater returns. 
I am particularly worried by the large investments from the thrift savings plan and other retirement accounts into companies controlled by the Chinese Communist Party. Nevadans don't need to have their retirement accounts investing their hard-earned money into companies and funds that are actively competing against us. While I applaud President Biden for his recent executive order barring investments in certain military or surveillance companies, it remains that U.S. investors hold over $1.2 trillion in equity and debt issued by Chinese entities. These investments should be made here at home to the benefit of American companies, communities, and workers. To mat make matters worse, while the companies American firms have invested in may appear privately held, oftentimes they are still working at the behest of the Chinese Communist Party. Mr. Harrell, given all that we know about the difficulty dis to disentangle Chinese state-owned enterprise from private firms, do you think it is appropriate for the administration and Congress to consider further restrictions on American investment in Chinese firms? Are we essentially shifting money away from our domestic sectors to the benefit of our competitors? So I do think it is appropriate uh, for Congress and for the Biden administration uh, to look at ways to expand limits on certain U.S. investments in China. I'd recommend in particular that the administration and Congress work to build out the list of Chinese military and surveillance companies where um, investment is currently prohibited to potentially include other kinds of companies where we see specific national security risks from the investment in those companies. Uh, and I also join several of my colleagues here in endorsing a narrowly targeted uh, review mechanism for certain outbound private investments uh, in China. I do think it's important to look at both these issues. Thank you very much, Madam, uh, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Madam Ranking Member, I will yield back. Gentleman yields back. The gentlewoman from California, Ms. Kim, is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Chairman. I want to really thank the witnesses. You are the experts in this field, and I think it's such a timely hearing on the topic of how we discuss the economic challenges posed by CCP. As you know, uh, it's no secret that CCP, under the authoritarian regime of Xi Jinping, they are trying to displace the United States as the uh, number one economy in the world and counter the American dream with the CCP's version of the China dream and the global stage. I mean, I am an immigrant who came here to live that American dream and to see that eroding every year by CCP, I can't tolerate that, which is why, uh, you know, when we see CCP strategically undermining U.S. interests and threatening U.S. economic and commercial interests abroad at every turn, we got to do everything we can to come up with policies that will counter it. We just saw in the last week, uh, CCP is not just satisfied with threatening U.S. economic and commercial interests abroad. It has also sought to violate our domestic airspace and the longstanding international norms with surveillance balloons, right? So clearly, we need to put CCP and Xi Jinping uh, and their reckless actions uh, tamed. <laughs> So let me ask you, with uh, Mr. Lorber, question for you. The CCP has opted to increase its bilateral swap line agreements to further internationalize its currency and rival the U.S. dollar as the world's reserve currency. So as in the case of Russia, these bilateral swap lines are being used to circumvent the U.S. dollars and sanctions. So can you talk about the policies that U.S. can implement to flatten or reduce bilateral swap line agreements between CCC, CCP and uh, other uh, countries? Thanks, yeah, it's, it's a great question. Um, and I think uh, there are two, two responses to it. The first response is, in any situation, including like this, where there is a national security threat or potential illicit activity occurring, that is a prime candidate for the use of a targeted sanction. So mm -hmm. that definitely does exist in this, in this scenario. I think, I think the second point, though, is that Part of the reason that it's been challenging, as I understand it, for, for China to internationalize many of its financial relationships and have adoption, widespread adoption of, of currency, 
is the renminbi itself has certain core limitations to it, right? So a degree of, of exchange rate volatility, a de, you know, capital controls that exist. And so I think the second point I would make is that there is always a distinct possibility and maybe even a probability that the expansion of these swap lines may not occur because of the limitations of the renminbi. Mm, thank you. Uh, Mr. Willems, I have a question for you. You know, the COVID-19 pandemic and the CCP's COVID-0 policy showed that critical supply chains and international uh, commerce cannot be subject to the whims of an authoritarian regime that disregard the basic economic norms. So can you describe any uh, policy recommendations that will help us move the critical supply chains away from China? And as a follow-up, your thoughts on re-engaging in the Pacific uh, partners, uh, you know, and allies with our trade agreements. So I completely agree with your premise, and, and I do think that that is a lesson from the pandemic. Uh, I think that we do need to figure out, can we reduce supply chain reliance on China? Now, I, I think one unfortunate circumstance has been that this administration has not been pushing for the right policies to do that. And one of the things that I would like to see much more of that I think can be more effective is trade agreements. And to put it simply, if we want our companies to leave China, we need to provide them with positive incentives and in other markets to go to. So we need to make it easier to link our supply chains with these other countries. And so I would like to see more trade agreements, in particular in the Indo-Pacific. Taiwan would be a top candidate for mm -hmm. me. And then I would also look at renegotiating the TPP, trying to fix it and make it work for US interests. Great, thank you. I mean, we agree on that. Uh, I have one more question for you, Mr. Williams. Uh, I've been an advocate for the United States to provide Taiwan, uh, you know, the membership in the international organizations. And I've done that in the first term that I served. And just recently, I introduced HR 540, it's the Taiwan Non-Discrimination Act, to allow Taiwan to be uh, included in the international monetary policy. So I want to take your, uh, get your take on that, and can you describe how getting Taiwan into IMF, for example, could strengthen the IMF and other international organizations? I know we... So I have five seconds, but I will strongly endorse your bill, and I do think Taiwan's already a member of many the organizations. Gen the gentlelady's time has expired. Please submit for the record. I heard what I needed to hear. Thank you so much for your endorsement of my bill. <laughs> I yield back. The gentleman from Nebraska, Mr. Flood, is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you to all the witnesses that have been here. In 2017, the People's Republic of China announced with glee that they were going to be um, giving us $100 million to build a garden in our national uh, park here in Washington, DC. It turns out they wanted to collect intelligence. They wanted to find out what was happening in our nation's capital, and they have been doing this all over the country. As a representative from Nebraska, I represent Offutt Air Force Base, which is home to STRATCOM. We also, as many of you know, have a very close connection to our nuclear triad, and we have sensitive military assets all over the state of Nebraska. And I found out that through a company called Huawei, cell phone companies, some of them owned by American companies, are providing cellular services using Huawei equipment. On top of this, folks in North Dakota and several rural states are raising the red flag about the Chinese government purchasing real estate in the United States. My question is for Mr. Fedo. During your time working at the Treasury, can you speak to how frequently Chinese real estate purchases came under CFIUS review? Was it frequent or infrequent? Thank you very much for the question, Mr. Flood. Uh, we implemented the, the rule. Uh, we had a statutory deadline of February 13th of 2020, and we implemented the regulations which made real estate jurisdiction effective at that time. Real estate filings are uh, voluntary. They're not a mandatory filing, but the committee has the power to pull in filings that it deems uh, deserve scrutiny under its jurisdiction. Oftentimes, uh, real estate transaction jurisdiction overlaps with the normal jurisdiction of the committee, and so it's hard to say w which ones um, might be real estate related transactions, but the concern about proximity, which you're describing, 
is something that the committee and its members, especially the, the member agencies, the Justice Department and the FBI in particular, are very concerned about and very alert to. So th that, that piece is, is addressed. Um, there's a list of, of almost 200 military installations and other facilities that are published by the committee that relate to real estate jurisdiction. So to, to the extent, and those are provided by the agencies within the committee that have, have the subject matter expertise to say, this facility is sensitive and should be within the real estate jurisdiction of the committee. And so to the extent there's a, a facility or an installation that's not in there, that's, <clears throat> that's on the committee and its member agencies to dialogue and tweak it so that there's appropriate coverage for something that's sensitive. It seems to me like Congress needs to take this very seriously, maybe make it mandatory that the reporting happen. <clears throat> and as I read the regulations now, you know, in the case of the Chinese Garden, that was roughly 2.7 miles away from the U.S. Capitol, four miles away from the White House, yet CFIUS's jurisdiction is defined as one mile from the base. Uh, it seems to me like we could be making some changes in, in the way our statute reads so that we are requiring a better look at some of these concerns. Um, maybe. I, I would say that, that the, the committee, the full committee and all the member agencies, including DOD and, and, and those that, that have a, a stake in this issue of proximity and spying and, and collection of intelligence, we're all very involved for two years in scoping this out. And, and one concern I would have, and, and as you consider what to do going forward, is to the extent real estate jurisdiction is scoped so broadly, it may consume everything that CFIUS does and, and sort of make it limitless. And, and, and I, that, do, I do appreciate your concern there, because I think you, we can draw this in such a way that draws everybody into a circle and we could waste some government resources. Do you feel confident that CFIUS's current review process gives us the um, ability to police what I think a lot of folks in North Dakota and Nebraska and other communities are saying about the CCP's um, efforts in real estate? I do, to the extent it's a national, a clear national security issue related to a, a U.S. business or to an installation or to something that gives gives it a hook. If it's more of a of a raw real estate transaction. That may be another question for an, another authority within the government. The gentleman's time has expired. I yield back. The gentleman from Iowa, Mr. Nunn, is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you very much for the panel being here. You are all experts on China, the threat emerging from China. You know, as we look at things as a counterintelligence officer myself who protects our national security as somebody who's flown recon operations, in international airspace, not violating other countries' sovereign airspace territory has been seen in recent days. We have a real concern here, and I think one of the greatest uh, threats to U.S. national security in relationship to China right now is not on the battlefield, but it's in that area where a great transfer of U.S. wealth is going to build the Chinese economy, whether that's state-owned businesses, whether that is their foreign investment in infrastructure done with American credit, or whether that is the actual buildup of the People's Liberation Army. With this, Mr. Williams, you've highlighted, you know, firsthand how export controls, restrictions and subsidies received by China on the global stage are becoming a threat. One of the things I'd like to learn, first of all, before we get to a situation of a kinetic conflict between the United States and China, how can we provide an off-ramp for China to do right by the United States and themselves, as well as U.S. companies really leading in this space, to have good behavior that's going to reward America and not allow China to continue to take advantage of us? So I think what I would start with is the need to bifurcate the kinds of activity that we have with China. On one hand, there are things that can contri clearly contribute to their military development, that can raise na national security threats, and we need to crack down on that kind of behavior. On the other hand, we want to maintain linkages with China where we can. Right. And in, in I think there's been a lot of conversation today about distinguishing between the PRC and the Chinese people. And it's important to maintain that, maintain that distinction, and it's important for us to have our companies engaging directly with the Chinese people themselves. And I think from someone from Iowa, having more exports into China is good. It helps Iowa farmers. I also think looking at our financial services industry, 
they need to be on the ground in China to do business in China and to be globally competitive. So let's maintain those links while cracking down on the ones that are problematic. Mr. Reynolds, I think you've hit the point uh, head on. One of the bills that I'm looking at introducing here is neutralizing the Unfair Chinese Subsidy Act of 2023. What this really looks to do is to identify the way in which the Treasury Secretary could develop a strategic plan today and a timeline to work with our allies in order to seek China's compliance with international export subsidy standards. This goes to both a multilateral, which you've spoken to, uh, approach with our allies, as well as a very targeted bilateral uh, pressure towards China. So the follow-up question here, what levers uh, would you recommend the administration utilize, maybe those levers that are not being utilized, and how could we move forward with this in a pragmatic way? So I, I like where your legislation is going, and, and I will say I think it's part of a broader approach. And so on one hand, we do want to engage with the OECD and enforce these rules against China, and I think we should talk about how to do that, how to work with allies and partners to put that pressure on China. At the same time, um, you know, we don't want to race to bottom, the bottom with China, but we do have an export credit agency, XM Bank, that can provide an alternative to what China is doing. And I've had a couple recommendations earlier today on how to loosen some of the strings around XM so it can provide a meaningful alternative. Things like having their China Transformational Exports Program that cuts through red tape, things like allowing them to take a little bit greater risk to make sure that we're actually in the same level playing field as China. Excellent. Mr. Williams, I would echo here with the chair, this can be truly a bipartisan effort, that we need to have a strategy towards China today, not a strategy that develops after an incident occurs and that we are in a reactive posture. We have the opportunity to lay out a clear roadmap here on how the U.S., China, and our allies can mutually be successful rather than locked in this long-term strategy of adversarial relationship that regretfully could end up in a kinetic situation. So with that, I would reach across the aisle to my colleagues uh, to support what could be a bipartisan lever here on holding China accountable for their subsidies act. And again, I want to thank the committee for uh, hearing from this incredible group of witnesses and your expertise in the area. With that, Mr. Chair, I yield back my time. The gentleman yields back. The gentlewoman from Indiana, Ms. Houchin, is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, thank you all for taking time to come and speak to us today, given the events occurring over the weekend. Um, the Chinese spy balloon crossing, <clears throat> excuse me, the breadth of the United States with what appears to be a clear attempt to spy on our military assets. I'm really glad that this first um, substantive committee hearing we're discussing this important topic about the People's Republic of China, the Communist Party's, uh, Chinese Communist Party's uh, threat to our financial, financial institutions and economy, but also our national security and our way of life. I have a question for Mr. Fetto. Um, as a free market conservative, I read your testimony, and I'm particularly interested in your comments on how we can mitigate our risk uh, while also maintaining a strong, open, free market investment environment. Thank you for the question. What I'm focused on primarily in the written testimony is, is this notion of creating a new outbound screening investment regime, a new committee, to, and a new bureaucracy to go with it. I, I'm, I tend to be um, a, a, a little shy of expanding government, and, and I want to, if we need to do it, to make that uh, decision based on facts and, and on a rational basis and make sure that it is, um, is tailored to the problem we've defined. Here, I'm not sure we completely understand what we want to try and stop. I don't dispute that there is a national security risk that may need to be, the gap may need to be closed. And Mr. Ash, you can help me here, I think, in a second. But what, what my thought is, is to use something like what Mr. Barr is proposing, which is an expansion of the CMIC list, sort of a combination of the use of sanctions and export controls. It would be nimble, it would be precise, it would be clear to private actors what is in and out of scope. And, um, but first, whether we go the committee route, and I've outlined a series of questions we really need, do need to answer before creating a new bureaucracy, or whether we go a sanctions route, we need to be very clear what it is, where the national security risk is, and that's, I think the intelligence community can help with that. So uh, you make note that the previous Congress and the Biden administration had considered creating a new government agency with very broad powers. 
um, and that would even oversee American firms and their allocation of, of resources and property and capital outside the United States, not just limited to uh, China. Um, and I believe your analysis um, of creating another bureaucracy with undefined and far-reaching powers, it certainly spoke to me and my constituents um, as an extreme version of overregulation and perhaps growth-stifling policies that could have a chilling effect on U.S. companies. So um, I'm wondering, um, you mentioned in your comments that CFIUS has some existing jurisdiction that could potentially be utilized here uh, with the goals of um, regarding the threat of China through the sanctions of uh, Chinese military companies, modifying, modifying export restrictions, and building a, a comprehensive record of the risk gap. And I appreciated your line of, of questions there. Um, I do hope that we will, um, we will also take a look at things in the whole of Congress, espionage attempts, hacking attempts, attempts to steal US technology, uh, companies owned, debt held, land purchased, other national security threats by the PRC and the CCP. Um, I'm wondering if you have any comments finally, um, and this could be directed at, at really any of the witnesses, Mr. Willems, um, Mr. Eshuk, uh, should we be concerned that outbound investment screening can go too far? And um, what are your comments on that? Sure, uh, the, the answer is yes, uh, especially when you're, when you're discussing um, you know, financial investments. You know, one example from, from Ecra and Firma was, was this concern over, over risks presented by joint ventures between American companies and Chinese companies. And even that was a very expansive concept, blocking a particular kind of business transaction through the process, the legislative process that, that these committees went through. It was re came to the conclusion that it wasn't really about the joint venture, but rather what technology could be transferred. Mm -hmm. And I think that's what we need to do here. Is it just that an investment is outbound, or what's at the root of the concern? And then do we have the authority? And my bet is we probably do have the authority. Yeah. We okay. just need to tweak it a little bit. Thank you. Mr. Williams, do you have any? This, you were nodding your head. I, I agree it can go too far, and happy to elaborate in writing. Thank you. Uh, my time has expired, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. The gentlewoman's time has expired. The gentleman from Tennessee, Mr. Ogles, is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. You know, in our first hearing, the House Financial Services Committee is highlighting the existential threat of China. In that vein, I'd like to thank uh, the chairman and his leadership and my colleagues for their invaluable contributions, offering no less than 17 bills aimed at deterring CCP aggression. I'd also like to offer some observations and recommendations of my own. Currently, we are allowing the genocidal Chinese Communist Party access to trillions of dollars through our capital markets. Echoing Chair Luke Meyer, we're directly subsidizing C the CCP's military modernization and enabling its hor horrific human rights abuses. While we spend nearly a trillion dollars on our own defense, we diminish that very investment as China uses revenues from our capital markets to flout the rule of law in the South China Sea. Case in point, the CCP was able to develop a brand new warship, the Fujian GN, because Beijing raised more than $8.6 billion back through 2015. So Mr. Williams, looking at your written testimony and perhaps sanctions towards the CMIC, the Chinese Military Industrial Complex, what might you envision that we do as a Congress to prevent the United States from essentially building carriers and battleships that are being used against our allies so I think there are, there are two things I would, I would look at here. And the first is what, what you alluded to, which is the CMIC, making sure we are plugging all applicable gaps and we're covering all types of financing can, that can go to those military companies. So that's number one. The second one is on export controls. And um, export controls can be a tool to prevent our technology from going to China that can be used to support that exact same military development. Now I think as, uh, as I alluded to in my testimony, the way in which you do export controls, however, is critical. It can't just be the US alone. It needs to be coordinated. Otherwise, other countries can step in and, and supply the same technology. So I would use both CMIC and export controls, but both of those tools need to be carefully uh, coordinated with others. Yes, yes sir. As a follow-up to the committee, 
you know, as an economist, uh, you know, I look at the current state of China, and I, and I see some economic vulnerabilities. And I think there's evidence to document that much of their economic data is actually fabricated. So as we look as a Congress, how do we go on offense and, quite frankly, take advantage of their economic weakness and assert America's dominance in the global marketplace? So I think one thing that um, that we could do um, more of and and be better at is identifying vacuums before they uh, manifest themselves. So in the case of Russia, I doubt Russia is going to be the same state sponsor of whatever around the globe that it has been. That's creating a vacuum. Venezuela is a good example. As we've seen, China's moved in. Well, the economic weaknesses you point out are limitations on. China's ability to do that, and it's even more acute if the U.S. is there to meet them with that challenge. So I, I think anticipating where those where those gaps are going to be is uh, wise policy for the U.S. Beto, anyone else? The other comment I would I would make on that it's a great question um, is, you know, if, if that's the objective, then taking away the easy wins for them makes a lot of sense, right? So, to your conversation earlier with Mr. Williams, if you're in a situation where they are able to secure financing for a wide range of civil military activities. Um, taking away that avenue means that if they want to continue to maintain that pace of development and that pace of deployment, uh, means that they'll have to find that money and those assets somewhere else, which makes it costlier and riskier for them to do so. So I think it's a twofold uh, approach. It's identifying the vulnerabilities and then also plugging what we think of are the easy ways that they're able to access US financial markets. Well, look, I, I would just add that I completely agree with where you started with this, which is to say that their economy is probably not growing as fast as they uh, want us to all think it is. They're more vulnerable. And there is a lot of division even within the Chinese Communist Party. Xi Jinping is not as secure in his position as many of us often think and has his own vulnerabilities at home. And so I just think through our intel community, through the way we do business, we need to recognize where those vulnerabilities are and exploit them uh, because, you know, Again, China is not a monolithic state. They are un more, uh, sorry, uh, more unstable than, than we actually realize. And I think trying to figure out where that instability is and putting a finger on it is good for the United States. Mr. Chairman, I just want to thank the panel for being here. This has been a long day. Uh, you all are amazing and very much appreciated. Mr. Chairman, I yield my time. The gentleman's time has expired. The gentleman from Florida, Mr. Donalds, is recognized for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, uh, panel. Yeah, long day. You guys been here a minute, man. I'll I give you that. Um, a couple things. Obviously, um, the economic uh, issues, threat, however you want to categorize it, uh, with China are extensive. And as a nation, we have a lot of work to do. A lot of work. Um, one of those areas of focus of mine, and frankly for, for our country, should be in the energy space. Um, as we've learned over the last year, it's critical that the U.S. really strengthens its domestic energy supply. Um, and strengthening our energy su supply is probably the biggest investment we can make in our economy. The second biggest, I would argue, largely comes out of this committee with uh, financial regulation and the regulatory environment. Um, on Thursday, I'm introducing legislation that is called the Protect American Energy uh, from China Act. This legislation will prohibit federal funds from being used to implement a memorandum of understanding signed in 2011 by the Department of Energy and the Chinese Academy of Sciences, Academies of Sciences. The MOU addresses the sharing of information, equipment, personnel, et cetera. Uh, Mr. Eshu, could you speak to the importance of protecting the integrity of the U.S. Uh, energy sector, why that's critical to our economy? I, I, I I can, Congressman. Thank you for the question. I don't think we've come near energy today, so this is an important one to, to touch upon. Uh, speaking from an export control perspective, it's, it's worthy to remind the, the committee that the Department of Energy is one of the regular uh, members of the interagency that approves all licenses, and that is important for two reasons. One is uh, there's a lot of fairly standard ideas around, around energy, but there's a lot happening in the emerging space, and it's really critical that we get our licensing right, that we protect what we need to protect, and that we allow collaboration where, where it, makes, it makes sense for American innovation. So uh, in that respect, uh, as a technology-driven industry sector, it's important that we, get, that we get that balance right. 
All right, no, I appreciate that. Mr. Fellow, I mean, you guys can all comment however you feel about it. This is kind of the free-for-all time of this committee. You can kind of do what you want. Um, so if anybody else wanted to comment, I think you can go right ahead. That's fine. I would just say our, our investment screening tool, CFIUS, frequently looks at energy-related investments to ensure the technology that Mr. Eshoo referred to is protected and doesn't fall in the wrong hands. I'm going to tackle this from a slightly different angle. I agree with my colleagues, and I think that there are, again, these restrictions and things that we need to put in place. But on the other hand, the other thing we need to be doing is unleashing American energy exports around the world. That is good for our economy. And so I do think that in addition to restricting where we need to restrict, we do need to think about where China is a market that can benefit our economy and take advantage of that. Because again, Chinese purchases of US um, products is subsidization for US innovation. Agreed. Real quick, Mr. Lorber, I got a question for you uh, in particular. You know, obviously, we have a lot of businesses that do um, a lot of very various things um, in China. Uh, what are some of the best ways you think that we can protect American businesses from, you know, covert espionage, the CCP, IP theft, um, and, you know, really weaponization um, against our businesses with uh, shell companies here in the U.S.? It's, it's a great question, and there, there are multiple uh, sort of ways to think through it. Now, f first and foremost, obviously companies have an obligation um, to protect themselves, or at least most of them do, right? Uh, but I think beyond that, there, there's a twofold answer to it. One is uh, in situations where um, you think there is or is likely to be uh, intellectual property theft um, or other some type of corporate espionage, so on and so forth, um, U.S. government having the appropriate tools to say to the Chinese, that's not acceptable, uh, and we will sanction you or designate an entity or whatever it may be as a result. Um, on, on the question, I think, which is a little bit different of, of the shell companies that you mentioned um, at the end, I mean, it has, it is in sort of the mid-level stages of putting into place uh, uh, an effective and robust system to understand who is behind front and shell companies that have registered in the United States. And once that is fully implemented, which should happen hopefully within the next year or two, uh, I think that will be uh, an equally impactful way to prevent um, exploitation of, of U.S. markets. Well, I expound on that thought a little bit. We're in the middle of the game and actually figuring out how to ferret this stuff out? So, right. So, um, as was discussed, the Corporate Transparency Act and the Anti-Money Laundering Act were passed within the last two years. So, U.S. regulatory authorities are in process of rolling out uh, the relevant rulemaking that's required under those, uh, under those pieces of legislation. So, The gentleman's time has expired. The gentlewoman from Texas, Ms. De La Cruz, is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Chairman. Um, thank you so much for uh, holding this important hearing to combat the economic threat from China. And I would sincerely like to thank all of the witnesses for being here. I know this is an all-day event, but um, your insight is very valuable to us. You know, today we're seeing heightened uh, Chinese aggression on multiple fronts. And we just saw this week alone the Chinese balloon, which we have spoken about several times. Um, it's critical that the Committee on Financial Services um, that were mobilized in our financial and oversight tools to address the China challenges. Later this month, I'm planning to introduce a bill to uh, direct the Comptroller General of the United States to study the illicit financing associated with synthetic drug trafficking. As you know, I'm on the border in deep South Texas, so drug trafficking and China's involvement is very important to, to myself and to my district. You know, this study will outlay for Congress the business model that organizations are carrying out with the trafficking and how they move and hide uh, illicit gains and what the U.S. government can do better when it comes to fentanyl uh, money laundering. So again, this is something near and dear and, and impactful for our district. So. Um, I'd like to ask you all if um, you all have any kind of clarity on the ties between the Mexican cartels and the Chinese Communist Party. If you've seen any uh, ties, distinct ties, or know of any ties. 
I'm happy to take the, the first cut at that question. It's obviously a very, very important one. Um, and I know that uh, starting really in, in 2017 during the Trump administration, the Treasury Department began looking very earnestly at illicit fentanyl uh, trafficking generally, but, but specifically uh, those networks and their touch points with jurisdictions including China. Um, in terms of specific ties, we have seen publicly reported information um, from the Treasury Department, as I was discussing with a colleague of yours, um, about uh, about um, uh, Chinese companies that are pre making precursors to fentanyl and shipping those fentanyl products to Mexico, uh, which are then finding their way uh, across the border into the United States. So there is some limited information that's been public. With that being said, um, I do think uh, a study um, commissioned to further explore that information is, you know, the goal of getting that, I think, is, is a worthwhile endeavor. The other point I will make on it as well, and this is a, a conversation I was having with one of your colleagues, um, it, it's very important to have the relevant regulatory authorities in the United States publish as much information that is digestible by the private sector as they can in order to arm the private sector with that information to detect, disrupt, and deter such activity. So. Uh, FinCEN, the Financial Crimes Enforcement Network at the Treasury Department, has done a really good job over the last few years of publishing in-depth guidance documents that are meant to tell financial institutions, this is the type of activity we're concerned about, this is the type of activity that you should focus on as financial institutions, and I think that's made a real impact. This would seem, if it's a priority, it seems like it absolutely is, to be a good candidate for that type of activity as well. So what I'm hearing is that the GAO should make a first step in actually trying to find um, find the flow of the money and stop the flow of the drugs and people across our borders. So a study you feel will be beneficial to the House. I think that's right. I also do think that it's, it would be very important to have Treasury work not collaboratively, but, but sort of in parallel tracked, because I think that the Treasury Department will have access to additional information that the, the GAO may not have access to, which could be useful in, in, in providing you know, information to the private sector to help disrupt and deter. Thank you. I yield back. The gentlewoman yields back. The chair now recognizes himself for five minutes. Uh, thanks to the witnesses for being here today. I know it's been a long day, and I want to thank Chairman McHenry and Ranking Member Waters for uh, holding this hearing. Uh, Mr. Fetto, you served as the first ever Assistant Secretary for Investment Security and oversaw the implementation of uh, the Foreign Investment Risk Review Modernization Act, which passed on a strongly bipartisan basis. Uh, can you please elaborate on the effectiveness of uh, FIRMA in ensuring a welcoming investment climate while protecting our national security interests? Sure, thank you for the question. I, th I think what, what makes that balance, um, I, the way the law has been drafted and the regulations have been implemented, it's, it's got limited jurisdiction focused on specific things. For example, <clears throat> it's, uh, the purchase, the control of a U.S. business by a foreign person gives jurisdiction. But the paradigm, the, the, the lens through which that is looked, uh, scrutinized, is a national security lens exclusively. So, um, and there's a enumerated list of national security factors that the government considers on whether or not to clear a transaction. Similarly, with um, non-controlling jurisdiction, minority investments that give some level of influence or access over the U.S. business, it's been limited by the Congress to very specific areas, something related to collection and maintenance of sensitive personal data, related the business relates to critical technology that's export controlled, or it relates to a company that um, utilizes or um, is involved with part of our, our country's in critical infrastructure. And so because of the precision with which those areas of jurisdiction are defined, and very clear rules, um, the, the um, private sector has very clear swim lanes on what, what is of concern and what isn't. Further, it's, it's a voluntary process, so it gives, it gives some latitude to the private sector to understand there really is an open investment environment. Thank you. So uh, there's been some concern obviously raised over uh, TikTok. However, uh, 
Uh, similar concerning situations are present in our financial systems as well. Uh, two prime examples of that of uh, broker-dealers that are subsidiaries of Chinese parent companies are Webull and Moomoo. Uh, according to Webull CEO Anthony Denier, Webull is both a U.S. and Chinese company. Uh, our technology team is based in Hunan, China, while all of our customer-facing uh, and brokerage operations are New York City. That's a quote. The company also is partially owned by Xiaomi, a Chinese company uh, whose consistent security concerns uh, led to their temporary inclusion on a U.S. Department of Defense blacklist in 2021. Uh, Mumu is owned by Futu uh, Holdings, which has close ties to Tencent, a company with known ties to the CCP. Uh, concerns about these companies have been echoed uh, by others on the Hill, uh, with these companies the focus of letters from Senator Cotton uh, to the Director of National Intelligence, uh, and from, um, from Senators uh, Tupperville, Braun, Scott, and Marshall to the SEC Chair. Uh, with millions of Americans using these apps, how concerned should we be about the potential for uh, personally identifiable information or other user data to be shared with parent companies uh, with strong ties to the CCP? Uh, very concerned. I, you know, this is a data economy, and it's very clear uh, what the, the PRC um, views about the importance of collecting as much information and, uh, as available and possible, and leveraging that for it, its own uh, its own use and advantage. And so, uh, in in the interest of time, just to to that point. So, if it's very concerning, what do you think should be done? Uh, to address that in a, in a meaningful way to protect uh, the privacy of U.S. citizens and companies. So if it's a, if it's a CFIUS transaction, if it's one that's within jurisdiction, then that would be something that the, I think the committee would want to look at. And uh, I, at, when I was at Treasury, I frequently got letters from, from members uh, bringing to my attention transactions of concern. Some of them weren't within jurisdiction, um, but but we uh, very seriously considered every letter we received. Thank you. Uh, the chairman's time has expired. Uh, I'd like to thank the witnesses on behalf of Chairman McHenry, Ranking Member Waters, uh, and the members of this committee for their testimony today. I know it's been a long day. Uh, without objection, all members will have five legislative days within which to submit additional written questions for the witnesses to the chair uh, which will be forwarded to the witnesses for their response. I ask our witnesses to please respond as promptly as you are able. And with that, uh, much to your delight, this hearing is adjourned. Thank you.